we should put something so if somebody watched to the end they can oh see- yeah, yeah yeah good call so yeah. what what's like a good uh word that you need to comment to show that you actually watched it Welcome to Bye Bros episode 8. The most irregular late night. <laughs> yeah. When was the last episode? I don't even know. Like five, five, months ago. Months. 5 months Holy ago. Holy shit. Wow. That's but wild. the thing is we have to point out to the audience it's not because of any change in our dynamic just because we're busy and it's not necessarily a regular podcast because sometimes my su- subscribers of mine ask like are you guys still friends or you, you don't talk and I'm like no we talk all the time just not on the podcast. All right. It's yeah. just scheduling, you know. So here we are. We uh, hopefully we got 4 hours reserved so we can discuss I wonder if everything. we all look like <laughs> I wonder if we look like unrecognizable from the last episode because it's like Steve looks like he's gained like 30 pounds of muscle. Leo's neck is like twice the size now. I yeah. think I'm less fat, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. So we, uh, we, we should start there. Derek I, uh, or uh, Leo, I think you want to introduce another bio bro, but not exactly. <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. I have a bio girl. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So since we last spoke, uh, my daughter was born. Um, actually, by the way, guys, I don't know if you've heard the delivery, but it was insane. It was crazy stuff happened. If I was not at the delivery place, they would have for sure done a C-section, which was absolutely unnecessary in this case. And, uh, like, even like the doctor was sort of apologizing to me afterwards, like, Hey, I'm sorry. I pushed for that. Um, anyway, it's a long story, but it was, it was a wonderful birth. Uh, to be, uh, yeah, ne- no one here has had this experience. So I'll just mention yeah. something weird happened to me when my daughter was born. Okay. First of all. When my wife was delivering, the fear, because my wife doesn't like surgeries, she's never had one before, so the fear that she might get a C-section, I never knew you could care about someone so much. I was in tears before the, like, I thought they were going to do the C-section, I started crying, and then within 15 minutes, my daughter was born, they didn't have to do it, as I thought, and when my daughter was born, I continued crying, so I was basically crying for an hour and a half, just nonstop, I've never done that in my life, it was like such an emotional, um, Imp- a strongly imprinting moment in my life. Maybe the, the happiest I've ever been in a moment. Uh, were you happier when you held your baby finally, your daughter? No, when you when I held the baby, I got scared because because babies are very fragile. Yeah, you you right. know, as a man, you feel very scared to hold them. For sure. But interestingly, so I have a couple of notes interesting about this that's related to biology, I guess. The first one is I was, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I've been like talking indirectly about growth hormone for the last few months on my channel. The main reason isn't for bodybuilding, but I was I wanted to understand how children grow. What are the like biological determinants of it? Not because I want to enhance my children's growth, but because I want their natural lifestyle and food to best, you know, equip them for growth, for intellectualism and so on. So I, I learned a few things that are interesting. Um, for example, I learned that adiposity, people that are fat in youth, just being fat worsens the effects of growth hormone. The growth hormone is not able to function correctly in fat youth. So there's a reason not to be fat when you're younger. But it's interesting. At the same time, you would think then that fat children grow less tall than skinny children, right? Because the GH is working better. But it's funny when they when the studies compare fat and, and regular children, obese children actually or very fat children actually grow quite tall. And the thought is because of the IGF-1 levels from the increased consumption of food. Yeah, wouldn't surprise me. Plus, plus you get, you know, if you're getting fat, you're probably in a caloric surplus all the time. Yeah. So the other thing I was going to talk about is like, have you ever guys noticed that it seems skinny or tall kids when we were in high school tended to be lanky? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I noticed that too. And I, I started wondering what the reason was. So if you're skinnier, you have probably higher ghrelin levels. You know, so ghrelin might modulate this also, but then IGF-1 modulates it, then adiposity does, then growth hormone does. So there's so many different levels of interaction. One thing I always thought, honestly, from high school is like, I saw so many girls that back then it seemed like they could eat whatever they wanted. They were like, you know, you had the whole like high school metabolism and like people would just stay lean with seemingly eating whatever they wanted. But when you actually think about it thoroughly, no one was really even had driver's licenses a lot of the time everyone had like gym class they'd have extracurriculars and it, at the end of the day like the amount of physical activity was so much higher than people nowadays with sedentary jobs and so many people just end up being fat that i thought it was like i for a while i thought there was something to do with like high school metabolism and you just stay shredded without trying and then something happened to their thyroids and they got all fucked up in their 20s but in reality i think a lot of people were just walking like way more 
And so the lankiness, I think, is partially like significant amounts of energy expenditure. That's just like the logical like law of thermodynamics. I think most most I, students get about twenty thousand steps in per day. You know, walking. Yeah, in like the amount class. of. Yeah. Yeah, like when I think of basketball, when I think of walking to and from school, when I think of all the stuff I would do with my friends where I'd walk like across an entire city, basically, rather than drive, like there was so much walking going on and it was and then I'd lift too. like and nowadays it's me sitting in my desk and I go to the gym, you know, four times a week. And then if I'm good, I'll also do my like 10 minute walks or whatever after a meal. But other than that, I'm not really doing shit. So well, yeah, that's that's a good point. Well, actually, you know what happened to me, Derek, when I was in London? I'm I'm a naturally fat guy, and even in high school, I was a little bit chubby naturally, unless I was really doing something about it. But when I lived in London, because the city is so small and you don't really take public transport much or drive much, I walked so much that for the first time in my life, I could barely keep fat on. And I, I've always re reflected back to that period. It's like I lost all my body fat from that. It's very interesting. Yeah, and it goes over to yeah. a couple of months, and it goes quite gradual. So a hack for very busy guys is doing the standing desk. And then when you do go oh, to the yeah. gym, you walk in between sets. So I started doing that. I recently. have a really good standing desk that I'm at right now, but I have not used it one time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, yeah, like yeah. I spent all this money on it, but I doesn't, I don't use it at all, but it's cool. It's yeah. Cool. I, I was thinking about buying one of those that you can raise electronically. Yeah. Up and down. Mine goes like mine goes all if I'm standing and I'm like, it goes all the way up to my chin. And I'm like pretty tall normally. And then if I go all the way down, it's down to almost my knees. It's crazy. Wow. Okay. My yeah. wife just got one of these too. I'm, uh, yeah, but she's using it. She's using it a little bit because she has to. She doesn't move too much with the baby. Right. Mm. I, I barely have time. So I do 30 minutes of cardio. And then when I do go to the gym, I walk in between sets. And then you get an easy 7,000 steps in. 7,000 yeah, during true. your workout. A workout of one and a half hours. You don't waste any extra time. But instead of doing just sitting on your butt scrolling on uh, Instagram, I just walk. Yeah. And it, the fact that you don't have anyone try and take your machine when you're walking around. I'm the king of the gym there. Nobody takes me. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I can't even imagine how annoying it'd be walking to the other side of the gym and back and being like. So, uh, so I was lucky. I, I was training at Muscle Factory, but with VIP membership because officially the gyms were closed. So for like oh. for four months, I had oh, like yeah, maybe you know, 10 gym that's members way different. there. And now, yeah, yeah, that doesn't work for the normal guy, unfortunately. And then last week it opened again. And then yesterday I went to the gym in the evening and it was like dodgeball, you know, just oh, brutal. moving in between yeah. people and a full gym. And uh, But I still got my steps in. So yeah, it's a yeah. little bit annoying. I just get a big towel and uh, a rat, you know, a couple uh, lifting gears and then that machine is mine, you know. Hmm. Nobody I wanted to synopsize some of this. Um, this research that I did real quick, because yeah. I know the audience of all of our channels, uh, they often ask questions about linear height growth as when they're in their youth. I wanted to explain just a couple of uh, concerns. If anybody's trying to manipulate their growth and they have something called like, the technical classification is called idiopathic short stature. It means you're short, but there's no medical reason. Classically defined as shorter than both of your parents, though. But it sort of applies to anybody else that really wants to be. So tall. what's the cutoff for that? Because I know being a technically like a midget would be like four foot. I think it was like eight or lower or something. It's a certain and number of variants from the med mean height of your two parents. So if your parents are both five foot, if they're already five short and they're like five, six or something or five, four or something, and then you're five six you're considered normal still even though you're below average a little yeah. bit yes you wouldn't have idiopathic if your parents were six foot and you were five five you definitely definitely would be that is so you could otherwise get a protocol prescribed to you if you were shorter than your parents but if you're not shorter than your parents then the doctor's like nope not going to give you shit. exactly really interesting that, point right that seems kind really of subjective <laughs> that's so weird that's why it's so that's why I tried to study mostly idiopathic short stature because there's also other other conditions like GH deficiency is really yeah. different because the person has a GH problem and then there's other diseases also where they're used. But what the this, what I wanted to warn the audience about, if there are any young people listening to this, the issue is this. All of these growth pathways cause cancers. If you are potentially, you know, if you're potentially, there are kids that get cancers too. Mm -hmm. If you have those polymorphisms, you're going to potentially worsen your outcomes, not just now, but later. With that said, and also 
In order to grow taller, you would have to flatline estradiol, which will have significant long-term effects on your psychology. Mm -hmm. Like you may end up with lower serotonergic signaling for life. It's shown in, in you know, the anabolic studies, an, uh, anabolic steroid studies of rodents, that when given uh, steroids like DECA in their juvenile years, they never fully return back in terms of their serotonergic signaling. So just warning. But, doesn't, but what I've generally... Hmm? Doesn't, doesn't redlining or flatlining your estradiol would also result to is osteoporosis downstream and brittle, yeah. more brittle there bones was, over uh, time? Have yes. you seen that video I did on the guy who never hit puberty and he was like 27 he went on a reality, he went on this talk show with the doctors and they basically assessed his, like why it happened. They found, you know, like a benign, you know, um, adenoma that was basically, you know, fucking with his endocrine hormone production and whatnot. But when they looked at his actual like skeletal infrastructure, he was, um, he had osteoporosis in his twenties because of the lack of estradiol. So, and I would imagine androgen signaling too, obviously. So yeah, that All right, go ahead. have selective Sorry. estrogen receptor modulators been linked to height growth. I haven't looked into that so much, actually. I haven't. I don't know if they've done studies on that. But but uh, keeping in mind, so, so one thing, um, the, the estrogen is relevant to the maturation and proliferation of these chondrocytes. It's necessary for their development. But it seems to be one of the main instigators of their senescence. Other than, by the way, just the proliferation of chondrocytes creates senescence. But estradiol also does. And there. this is, by the way, one of the topics that I'm still researching. I'm trying to find out all of the determinants for chondrocyte senescence. Just for the audience to understand, what does that mean? Senescence of these cells, basically, there are people that can still grow taller in their 20s. And the reason usually is they have an aromatase expression uh, polymorphism that causes them to have never really peaked with aromatase. So, for example, a, per, a child with precocious puberty, meaning they get puberty very early at the age of one, they have about eight to ten years before their growth. Is the age of one? Yes, this happened. Yeah, in the age of one. I thought eight, it was like I've heard of that. I thought it was like eight or nine or like maybe. No, no, it happens. It happens at normal ages, but also I'm just giving an example. If it happened huh. at the age of one, by the age of eight to ten, they have a mature. Uh, this what, it's called the epi epiphyseal fusion. Play closer. But, yeah, the fusion of it. It changes from cartilage to bone, but if if you're a person with aromatase deficiency, and you're an adult, it can happen in one year. Uh, just being exposed to estrogen one year will do it for you. Mm -hmm. So the thing about flatlining estrogen, it has some other effects, obviously, but my main concern would be the brain because the osteoporosis effects can be avoided once you reach, uh, you know, yeah, and the, the, the neurotoxicity and the epi epi uh, endothelial Physio protection, place. right? The endothelial it, 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 antioxidant. Oh, effects. you're talking about the curve. Yeah, it may right, genuinely, right. genuinely change the personality. But anyway, th th the synopsis of this, for those that are asking, I think that growth hormone treatment, which, by the way, in all studies, it's shown just for those guys who are 18 years old, keep messaging me, I'm 18, I want to take growth hormone to grow yeah. taller. It's clearly shown in the studies, the earlier you start, the more you can grow. And literally, if you start after puberty, it's very minimal that you can get and you have to use high doses. The earliest studies actually start at six months. Uh, the, most of the studies try to start like within the age of three or four. So they start very early with the growth hormone treatment. Now, growth hormone treatment is better when combined with Incrolex in studies. Yeah. Yeah. Incrolex is the pharmaceutical IGF-1, which is interesting. Even though the growth hormone raises IGF-1 and even though growth hormone has independent effects. It's Another thing I want to mention is I actually went through the process of checking average estradiol levels for children and trying to plot it out so I could know what is a, what is like if my child had above estradiol levels, above normal levels, when would I know? And they're literally single digit levels up until puberty. So they're really flatlining estradiol yeah. to do this. And then at the tenor stage is four, it goes into the 300s, I believe. That yeah. kind of thing though, is it like, like I know there's always going to be the individuals who say, intra tissue levels are what matter and the blood is just like a proxy for what's in circulation not what's actually like in the tissue so ultimately like it's not like we can measure what's in your like bone or what's in anything so i don't know how much we can like gather from that but from the igf1 levels anything that's in circulation because it's yes. just like in serum rather than like in your brain or your bone or your heart or whatever so, yeah. I mean, they use, for example, when in growth hormone deficiency, they use the IGF-1 level to calibrate the growth hormone dose. So if they get to an average IGF-1 level for the age group, then they, they leave the dose like that. They don't do that for the hepatic short stature. So that's weird because wouldn't you think the guys with GH deficiency instead of, well, I guess it, it depends how much GH you need to calibrate the IGF-1 because like firsthand, and obviously this is individual dependent, but I mean, depending on your liver and how it's going to convert IGF-1, like 
you could only need like a handful of IUs of GH for some people to get into like borderline acromegaly territory. Mm -hmm. But then the idiopathic short stature dose is like, what was it? Like 40 IU per hundred kg or something. Yeah. So like, so you have individuals who are not even deficient technically on paper, just relative to their parents getting more in some cases than like actual dwarfs. I'm think, glad you noticed this. I'm glad you know. That's what I was thinking too. It's basically it, like it's a PED for people that want to get taller. They yeah. abuse it. Isn't yeah, that why true. they prescribe incorrect in those cases? So the growth hormone dose doesn't have to be so high that insulin resistance and diabetes be becomes an issue with... Uh, Incorlex uh, is sparingly used. It's not as well studied. And I don't really know why, to be honest with you. I don't actually know why yet. Very it's, expensive. It's Dude, one thing we should touch on that I think would be great is us discussing the other day the mechanism of growth factors downstream on hypertrophy and like satellite cell proliferation and whatnot. Because I remember... I asked you guys about that whole like insulin competing for IGF-1 BP3 binding sites and the effects it would have downstream on like why insulin and GH would be concurrently like a one plus one equals three effect because no one seems to be able to explain it in like layman's terms. It's kind of just like a jumbled up like, you know, a bunch of scientific jargon that doesn't actually make sense when you extrapolate it out. So I was wondering if maybe you guys wanted to break that down for people to actually understand like why the fuck you would combine them. Is it to relieve stress off the pancreas and the beta cells like Palumbo says? Is it for this? Is it for the downstream cascade of growth factor production that's significantly increased when you use insulin as a with the GH or like what is it exactly? All of it. Basically. First thing we should first thing we should say is that in growth hormone treatment among um among uh, I think growth hormone deficient people, but I'm not completely sure. But growth hormone treatment tends to raise insulin levels by about 400% in some studies. So you already have a higher insulin level when you're using growth hormone, potentially because of what Palumbo was talking about, that insulin resistance, overproduction mm -hmm. from the pancreas. So basically to give you the background, people have been saying that you use insulin uh, with GH to relieve stress on the pancreas because insulin makes you acutely insulin resistant. The problem is insulin resistance is at the level of the receptor, so, yeah. not just at the level of the pancreas. <laughs> so it doesn't really fully make sense that throw more insulin, it'll unlock that receptor, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm not saying that's not the case. Maybe it does relieve some stress from the pancreas. Maybe something that would relieve stress more is a GLP-1 agonist, to be honest with you, maybe in combination. Mm -hmm. but I think their main the main argument behind that is like less insulin output needed to bring down glucose levels because think, you're otherwise chronically leaving them elevated thus inducing more stress on the pancreas to maintain them at homeostasis and then you're relieving the burden to less insulin output needed relative to lowering glucose is the idea the problem I is thought. that the insulin sensitivity lost can be very substantial depending on when you time the growth hormone because it does wait let's take them. let's take a, let's take a step back sorry just derek i want to point out something you were saying that so the idea behind it is produce less endogenous uh, insulin to reach that level of whatever insulin you need. But why is that a point? Just to make clear to the audience, the reason is because historically it was hypothesized that type 2 diabetes occurred via overproduction of insulin from the pancreas, causing the death of beta cells at the pancreas. A yeah. hypothesis that is very much in question. Yeah. So anyway, continue. Yeah. Sorry, Steve. Yeah, so, so, so when you when you take growth hormone at various dosages, I think beyond one or two units, you get so much release of free form fatty acids into the bloodstream that insulin, right, like you mentioned, doesn't act at the receptor anymore, the insulin receptor. So these free form fatty acids inhibit insulin receptor substrate one, which lowers insulin sensitivity and how insulin responds with the receptor itself. So there's very little glucose uptake. Now you can mitigate some of that with IGF-1, which also overlaps with the insulin receptor and has its own uh, IGF-1 receptor, allowing for nutrient uptake. So this is why the timing of growth hormone is so efficient because, or important, because if you take growth hormone before activity, allowing you to right, metabolize through energy expenditure, some of these free form fatty acids, then if you take carbohydrates a couple hours later, the insulin, which is released either from the pancreas or through exogenous use should be active again, because these free form fatty acids, that, that whole issue of inhibiting insulin receptor substrate one is already mitigated through activity. Yeah, but there are multiple mechanisms by which yeah. growth hormone causes the insulin resistance. I believe they are not even fully elucidated and there's several of them. But what I wanted to point out, so Derek brought it up to you and uh, me and Steve in the conversation by saying like, if you use insulin concurrently with growth hormone, can you sort of uh, track the IGF-1 binding proteins to make more free IGF-1 in the bloodstream? Which probably 
potentially true, but I just felt like it misses two important points. One is the IGF-1 binding proteins are integral to its uh, its use in the body. Specifically, I mean, I haven't reviewed this, but specifically, at least I know IGF-1 binding protein 3, extremely crucial for its effects in the body. Okay. I don't know if it binds to insulin, but my goal wouldn't be to get it bound to insulin. So you have The to second thing is, the second thing we, it's just, a, sorry, just one second. The second thing we surpassed is, insulin by itself is anabolic insulin by itself increases igf1 as well so that's the main issue like we said about those fat kids that have high igf1 levels they, their growth hormone doesn't work but the igf1 is so powerful that they still grow taller well you have for growth hormone there's a receptor which binds to growth hormone in serum and it's a truncated receptor so it's actually active in the bloodstream and then allows for membrane activity once it attaches similar to the sexual hormone binding globulin receptor complex where sexual hormone binding globulin delivers androgens to tissue and activates additional uh, signals, which are non-genomic, so not through the DNA directly, um, through the cell membrane. So even though it's bound to uh, a growth hormone receptor or a, a, an IGF-1 binding uh, protein, doesn't mean it's inactive. And especially mm -hmm. with IGF-1 uh, IGF binding protein it's directing 3, it's, active. It's, it's, it's directing it's active, right, through the cell yeah. membrane. So... Right, you take insulin, it starts potentially binding with IGF uh, binding protein three, but you know that there's it, it's much more complicated than that. So a couple of takeaways here is not overdoing any of these dosages, right? If you want synergy between all three, the growth hormone, the insulin, the IGF one, timing is highly important when you take each compound, and not to overdo uh, overdo one of over, over the other in, in unique relations to each other. Because otherwise you miss out on the synergy which occurs within the cell. And then you okay, still need, also, you need nutrients. Yeah. Also, a lot of people forget this. I take insulin. So, no, hyperplasia occurs when sufficient amount of nutrients are in place to reproduce the DNA and divide the cell. So, mm -hmm. right, a lot of people forget this. I'm going to go on a cycle with uh, GH, insulin, and IGF-1. But you still need the nutrients in place to actually facilitate hyperplasia. And when, when all of that is in place... Right? and IGF-1 and insulin facilitate nutrient partitioning for hyperplasia, yeah, then it's highly, highly anabolic. And, it, and to be clear, insulin also modulates by itself many downstream growth factors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're in a hyperinsulinemic state, a lot of growth factors become activated. Maybe similar growth factors as IGF-1 and growth hormone, but some may be slightly different, or the potential may be higher. So there's so many ways in which it may help. Yeah. It's something a lot of people, I think, overlook is like the relationship, like you mentioned how insulin presence is necessary for the production of some of these growth factors like when people hype up the sauna or whatever for its gh spiking properties or like fasting for spiking gh it's like look at igf1 on paper what happens to it when you're fasting i'm not saying you shouldn't fast by the way i'm just saying from like a growth anabolism standpoint people who argue in favor of like fasting for look at your growth hormone like you're getting so much muscle from this downstream it's like no actually your igf one's going in the toilet yeah. when your gh is like at its highest it's not it doesn't convert and do all the stuff that you want in an anabolism context, unless you have the sufficient like substrate from like an insulin insulogenic aspect, which which is really interesting, Derek. Because if you think about it, sometimes these fasting guys who are less like scholarly but more like speakers will say, you know, during a fast, the first three or four days, your growth hormone sh spikes up, which causes you to be anabolic. Which maybe I mean, it, I think it happens through ghrelin, by the way. I think ghrelin, mm. the, the hunger hormone, oh, for sure. hormone yeah. and the growth yeah. hormone makes insulin resistance, so you, you retain, it's not the growth hormone that's making you retain stuff, it's more the ghrelin's effects, but it's interesting, if that was the goal of the body, why wouldn't it rise, raise IGF-1 also? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, so, yeah, it goes in the toilet during fasting, no, it's because like a total li antithesis. Liver glycogen stores deplete, and if you want highest IGF-1 secretion, you need growth hormone and Right, facilitating um, liver glycogen stores through the consumption of carbohydrates with a little bit of insulin release. I think that's the scenario where most IGF-1 is produced. Yeah, maybe that's like one of the best layman terms, ways to explain and summarize the whole thing is like, obviously there's different aspects that have been mentioned and touched on too, but also like without the presence of insulin there, you're not getting any of that downstream growth factor conversion. So, so no, if you your take GH, your exogenous GH is not doing all the things it's capable of doing from a bodybuilding aspect without sufficient insulin. So what I've, and there's something, oh, sorry, Steve. So what I've noticed, I've fasted with basal insulin in place, Lantus. Uh, I'm not going to talk mm -hmm. dosages. It's single digits, highly dangerous. Don't do what I do. Um, then your IGF-1 stays reasonably in range. 
Hmm. But then again, mine is like 200. So the reasonably in range for me is not substantially high. That's high for the fast? Yeah. That's a high level. Yeah, yeah so that's people, that's yeah. that's one unit of growth or 1.2 unit of growth hormone every four hours while fasting and the basal insulin upon waking. Oh, wow. I have a lot of new fasting protocols we should get into yeah, later. Yeah, yeah, I fasted okay. six and a half days last week. I just uploaded yeah, my, we have uh, my video. About, I know. I, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Six okay. and a half? Damn, dude. Nice. Yeah, it was tough. I guess I didn't use any pharmacological aids. No, so no, oh my God. no lyroglutide. Yeah. I'm surprised Psycho. I got videos done. Psycho. <laughs> I feel good though. Real, I feel clean on the inside. Real, qu real quick to close out this growth discussion, in case there's some guys who wanted to hear the, just the sub notes of it. Basically, estradiol is flattened in these cases. Letrozole is always the most effective. The growth hormone treatments they use are very high. The earlier they start, the most the most important thing is the dose and how early you start across all studies. Incrolex is better when with growth hormone. There's a guy called Larone, the guy who Larone syndrome midgets are named after. Larone mm. is the guy who used MK677 in growth hormone deficient children to show that it increased their IGF-1 and made them grow taller also. I believe like Derek, and I didn't know Derek, you had such a similar thought on this, which is that, you know, there's several molecular weight versions of growth hormone. It's clear in academic literature that they have slightly, there's five different versions. They have slightly different effects in the body. When you inject growth hormone, you only get the 22 KDA molecular weight version, which is one of the ways that Derek's very familiar with a test for uh, whether you're abusing growth hormone. Why does that happen? When you inject growth hormone, you shut off your own growth hormone for about four days in humans. So in those four days, you not only shut off your own growth hormone, which meant no one, I don't think anyone's ever talked about in the bodybuilding world, no. but also you no longer have the four, five versions of growth hormone anymore. But if you use MK677, which is not inhibited by somatostatin, the natural thing that inhibits growth hormone secretion, then you could have five molecular weights and your growth hormone. I've noticed in people that I talk to that train and use both growth hormone and MK677 that they notice more results. I don't know. I don't know if it's I really definitely wrong. notice like an extreme proliferative effect, like not just on it's harder to quantify in muscle growth because there's so much like temporary stuff being altered when you add in ibutamorin to your GH because just like, you know, fluid dynamics and shit on MK are just wildly all over the place. But above and beyond that, like the only time I ever got gyno, like almost full blown gyno was when I combined MK with GH. So like for me, like obviously the proliferative effects are like quite significant and overlapping. And although that's like in a negative aspect, like you can imagine from all the other vectors of stimulation, like that kind of thing is probably happening too. I imagine you become insulin resistant incredibly quickly when combining the two. So you have to be very, very mindful of that because MK is like very problematic at, you know, elevating blood glucose and being problematic to control it. Yeah, but I had a little protocol to circumvent that. So you take MK677 twice a week on your weaker body parts that you're trying to improve because recovery mostly happens after the workout. So let's say you take your pre-workout growth hormone on this weaker body parts and then your 20 to 30 milligrams of uh, MK677 before bed. And then the next day you lose a lot of insulin sensitivity, but this red strenuous workout that occurred the day before should be able to mitigate some of that. Um, By the way, as far as GH timing, sorry if I interrupted. No, go for, something it. I wanted to, go for it. Is uh, like when you mentioned, you're not sure if people have brought up that GH production gets shut off as a downstream consequence of exogenous GH use. That was when I first did a video on GH timing, I was mindful of that. So for me, when people always ask me, like, when's the best time to administer GH? I always thought, well, you're going to be shut down. Like there is a negative feedback loop that most people don't talk about when it comes to GH. And they think, oh, my production at nighttime is like 100% like what it should be when it's not. So like I always said, you should have like, I don't say you don't, you don't have to do this. Obviously, it could be like neg negligible at the end of the day. But I always thought a pre-workout shot induce the lipolysis, you know, get, you know, maybe some extra fat burning capabilities potentially. And then your second shot, if you were using a high enough dose where it would warrant splitting it up, would always be pre-bed to kind of like backfill that, that allocation of time when you otherwise would have had your peak production, which you otherwise don't have now with negative feedback in place. So that's what I always thought as far as timing wise, if you had a two shot increment always made the most sense is like pre-workout lipolysis, pre-bed because you're not getting that spike that you otherwise would have got during your you know sleep yeah well also yeah th that's very rational because also i found out recently i was able to drill it down into the neurotransmitter level 
the growth hormone increase after you squat or do a highly aerobic workout is via adrenaline, not via choline, not via GABA. There's a lot of other reasons it could be. It's via adrenaline. So it would be smart also to mimic the growth hormone if you're shut down, to mimic it after the workouts, I would think, not just for lipolysis, but to have a... Uh, the other thing, by the way, you mentioned gyno. I looked into that recently. I was trying to find out how growth hormone can cause gynecomastia. The, the, everything I've researched, it seems to be, although ghrelin may be different because of prolactin, but everything I've researched, it seems to be that it just magnifies the proliferative role of estrogen at the estrogen receptor or potentially the progesterone receptor. Think, it doesn't seem to have a direct impact on the glands. I think there's some, well, some overlap with the prolactin receptor because... Yeah. Prolactin well, potentially, yeah. yeah. So, but, so if, you, if you already have elevated prolactin levels for whatever reason, and you take five, right? You stimulate the secretion of five different molecular weights growth hormone, which I think only three are in serum and two are in post exercise states the 23 and 24 kilodalton molecular they're weight. So they're all in cerebrospinal fluid. All, all, all in spinal fluid, okay. So, right, if there's some overlap with the prolactin receptor and you have five different kinds of uh, growth hormone plus elevated prolactin levels, right, and the proliferative effect of growth hormone through the growth hormone receptor at this gynecomastia mm -hmm. tissue, then Right. All you need is a little bit of progesterone and you're uh, off to the races. Yeah, so the, the, the role of prolactin in causing male gynecomastia is slightly debated. Mm. I, I think it does have, a, obviously we have experience knowing this, but... Look at this graphical representation I just WhatsApped you and then you can see this is from like well-established literature and this shows all the proliferative stimulatory actions on breast tissue and how it's done and then the inhibitory actions as well. Yeah, that's what I was seeing. Exactly. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. I also wanted to mention something. Uh, since we're talking about growth hormone, maybe we can go through this real quick. I discovered some recent things about growth hormone in the last couple of months while I was doing this research. Just a quick ones. Growth hormone treatment inhibits ghrelin, reduces ghrelin secretion by a low amount, like 19% after four months of growth hormone treatment. Another reason to consider using MK677. Growth hormone treatment vastly decreases GLP-1 activity in the body. For those that forgot our audience, GLP-1 agonists like liraglutide, duloglutide, semaglutide are these appetite-inhibiting new diabetic drugs. The interesting thing is that growth, it, it, the treatment raises IGF-1 levels and lowers GLP-1 levels. So I finally you, got a GLP to work for me, by the way. Which one? So I, semaglutide, but it took a way higher dose than I thought it would. It took me two milligrams. No way. Oh, you're still yeah. at two milligrams? I'm prescribed 2.4, 2.6, whatever the max is. 2.4 is the Wegovy obesity, like fat motherfucker <laughs> dose. So that, that's, that's a hectic dose, dude. How, how, I don't uh, play games, man. I don't play. I just. But you got such significant suppression off like barely anything. So I'm surprised you pushed but, it. Like I only pushed it because I tried. So I tried dulaglutide. Like I, I like manually backfilled the pin and did like micro shots. That didn't work. And then you were like, do the whole thing, pussy. And I was like, okay, fine. So I did like a whole shot. Oh. Didn't do anything for me. Then I did the Liraglutide at 0 0.6, 1 1.2, 1.8. Didn't do a whole lot for me. I think potentially it's because I didn't do it. Like I wasn't consistent with my days in a row because I think mm -hmm. there must be some yeah, cumulative buildup. Oh, yeah. 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 But then when I got to SEMA, 0.5 i was like scared of like obviously you're a bit hesitant when you start anything when you hear people like puking off shit and like getting severely nauseous yeah. steve's eve's experience is pretty terrifying to hear about yeah so i started at 0.25 didn't notice anything did like 0.5 the week after didn't notice anything went up to one and i was just like this stuff doesn't work for me obviously and then one day i was like you know what like let me try like close to the fat motherfucker dose. Let's go. So I went two <laughs> milligrams and I was like, and then no, don't really want to eat now. Yeah. Uh, well, at least you, really you went, you went with the highest effective dose. <laughs> Finally. Yeah, two, I could, I actually have some leeway with 2.4 yeah. technically. Okay. But. Yeah, he has to get to my dose. Yeah. <laughs> but wait, Derek, did you get the acid reflux and the kind of like, no, no, oh, you still didn't get that. Oh, wow. No. You're really sense. I've been a really bit more fast. fatigued, but I'm not sure if that I think that might be that or maybe it's just because my sleep schedule is fucked up. It's hard to say when there's so many factors at play, but it definitely I've definitely noticed something significant to a point where I'm just like, like skipping so, meals that I normally wouldn't. So with the street value, you're shooting $250 in one go. <laughs> I, maybe, maybe. I don't know. I don't remember what a, I don't know what a Wego V pen would go for. But if you went from like the Ozempic street value, I guess, technically, yeah, it's mad expensive. So we should, yeah. This should be a learning lesson for our audience to compare poor medicine uh, protocols like mine with yours. Always start very slow. There's no reason to overdo it. I, on the other hand, 
heard about it, got a prescription, went to CVS in the parking lot. I shot the whole pen in the parking lot. I didn't even antibacterialize nothing. I just, and then I went to a party. Yeah. I went to a, a yeah. social event. I could have yeah. thrown up there. I just didn't. I was like, this is pretty good. It worked. Then well. you smoke like, weed at the party. Yes, too? I swear. <laughs> also, <laughs> that's it out. So yeah, it's pretty hectic. I would but, okay, be on so the floor would... rolling around in misery on that dose. Yeah, you're right. you're on two point four right now. Like no, as no, we're no. talking, I've barely taken these. I've taken. Uh, so you're prescribed it, but you don't actually take that much. No, I couldn't. Uh, I wouldn't be able to eat. Yeah. It's yeah, crazy. I was gonna say like two point four. You must be like given your response before. Like I would think you wouldn't eat like the whole fucking week. No, yeah, I didn't. Basically, I didn't take it because I had to eat enough to because I went back to the gym. And now yeah. maybe I'll start taking it again when I lose the lose body. We got to talk about your updated thoughts on like pre-workout androgens and injectable androl and all that <laughs> right. stuff, too. Because like, I don't think people like people who are just seeing us revisit this now might not follow as closely with your like individual logged stuff about your your neck, like doubling in size, you gaining all this weight, you using pre-workout androgens again, the injectable androl stuff um your thoughts on like what's the most like innocuous way to approach pre-workout oral administration or like some substitute for that with like suspended solutions or what sublingual we had talked about too speaking of which have you not tried the sublingual anadrol yet i absolutely have, I have yeah. okay okay let's let's yeah let's we can talk revisit about that it. Next. let's talk about that next. Okay. so i was just going to leave a couple of notes about the, uh, the growth hormone lessons one thing i learned uh, growth hormone reduces your T4. Everyone knows this reduces your T4 synthesis and conversion of T4 to T3. So supplementing with T4 may be useful, but why also? Because growth hormone is a hormone that's trophic to the thyroids and thyroid cancer is on the rise all around the world. So if you're on growth hormone treatment, I think it may be protective maybe to take levothyroxine T4. Not oh, for T4. sure. For sure. It has been known for 10 years now. Yeah. Second thing is about the, we know we're getting insulin resistant. Why don't you use a GLP-1 agonist since GLP-1 is lowering in the system dramatically? We know that. It could be interesting because it could increase your insulin secretion, maybe give you more IGF-1. And there is tachyphylaxis with these GLP-1 agonists, at least in terms of um, motility in the gut. Like when yeah. you first take them, they keep food in your gut. When you when you get used to it, you can get used to it. I've seen some people that got almost completely used to it. So After 12 it could weeks, be something it, 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 you get I would be mind, mindful of time of exposure, though, because... On paper, maybe it makes sense to be like, maybe you could use a little bit of a GLP-1. But if you're like an off-season bodybuilder, oh, like right. you don't want to be on a GLP-1 just because you're on GH. Like, obviously, if you're in prep, though, it makes unless like... You can't, unless you can eat on it. Yeah, like I know people who can't even eat without factoring that in. So like putting... I'd be fucking careful about that's where timing the, on that, obviously. That's where the pancreatic <laughs> cancer comes from, right? Because some of these uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists have been associated with pancreatic cancer. But if you eat like an asshole on these compounds and you just promote insulin secretion over time, I, I think that's the reason why some of these people with diabetes get pancreatic cancer on uh, GLP. -1. Have they really? Uh, because because GLP one agonists, I'm writing a uh, making a video on this re mm -hmm. uh, soon. They have pleiotropic health effects, mm -hmm. like massive neuroprotection in the brain, oh, mostly due to insulin resistance issues in the brain, but also massive protection in the body due to potentially lower, uh, like in, in, actually, I wanted to get into this later. There's the, the, the other thing is inflammation. They massively reduce inflammation. So for example, for atherosclerosis, there are models showing it reduces plaque development and inflammation inflammatory bowel disease i didn't know about this pancreas thing honestly uh, yeah Steve, that's why the first time i mentioned it on, in, uh, on uh, youtube know, right a couple months ago people were immediately quick to uh, post those studies where uh, pancreatic cancer or or was it um maybe not pancreatic cancer but another cancer Are you thinking about that like rare thyroid cancer or maybe hey, thyroid was... cancer yeah maybe i'm mistaken. yeah because but anyway, so those were my notes. The final thing I want to tell you guys about growth hormone, just for the audience to know, growth hormone increases your kidneys filtration rate by 15% when you're on growth hormone levels to create acromegaly, meaning you're abusing growth hormone like a bodybuilder. You take eight units, four units. Your EGFR of your kidney on your, on your blood test, which you use to judge your kidney function, is falsely inflated. It looks like it's better than it is. That's something I don't think anyone talked about before. And it actually also increases your creatinine number and um, and uh, about CSTAN and C, it uh, raises, uh, falsely raises your CSTAN and C. So basically, it's giving you indications. Wait, wait. And didn't creatinine go up and CSTAN and C goes down? Wasn't that? No, I believe it's uh, whichever the direction that's that's worse. So CSTAN and C, it, it, it raises it, which is better for you. And creatinine, it also it decreases it. Sorry.
Yeah. So it decreases it, creatinine, yeah. raises uh, CSNC. Oh, Sorry, okay, right, right, okay. Yeah, <laughs> basically, basically making it appear in many ways that your kidney is functioning slightly better than it is. So the only thoughts I would offer here is just take it with a grain of salt, your kidney markers. They may be worse than they appear. They will get much more normal within four weeks. This is just an acute effect. So if you stop the growth hormone, wait four weeks, you'll know what it really looks like. And then there's another marker called symmetric dimethylarginine, SDME. Highly uh, good proxy for kidney function. I always like to triangulate between creatinine, CSTAN C, and SDMA. That way you have a good picture, or you could do ultrasound of your kidney. Yeah. Okay, those were my notes there. You guys want to talk about cycling, uh, healthy cycling? Uh, yeah, uh, before we do that, just really quick though, you mentioned the uh, thyroid. Like, are you supplementing with thyroid now? Yes. Like, yes. as a re- and the main reason is to avoid thyroid cancer potentially, or because you actually because of the HCG and the growth hormone. I took a bit of growth hormone when I was fixing my finger. I stopped now mostly, although I enjoyed it. I got to admit, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. I slept nice. I was like, yeah, maybe I should just keep doing it. But anyway, so yeah, because of that and the HCG. The HCG is, a, as people know, direct agonist of the T- TSH receptor. So it causes you to grow your thyroid without knowing it in your blood test. Your TSH will be actually lower. So what are you taking for your thyroid? Right uh, just 100 micrograms of T4. Okay. That's the light. I mean, yeah. I started yesterday. Yeah. I, I was out. You did also? Yeah, I was off it for a couple of months because I stopped the growth hormone. And then I ran an experiment with the ACG. I reintroduced that a couple of weeks ago to see how much of an effect it would have on my thyroid markers. But my TSH actually came up. But it could also be because I've been in a caloric restrictive state for such a long time. And I saw that my T3 and T4 levels were declining. So mm-hmm. now I added in 100 micrograms of T4. And then I will retest my thyroid in a couple of weeks because I also bumped up my calories. And uh, the ACG will stay in there. But of course, I'm running a, a conservative dose of 250 IUs three times per week. Oh. Yeah. No, how come you guys don't have any thoughts on using something like a desiccated thyroid that has all the broad spectrum hormones in balance already. And you just like rely entirely on your deodinase enzyme activity to be on point. Like you don't worry about any of that stuff. It's not that I don't worry about it. I'm, I'm frightened by cytomel or T3, which is a part of desiccated or armor thyroid. That's a, a mixture because of, of the direct effect on your heart. Yeah. So, so uh, I can so my body could, uh, I assume mod, mod modulate how much T3 I get throughout the day, yeah. but if I'm yeah. dosing it, I have to then dose every so often. There's a, you know, it's inconsistent. And personally, to be honest with you, Derek, I've tried this with, uh, T3 by itself. I've experimented. It has a very direct cardiac effect for me that cannot be inhibited by a beta blocker. Cannot be tried, it's it's a different receptor. Yeah. yeah it ever, has no effect on it. And have pro- you ever tried sustained release T3? No, I haven't. I haven't oh, actually. We have oh. that. Oh, oh really? Yeah, that's what I use personally. Okay. okay I might what be. is what is your uh, dosing protocol for the sustained release? There. Um, for me, I use uh, two grain of Nature Thoroid, and then I added in fifteen micrograms of T three on top, but which is SR. But that might be, frankly, I might cut right. down the desiccated dose by like, might be like one to one and a half grain and then keep the SR at the same dose. I don't know though, because I definitely do notice too, that there is, maybe it's the, like I ultimately probably does boil down to the T3 exposure, but my resting heart rate is a little bit higher lately too. So I might actually be tweaking that. So. Did you did you use those uh, thyroid medications when you were experimenting with the uh, liraglutide and the semaglutide and that kind of stuff? Because I mean, these, these thyroid meds are known to boost your appetite and Personally, I don't have any experience directly uh, using T3 with uh, a GLP-1, but maybe that's the reason why you need a higher dose of the GLP-1 because you have this T3 medication in place to boost your appetite throughout the day. So you don't have a... Yeah, but the, t- the thyroid dosing protocol has been consistent for like a year now. It's not like anything okay. was manipulated before and after the GLP-1 introduction or anything. Wait, that's pretty interesting. Steve mentioned this. The, one of the only... Uh, non-responders to GLP-1 agonists or less responders I've encountered was also on thyroid medication. I doubt it could be causing such an interference, but it, it definitely wasn't. does boost appetite a bit. Yeah. But so my, my issue. So talking with, about uh, so what happened to me? Oh, like it's just one one comment on the T3 sub, uh, supplementation. Like once you start supplementing with a little bit of T3, or your metabolism is always going. And if you're trying to sustain some muscle mass, but at one point in in the day you want to do some intermittent fasting. Right? You still need to have some protein in your diet because otherwise right, you get a little bit of catabolic effect. So this is the reason why I prefer not to take the T3 unless I'm completely dialed in during a cutting phase right, where I'm yeah. eating multiple times per day. 
because sometimes I just feel like doing a, you know, time restricted eating from four till 10, for example. And if I take T3 in the morning, or even if it's active for the day before the day, right, two days before, then you just feel a little bit, um, I don't know, hangry, I would say. Really? Right? Yeah, because wow. it just keeps working. So this is why I, I don't know. take it. I only put 25 micrograms in at the end of a cutting phase when I absolutely need it through uh, thyroid markers, showing that it's all going to shit. You know? I don't know if I'm going to stay on it, by the way. This is like sort of an experiment too, a little bit in okay. terms of, because I've always had... I have, I don't have hypothyroid biomarkers, but they're not like optimal. And no matter what I do lifestyle diet wise, it's like the one thing I can't dial in perfectly to a point where my TSH isn't always like elevated to a point that it's not, it's not out of range, but it's always like, I have a bit too much stimulation than I would like. And it mm. kind of like, and like 2.5 or so. Yeah. Like in the twos and threes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I wouldn't accept that. Yeah, yeah I, so like I could never get it into ones, like even regardless of my iodine intake, regardless of my selenium intake, regardless of my diet quality and micronutrient oh, intake. Yeah, do you sleep, need some T3 any... to bring it down? Yeah. Hey, let's let's remind the audience though that I the rise in iodine consumption around the world is thought to be the reason for the increase in thyroid cancers. It's thought to be. And also, um oh, you were mentioning something else that was interesting, but still my mind. Oh, I can't remember. You, goiter you goiter related, related to super low iodine, maybe? I forgot. No, okay. I, sometimes I forget random things. Anyway, let's discuss what I've been doing at the gym. So basically, it's all been a mistake, really. What happened was I was getting excited about my wife getting pregnant, and I said, you know what? I need a bit more energy. So I've been like a natural 400 for, tests. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I've been natural for, for four years or three years or whatever, three years. So. And I used to, to me before, 400 was a HRT uh, dose. So I thought that, okay, I'll start with 400 and HCG and FSH. Ended up in a, like, a, I don't know what to describe it as, like a sex drive from hell. Couldn't, yeah. couldn't work, couldn't. No, I, was like, no. I, I can imagine when you're deprived too and you're not used to it. Like when you're, you're, everyone remembers their first cycle and it feels like you hit puberty again with your yeah. sex drive. And eventually you sort of like acclimate to the heightened androgen exposure That's where your sex drive isn't like as ridiculous. But when you like first do it after being natural for years like it was probably you probably couldn't do anything you're probably just <laughs> thinking about sex all fucking day yeah, yeah two two comments about that i was really happy to notice that because for the audience to know when you use high levels of testosterone your sex drive acclimates and then when you go back if you're using 750 and you go back down to 200 you're actually like hyposexual compared to what you used to be normally so you really adapt and i thought we would never desensitize from that i guess i did a lot but also the stupidity that i had was i added the hcg and the fsh which increased sex oh. drive way more than testosterone yeah. so basically yeah. i was dead for like two weeks <laughs> after that after that i was like i'm not touching that again i never injected testosterone again and since then uh Actually, even I've been like, honestly, not so consistent with the HCG and FSH, but I've been doing it, but, but I've been doing it enough to get that resilience. So anyway, the reason why I started all this, I was like, I want resilience. I'm going to have a baby. I need a lot of energy. I need to go do things. And I got that. But then, uh, I also started thinking like, I should go to the gym. And I don't know how these should, things came about. You put it to work at least, yeah. I, no, I, I think it was because I got tired. We couldn't cycle here. You know, we were locked down and all that stuff and the gym's open. But anyway, I went to the gym. And what happens when you go to the gym is that you realize, wait a minute, this sucks working out without hormones. This is really bad. And I was like, I'm already on hormones. I have HCG and FSH, so I could add a little something here or there. So that's how the oral thing started. And basically, since then, I've experimented sometimes with some injectables just to try things for clients. But basically, I've been using probably less than like 300 milligrams a week or 350, but mostly pre-workout short acting drugs. And from like a health standpoint, like frankly, that's other than the fact that you're using some like the, like the most carcinogenic <laughs> drug ever through Anadrol, but like the actual thought process behind the cycle design is like, is actually probably the healthiest thing on paper. When you look at your biomarkers from like a lipid standpoint, yeah um from a shbg standpoint like hcg for example is like so much more tolerable on all those metrics like when you see the for example a guy who's doing trt versus the equivalent total t from hcg monotherapy it's like the biomarkers are so much cleaner on hcg maybe you don't get better body composition because you have maybe a disproportionately lower free from you know less shbg and whatnot but like your your lipids are going to be so much better your mm -hmm. shbg is going to be better a lot of things are going to be a lot more in line when you don't have just like a heightened level of testosterone from the exogenous shot 
And I imagine just like, I imagine your HDL is probably like way better than it would be otherwise on an equivalent dose of like exogenous tea. Well, my HDL was like 150 before I started or 130. So it was very high. So it did decrease right. a lot. But um, what I did though, Derek, once I took that first injection of testosterone, see, I used to take a statin, like a baby statin twice a week. I used to be very conservative. The day I took it, I took 20 milligrams of Resuva statin and I began like a very intense therapy. So my LDL is probably like 30 or 40 or so. So I'm not too concerned about that. And then 30? I have, you know, a lot of... Yeah, very, very low. It's very low because I take 20, 20 resuvastan daily, which I don't need. Mm -hmm. I have a, you know, protective polymorphism and then I have mm -hmm. a zetamibe. So I have very little. So the interesting to. thing about that, though, then is too like even if on paper your biomarkers are better because you're using things that stimulate endogenous production, when you're crushing your lipids or your LDL specifically with statins, aren't you like severely inhibiting your response from a performance standpoint and any kind of or ergogenic aid? when you are smashing the thing that hcg is like kind of leveraging to actually create testosterone like your no. substrate for steroidogenesis is like in the ground but you're relying I, I, on endogenous processes to get the effects you're trying to get out of your ped essentially that's a good point you would think the inhibition of cholesterol but it's not i mean there is a, i guess it's enough i guess it's enough cholesterol i haven't noticed mm. that I, yeah, I, was, I haven't i haven't even but i wasn't using hcg before this so, so then there's like there's like a work. slight argument from that aspect if you're like aggressively modulating lipids with medications then you might almost be better off with like a bit of hcg a bit of fsh and a bit of test yeah probably, probably. but the thing yeah. is this the thing is this i just haven't needed it i mean um like judging by my mood my mood has been great and i have a lot more energy honestly than before i used hcg but then in terms of the gym uh, I've been going to the gym for four months and I've, I haven't went for two weeks, by the way, I don't know why, but I've been going for four months and I've been gaining really fast. I mean, it's muscle memory, but I don't think, I mean, I don't think I have any anabolic issues because I was gaining. So no, you look fucking huge yeah. in your videos with Tony recently. Right. Everyone's like, who's this guy? <laughs> yeah. Even I saw it. I was like, what the what fuck, the fuck? Am I yeah. looking at, dude? You're too yeah, thin. Right? Very quickly. When I went. You're, you're too thin. Yeah, I was. Probably too, but fat, but a little bit, little bit fat, you know, I'm not as big as I used, I used to be, but I gained a lot of the muscle back. And no, it's it was like, I thought I accidentally like found like a throwback picture. And I was like, <laughs> I was crazy. like, I thought you met Tony like recently. I was like, what the fuck? This is weird. You know, what's weird though. Now I have to ask you guys about this. So I don't know. I've never been recognized in person because I have a tiny channel and I don't expect to be, I'm a normal civilian and stuff. But recently, like a couple of months ago, people have started coming up to me in the gym. Like, Hey, I watch your channel. Usually. Do you have a channel? Do you have a podcast with Derek from More Place, More Dates? Yeah. I'd be like, oh yeah, that's me. And they're like, oh, you're Leo. I was like, yeah. so, but, but a couple of things. Everybody who came up to me is like, oh, you're way bigger in person. I don't know. They think I'm some like very small, no. skinny, mid <laughs> guy. It's been happening surprised. to me like for 10 years. So because they see you on a small screen and then they yeah. see your real life. Like recently I did a couple training videos in Padia and people were freaking out. Like, I really? can't believe oh, how big yeah. you are, but they don't Dude, realize I get that it. I've been going back to the gym for the last four months or three months, and I went back on cycle also. So, yeah, muscle memory. No, when we, when we sit here in, like, a t like, a T-shirt or whatever, and you're not, like, trying to really look big necessarily, it comes across way differently. Like, I get comments on my channel all the time. It's like, Derek's off cycle. He's way smaller now. And then if I happen to be in, like, a tank one day, like a tank top, and my delts are out, people are like, whoa, yeah. like, what happened? What are you doing? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Side I look answer. exactly the fucking Sam, dude. Exactly. Yeah. But 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 that's the good thing about not using your because imagine you were one of those guys that wears like a skimpy like a uh, stringer, like yeah, stringer, that's me. and then and then that's me. No, you don't do what that. are you talking about? Yeah. No, 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 no. You don't do that. I do skimpy, no, you don't. I, do that. I show some guns nowadays. Yeah, but it's hard in Thailand. Yeah. So. On occasion, though, imagine you did it all the time, and then you you wanted to like not work out for a while or take a break or something. I did. Yeah, and everybody it. was hating Thailand. me. You know that Steve lost all his gains. Well, now they're back, buddy. So <laughs> other, the other day, I was at the gym and I was like uh, on a lat pull down machine, and it takes me a long time there. So I sit between the sets. I'm sitting and I see I see a guy walks by me and then comes right walks by then turns around looks at me and comes back i was trying to pay attention but then i see him walk in front of me behind the machine holding his phone pretending to type but taking pictures of me as he walks by i'm like whoa man this is so weird so then he came back around and took more pictures but then i was like what do i did should i say something does has this ever happened to you guys yeah for the last two years. I, it has I, happened I, to you. it's so weird <laughs> why wouldn't you come say hi to me i mean i'm a friendly guy i don't understand i'm really bad at noticing like 
I don't know, like re- even when I did the pickup artist stuff, like indicators of interest, IOIs, I was always terrible at figuring out like who was looking at me first. So when I would just like go up to girls, I thought were attractive, but like with, even with guys, like I have a hard time telling sometimes like who's looking at me or not. And it's not until they come up to me and say something that I'm aware, but um, I, yeah, I've never caught somebody like taking a picture of me like inconspicuously, but usually at this point, it's like every time I work out, it's like one, at least one guy comes up to me. Is it for you usually? Do you, does it happen to you if you go to like if you go out with people or you go somewhere in public or is it the gym? Uh, it's uh well, it's obviously way more prevalent at the gym, but now it's at the point where even if I'm in like my buddy's building, I'm in his elevator, it'll be like some random guy. I'm like, <laughs> shit. Oh that's yeah. Cool. Oh, that's great. Yeah. No, so, so for me, it's been happening for ten years, but it's because I'm big and living in Asia, so not necessarily due to the YouTube channel. I did you the, stand out like crazy? Probably. Yeah, right. I stand out like a sore thumb, so I get. My picture's taken in the in the SkyTrain, and they end up on some you know some uh, men of the SkyTrain uh, Facebook page, and uh, where they start voting on you. Oh, this guy's hot, you know this kind of stuff or not. <laughs> so that's been I'm going not up on any of that stuff for for ten years. <laughs> it's been going on. So, but it, of course, I get recognized a little bit. But I'm a little bit worried about when Thailand opened up opens up again that a lot of people are going to pop up at the, the Muscle Factory and then uh, mm. want to take me out to dinner and nice do a thing. workout and that kind of stuff, which unfortunately really don't have time for but but it's a nice thing the one the people that approach me they're really not they're really yes, interesting people yeah super nice for people, sure yeah, yeah always yeah, most people are like really really respectful and they don't want to they're like mindful that i'm working out and they don't take up too much of my yeah. time and they'll say you know it just say like like your channel like love yeah. your stuff like you know can't believe didn't know you lived here or like whatever and you know take a picture and right that's kind of it so. Yeah, that's pretty cool right, so, it's good to have a chat so, once in a while you know to uh, see what they're up to what they took from the channel because a lot of people are highly appreciative of the information that we provide you know it's yeah. life-changing information what we provide so yeah. so talking about uh, these cycles or what may be less harmful or more harmful so my thoughts there just to explain to the audience why i use pre-workout androgens it's mainly because the main reason i'm using them is for fun i get a lot of enjoyment when i lift uh, weights in the gym i gotta stop lifting heavier weights but for me uh uh the strength i get in the gym is really what i want i don't really want to get much bigger or anything like that so my goal is to minimize you know to to maximize my experience in the gym and minimize the total uh you know oxidative stress to the body and total damage blood pressure all these kind of things i do so that was my approach but i do think it's valuable to others also in the sense that short acting compounds i like to think like this like most people need some kind of injectable uh, if they're bodybuilders or so on they need an injectable long acting thing for their you know for their base to have some kind of stability uh psychological st- stuff protein synthesis and so on but i feel like if you use instead of like using equipoise, deca, and testosterone your whole off season and using them all in long acting uh, injectables, you'll adapt as much as your body can to those doses during that time period. At which point you either have to escalate the dose or change the drugs completely. My idea is that shorter acting compounds to some degree, your body may not totally adapt to. So you can bring them in and out in cycles as opposed to rel- like, for example, the traditional bodybuilding approach to anadrol. Take four weeks of anadrol, like the Chad Nichols approach, take yeah. four weeks of Anadrol, then switch, then take two weeks break, then take uh, Danable, four weeks of Danable. My approach would be like, use Anadrol three days a week. And that way it's somewhat out of your system at some point. And that way you can, because I've noticed when back in the day, I used to take Anadrol sometime two weeks in a row. And I would notice it stops working. You hold less glycogen, you can see it, you know, and the same with Superdrol or some of these other kind of compounds. So the idea was short acting compounds have some value in the sense that you can introduce something once a week and take it back out and you could use it potentially longer with less side yeah. effects. Yeah, I think so. The other thing is- I've experimented with this with some of my clients to use Anadrol twice a week, pre-workout sublingually um, to bring up your body parts and the lipids and liver enzymes barely change. Right, or at least acceptable, you know, with a couple percents off, which is well, you throw in 100 milligrams extra steroids on top, right? You should expect a little bit of a negative health ramifications on your blood work markers, but the the results are still very pronounced. But without most of the side effects, especially with compounds like anadrol or superdrol, where they suppress your appetite and and right, take away from your liver health. Now, by the way, on the topic that Steve often mentions about uh, solvents in these oral injectable things, mm-hmm. we have seen some evidence recently. So I've been seeing clients' blood work that use injectable like DHB or injectable Superdrol or Anadrol once in a while, but none of my clients use them daily. 
So I would see C-reactive protein normalized, uh, not major issues. Mm. Now, uh, Steve obviously had a client who used injectable anadrol and his C -R CRP was 40 or 20 50, or something like yeah, that, right? 50. 50. <laughs> so, so recently though, one of my clients turned up a day after he injected an injection with a lot of solvents. And then the day after it showed in the CRP and in the ALT. So there may be short-term effects that I wasn't seeing, yeah. even in myself. Yeah in yeah. the last few months so the so crp goes up for about four to five days and then returns to baseline so if you do it like no, once it, a week in this case it was returning at least within three days so it was oh, elevating okay. slightly okay. yeah i was missing it ah, so okay. so it's possible to miss it so that's just something for and then talk about sublingual use yeah i, I listened to both of you guys mm -hmm. these these guys have both been telling me to use it sublingually so First of all, the reason why I didn't do it before, guys, just, just to understand my thinking, was I was like, if you put it under your tongue, eventually you're going to swallow it anyway. So I was, Im I was imagining yeah. like 70% is swallowed anyway, 30% yeah. gets somewhat absorbed, right? Mm -hmm. It depends on what you've prepared it like. Like if you have a pharmacy who made you a troche that's designed for yeah. sublingual yeah, so or I, buckle, I, but so if you I have like a UGL tab and you're like shoving it under your tongue, like I don't so, know if it would... So yeah. So I asked somebody that that I know who has troches from a pharmacy of Anadrol, right. and I asked him, "Is this better absorbed under the in the mouth?" But he had no response for me. I don't know why he didn't answer. I should have asked you. But anyway, so the point is, I, I have tried that. What I have noticed is this: I've noticed that if I be a bit excessive and I like literally gargle for twenty five minutes while like researching something, I absorb way more than if you do this like yeah, you five gotta move it around right? yeah so that's oh, why yeah. I, so i put the atrocious underneath my tongue and then i put the mask on right it's still a mandate here then i drive to the gym and i you know vigorously um i'd move that around <laughs> in my mouth and then but that's why they call you that yeah <laughs> vigor steve then. should get some tobacco in there you know and then I spit it out and then uh yeah i start my workouts and the pumps are um yeah phenomenal so, hmm. so, so also, I wanted to mention a couple more things about designing healthy cycles. I think so, that. So wait, did you try the sublingual and what? what yeah, happened? I, I always use it now. I okay. always use. Oh, the so you, so you don't inject it anymore? No, I, I, I was injecting it until recently. That CRP thing scared the hell out of yeah. me. So mm -hmm. now we're, we're. I'm. The thing is, I don't trust the makers. You know, some of them say we don't use this solvent or we don't use ethyl. I don't believe you, Lines. and I can't, I can't find yeah. out. Yeah, we use MCT, and then there's still ethylolate in there. Come on, yeah, guys, you know. Exactly. And, and then yeah, so like I, I think even it, you are gonna swallow a trace amount of it, or maybe no, you a will. decent amount. You will. You will. I but think like ultimately, you, you have to consider too, like when they were trying to get around drug testing in the olympics with the duchess cocktail they had like this solution that they would swish around your mouth with i think it was like oral trenbolone they swapped it out for terinabol which used to be in it they had um it was uh metanolone as well as i forget what it was it might have been might have been superdrol or metanolone i forget what it is but anyway like the idea was to like not get trace amounts swallowed so like there is historical evidence of even like top athletes doing this to avert like the first pass in the liver and granted they're they're using like they were adding it in like a shot and they were like swishing it around their mouth rather than a troche but they they didn't have like a pharmacy creating troches for them that are designed for sublingual absorption anyway so like mm -hmm. you will probably get some trace amounts but ultimately like this is the tried and true method tried and true method for like actual pharmaceuticals that are designed to skip first pass. And ultimately you will get a different pharmacokinetic profile out of it to some extent. And it's going to be more representative of IV administration, which to me sounds pretty fucking ideal for getting it Perfect. in and out of your yeah. system even yeah. faster mm -hmm. and avoiding whatever you're getting when you're pinning the shit. No, so I have heard of some people that swish it around and actually spit it out. Yeah, right. that's what they did with yeah. the Duchess cocktail. Oh, wow. That's interesting. I would take that 10% so I... uh, orally and swallow it with grapefruit to prevent... Um... Right, prevent mm -hmm. uh, the first pass in the liver a little bit with the naringin in the right? uh, naringin, oh. right? That so that inhibits a little bit of the breakdown with the sip uh, three or four enzymes. So, 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 so uh, other couple of notes I, I thought we could mention, Steve, on uh, healthy cycling. We need to talk about the shutting down your, your HPG for mm -hmm. below three hundred, which is a good topic. But I just want to mention briefly synergies between compounds. Another way to really reduce the total androgen load you need, like. Uh, you know, we have this. Uh, what's that website, uh, Steve? That we the molecular one I sent you that you oh, can test. Um, so there's, Swiss, a, there's an algorithm. Swiss Target or whatever. Yeah, Swiss. yeah, the Swiss Target. So just for the audience to know, if you look at these molecules, softwares that have to predict where these molecules can attach to show widely differing receptors that they attach to. So there must be a lot of synergies between these things. So I think that's one of the values also of using short-acting things intermittently. 
No, oh, yeah. When I first saw that software, like obviously some of it I imagine is quite speculative, but when I saw it being broken down, like that was some of the guys who work at Merrick were the ones who introduced me to it for the first time, like a fuck, I don't know, almost two they years ago now. Me. Yeah, yeah. So that was when I first um started communicating with those guys, I was like, you know, this was before my injectable SARMs experiment too. And they were like showing what basically breaking down which compounds are the most effective. AR agonists, and then we'd be like subcategorize them. Which ones are the most effective? GR antagonists, subcategorize that. Which ones interact the most or the least with the MR mineral corticoid receptors? Mm -hmm. Subcategorize that. Which ones have the most psychoactive effects? Subcategorize that. And then you would create like a cycle based on leveraging a little bit of like each column. Yeah, so that cool. was like the idea of it. And mm -hmm. I think it works, seems to be the most logical approach to cycle yeah. design. Yeah, so I have like a Word document from like way back in the day when I used to talk. Um, like every day with these guys and I still do here and there because a lot of them some of them work for Merrick that are like the most intelligent guys that I've met before and they uh, I have like this document that like sub categorizes every compound into like where it makes the most sense to deploy it Interesting. I, I was thinking of doing something similar yeah so uh, also a uh, last thing I want to mention if, if you guys are cycling be conscious of psychological effects I recently found a very interesting paper that finally explained why I've been noticing basically the how easiest way to explain it is that guys who've been on DECA for long periods act like bitches. And I just didn't, I, I don't uh, know. How to explain it. They're just like yeah. a little bit, I don't know how to explain it, but no, it's not an offensive thing, but I've always been wondering what the hell is it about DECA? And then I found a paper showing that processing in the brain, when you're in a progesterone dominant state, like in the luteal phase of a woman's uh, monthly cycle, processing becomes less global and more local. Whereas when the testosterone is dominant and progesterone is lower, processing is more globally oriented, mm -hmm. which means I, I, I explained this on a podcast I did recently, but have you ever had a, like a girlfriend or your wife, Steve, that tells you a story and the story starts slowly and it's like a halfway into the story, you don't know what the story is about, but you're following along with the story, but they never did a headliner or a topic at the top. So you knew what it was about. No, when a guy tells you a story, he's usually like <laughs> the guy, a guy usually tells you a story. He's like, this is the topic. This is what happened and then he goes into detail right. usually a lady goes into the story it starts somewhere and just goes and you you have to figure it out along the way i think that this is the difference between global and, lo and local processing and the hemispheric stuff so just to keep in mind the hormones you're on long term may affect the way your brain works and your and your personality yeah. oh, i know I several the, people who run training around and they're they're messed up in the brain yeah i always wondered about so obviously there definitely is literature to support that like heightened progestogenic activity is associated with like way higher likelihood of being homosexual and like all these different things. But then above and beyond that, like estrogen deprivation too, I think plays yeah. into some of it potentially with DECA only stuff. Now, I don't know if that's at all dosages or if that's like, even if you were using something concurrently as like a, like a D ball base or something or a estrogen based on its own, but you know, it's definitely something fucking going on. I don't know. <laughs> It also, I mean, if it is really progesterone, it may have something to do with progesterone um, binding to that uh, enzyme that creates uh, dihydro uh, progesterone and dihydro testosterone, or, mm. or the or the precursor to alpha gamma, whatever it was. Alpha reductase or the hydrogenase yeah. steroid. No, the hydrogenase. What the, the other one? Yeah, exactly. Oh no, no, no five alpha reductase actually. Okay. No, not 5 alpha reductase. It's another enzyme, not 5 alpha reductase. But the what I recall is basically progesterone has a higher affinity for it. And that enzyme, either is before 5 alpha reductase or something, basically may cause less testosterone uh, DHT synthesis from testosterone. So there may be an interplay. But I think that the progesterone receptor signaling has very, you know, genomic and like a lot of psychological effects in the brain. You, you can see it in women. Estro estrogen is declining and changing also, but progesterone has very particular effects. And by the way, what you're talking about is a homoerotic, um, I forgot what they called it, but when progesterone levels are higher in men, they have like the more likelihood to see something as homoerotic. Oh, uh, yeah, there's, it's funny because I have some like, you know how I do like the Reddit, like trend horror stories on my channel. And I, yeah, there is a, there was one, it was like, I forget, it was like, it was Deca makes me a cuckold or something. It was like, <laughs> it was like some guy who he likes watching, like, he, he, when he takes it, he likes watching, imagining guys like fucking his wife. Whereas when he's on just tests, like, that doesn't happen. Like, he noticed like different kinds of like weird fetishes like cropping up when he was on Nandrolone versus when he was on test. And there was like similar stories with like Trendbalone as well. 
And I imagine that, I don't know if it had something to do with, uh, I, I imagine a lot of it was the progestogenic activity and then I don't know what else, what else like directly or indirectly yeah. it could be estrogen, but I remember when I was using Trembolone, you do get a little bit of, um, right. Deviant tendencies. I know you're a little bit extreme sometimes in the, uh, the sexual uh, department, but that's why I stopped seven years ago. So not me, not me. No, not you. No, but, I was, I was but, insatiable at that time. So, but, but Lenny calls what Derek just described the su- big Lenny, that guy, he calls it the subspace. And he told me personally that that steroids, uh, phenobut, and especially GHB, which causes mm-hmm. the highest increase in allopregnanolone synthesis, mm-hmm. puts him in the subspace. And it's a different kind of sexual attraction that he gets from the high testosterone levels. Ah. So it's, you may really be right. It's very interesting to hypothesize on this because, by the way, Derek, I don't know if you, ever, you know this. I've written an article a long time ago on, uh, it's called Gay um, Born That Way or Not, or something like that, Made That Way. Because you know there's this phrase that people, gay people were born that way. And yes. if you look at the gen- genetic evidence of this, there is none. Like there has been uh, like so much um, um, pressure in academia to find a genetic polymorphism associated with being gay. And yeah. they can't. There's like nothing except this progesterone stuff mostly. I would imagine like prenatal exposure to whatever hormone profile is present is going to dictate a lot of your progression, yeah, but then, then also your own steroidogenesis as you grow up. And outside factors. I mean, how you or how you grow up, you know, I mean, yeah, it's a lot of things that change your preference over Pretty time, generic. you know, and maybe you got hurt by a girl and, you know, decided to uh, yeah. switch uh, preferences. So yeah. a lot of reasons why people end up that way, you know. Now, now, Steve, tell us why about this 300 sub 300 milligram cycle. So this people ask me this a lot when I'm with Boston. So I get a lot of uh, questions about using a 200 milligram or 300 milligram cycle. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. have my own view, which is not in contrary to your views at all, mm-hmm. as we've discovered in our discussions. But I think we should expand on it. So the idea is this. Some people are saying that back in the day, in like early 2000s, they used to say online, your first cycle should be 500 milligrams of test. It was just always that. And then after, I guess recently, due to some influence of some people on YouTube, potentially, people have, which is probably good, lowered the initial dose yeah. because they potentially can get something out of that. My argument personally has always been like, if I was totally natural and I was going to decide to start gear, I would want to start with HCG first so mm-hmm. I don't have that disconnect with the testicles. And if I did start with HCG, I could raise my HCG level to a little bit higher than my normal testosterone level if I wanted, or I could use it at the same testosterone level that I had before I started, and then I could start with like 50 milligrams of testosterone and anti a week, and like slowly move up. That's right. my so idea. It's a, it's a, so it's a progression, right? A lot of people selectively hear like, oh, why would you take shut down your HPTA for 100 milligrams of test? We have to start somewhere. So let's say you're completely drug-free, right? And your, your testosterone production is kind of non-responsive, right? Your uh, pituitary is lazy or your testicles are lazy. Your t- serum testosterone is like 300, 400, 500, 600, whatever. Okay, maybe maybe try the ACG protocol first by incrementing the ACG over the correlation of four or five weeks to see where you feel good. Then you go do your blood work, see where testosterone levels are at, right? It's a freebie protocol to see if you get anxiety from ACG or you get um, right other side effects related to bumping up your androgen levels twofold. Because if you're if you're clinically androgen deprived for your entire life and your testosterone is 300, then going from 300 to 2000, that's like somebody's punching you in the face. And and it's gonna let's let's make this clear to the audience. Yeah. That's gonna cause the most down regulation in your sex drive. That sudden bump. Yeah. You don't want the sudden bump because right. that down regulates everything. So so why don't we right. are a little bit patient because your hormone journey is going to be decades, hopefully. Um, if you do it modestly, if you you know go ham, then it might last five years and then you're done. Um, so why don't we start low? 250, I use ACG three times a week, and then 500 the next week, right? Three times a week, and then a thousand three times a week, and then maybe a thousand I use every day. And if you really want to push it, two thousand I use every day. Right? That's or 1500 is 1500 I use ACG per day is I think typical fertility protocol dose. And then at one point during this protocol, you start to feel good. Okay, you go do your blood work, see where your hormone levels ended up at. Maybe you went from 300 to 600 or 300 to 1,000 or maybe 1,500 even. Some guys get 1,500 testosterone and ACG protocol like this. Oh, very easy. Yeah, right. But it goes slowly. It goes slowly. You're not going from 300 to 1,500 and then get side effects. And and listen, not everybody is, is as resilient as hardcore bodybuilders who can go from 
a normal testosterone level to 500 test exogenously and survive. Right? Most people don't have good response to that protocol because I've, I've read through those cycle logs on all the steroid boards and a lot of people, they have to abort their first cycle when they go like this. Plus they don't do blood work, right? They're a little bit impatient. And we're going to do a deep ball kickstart. And then within four weeks, they got shin splints and, and lower back pumps and moon face and acne and gyno formation. And then the whole cycle turns to shit. So just Wait, I, I, start, let me finish. I let me finish. Uh, I say, I'm almost yeah. there. So yeah. you start somewhere with this ACG protocol. You see where your testosterone is at when, at the moment you feel good. And then if you want, you can replace that with a little bit of testosterone. So let's say you ended up at 1,000 nanograms per deciliter. Maybe 100, 100 to 150 milligrams exogenous testosterone is enough. Right? You have to lower the ACG dose because I don't think 1,000 IUs per day is sustainable. And then you lower the ACG dose to a maintenance dose, let's say 250 to 500 IUs three times per week, depending on if it's pharmaceutical or UGL or whatever. And then you start dropping on the testosterone dose. But listen, you can get great results on 150 milligrams of test with ACG for eight weeks. Lowest effective dosages earn 250, and then you earn 500. And now over, so the, my, over the creation of yeah. six months, instead of starting with 500, you built muscularity into the dose where you earned 500 and barely got any side effects. You didn't have to micromanage with tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitor or, or whatever else that people experience. Plus, if you get hair loss, at least you'll be able to mitigate that earlier on without um right and you'll shut yourself down but a three week cycle a three month cycle that's kind of outdated yeah most people go on yeah. cycle and do a lowest effective dose until they get results nah, in the that's cycle. what i wanted to see you know yes. so you, yeah. listen I, I started my cycle okay i'm relying solely on muscle memory with 156 milligrams of test and 125 milligrams of primo people call that trt plus right trt plus plus i ended up at 100 kilos from 92 to 100 kilos. So, right, I'm relying on muscle memory, but I was able to restore most of the muscle mass that I had in the past with a dose that, that bodybuilders would laugh at. Why would you shut yeah. down your HPTA? You know, yeah, your, your testosterone is 600 nanograms per deciliter. Why would you shut that down? Well, now I'm going to 600 milligrams and now you're going to see some serious shit. Like for me, my sort of arguments to above and beyond that, like obviously I'm totally on the same page with if you whatever your goals are should dictate a, what drug you're using what dosage burden you need to achieve that goal what do you have a time frame like there's so many mm. different factors that play into that but also when people are like why would you shut yourself down to use such a low dose it's like if you're cycling on and off of shit to begin with like this is like that's the most subpar way to go about like this is like uh, oh, yes yeah oh, like, why the the fuck? like why are you even using this shit if you're going to cycle off anyways realistically oh, thank God. like you're going to shut down your hbta cycle off and use like toxic fucking drugs to recover your system and crash yourself like that's that's yes. way worse in my opinion than just being like a benign like as benign of a dose as possible it gives you performance enhancing effects and then you like titrate up as needed with the minimum effective dose with the mm -hmm. least deleterious in impact to your fucking system but again like cycling off of shit is going to be way worse for you and trying to like like aggressively recover to baseline to transiently have nice looking blood work for one day with your yes. gonadotropins and everything <laughs> and then go back on all the shit like what the fuck are you doing just yeah. stay on like a well tolerated dose and like titrate up as you need so it's not about oh they're only using like 250 or 300 like that's stupid it's no, like I can make gains at 300 and when I need 500, I'll go to fucking 500. Exactly. But for now I'm at 300 and I'm not going to crash my system by coming off. So it's not like I'm limited by, oh my God, I only have 12 weeks. So I need to be on 500 to fucking 750 or whatever, make as much gains in 12 weeks and then crash my system, fuck myself up right when I recover from all the clearing the hormones out, crashing my system, mm -hmm. recovering it with drugs, get back up to baseline. I'm back to baseline. Fuck my system up again. Go back on 750. Like yeah. how about the whole time instead of going zero, 750, zero fucking whatever. Yes. How about we just do like 300, keep your system like as healthy as possible right. while making like good, like maintainable gains and like creep up if you need to, you know, nice. like you're, you're going to be on fucking TRT anyways, if you're using this shit ultimately. So like, you know plus you can't gain that much muscle at the same time anyway so instead of mega dosing with 750 or 2000 what many bodybuilders are doing why don't you put some of that money aside for fucking blood work 
yeah. Yeah. And, or, or, and monitor your health, you know, see what's going on internally. And then you, you try to get the same results for a lower dose while having money and for the blood work. Yeah. The and blood work is $1,000. Your cycle is $5,000. Yeah. What the hell are you yeah. talking about? You know? And obviously there's context specific situations too. Like if you're a athlete who has like acute exposure periods and you need to get shit in and out of your system or like whatever, like that's different. We're talking about just like sustainable approach for like non-tested mm -hmm. people who are just trying to like get, you know, as maximal ergogenic properties out of it with the minimal impact to their system. And ultimately this is like, no one's doing like one cycle and like coming off and like somehow maintaining like bodybuilder size or something like that. And even if you're not trying to maintain bodybuilder size, like I'm just talking about drugs in general, like this is something that should be a long, like sustainable, least impact to your system approach and cycling on and off and crashing yourself and then going back on right when you've recovered and then fucking yourself up again. Like that's not the approach. I think the longer, slow, yeah. you know, slow process of like incrementally titrating as needed not only minima minimizes like side effect burden and allows you to be like far more intelligent with when you deploy certain compounds, where and when, but above and beyond that, it's less stress to your organ systems and you're not crashing yourself unnecessarily. So the whole, why would you shut yourself down? It's like, well, you're fucking shut down regardless, you know, like you're going to yeah. be shut down, you know, like you can keep yourself not shut down with the HCG, you know, if you really want to. Yeah. So I think the so whole argument is just like semantics at the end of the day. Plus, if you, yeah, if you that part is off. semantics. Yeah, if, if you want to come off, it will take six months before your fertility is back anyway. So if you really want to go off, go off yeah, like properly. Who's yeah, well, let's properly. talk about that. Like even Nobody Olympians does. that cycle off, even Olympians that are like, oh, my coach had me come off all the drugs for fucking six to eight weeks. Like James Holling said, you coming off for six weeks, your fucking even drugs off. are out of your Bro, system. Okay, okay, that's an okay. Derek, Derek, we got to talk about this. Okay, listen. So <laughs> so that that's that's not even a... Okay, so we, Derek, I have personal experience with that James Holling head type comment recently, which you know about. Yeah, and the yeah. gentleman that I'm talking about, same problem. He's like, okay, I just finished Olympia. I need to take some time uh, to restart my HPG system so that I can compete. I'm not going to do too much later, so I can compete, compete later. And I'm like, why are we doing that exactly? So I, we talked about it on the phone, and I realized that in his mind, starting, this is what they're telling them, they're the bodybuilding coaches. They're telling them, take HCG, get your balls working, take Clomid and Novadex and Proviron. Do this for a few weeks, like eight weeks, and then go back on cycle. I'm like, <laughs> what's the point of that exactly? Yeah. So I tried, yeah. I tried to explain to him. I was like, and he, he understood immediately. He's like, thank you. I just, I never knew this before. I was like, look, HPG is, is shutting you off because it's making your gonads work. So it's sort of a synthetic way to keep your gonads alive, your testicles alive. So what would be a good idea? I told him, maybe use HCG like eight months of the year, except pre-contest because it aromatizes a lot. And you just keep it at a low level, like what, what uh, Steve recommends, like 500 to 250. I just said, keep your balls alive. Now I told him, if you want to go off, You'd have to remove that HCG and control estrogen and hope that your luteinizing hormone follicle stimulating will start working again. But why are you doing that? I don't, there's no point. If they work for two weeks, which is not going to that quickly, but if they did, it's not going to make any difference for your health. Yeah. They conflate this idea of restarting the system with the health issues, which brings up this other issue, which is, I'm so glad both of you think exactly the same way as me, which is, what is cycling? The cycling, what was with, what was throwing me off on all those questions? They're like, hey, I want to start a cycle for 10 weeks of 300 milligrams. If you're doing a cycle, that's different. But yeah. if you're thinking of it realistic, because another problem, right? You guys both know about this. Let's tell our audience. There are uh, academic medical doctors who've written in papers that they believe that cycling is one of the major reasons for heart problems among bodybuilders because they gain so much water and lose it so mm. so quickly, so suddenly. So and the reason why bodybuilders do it, I think that they think, hey, eight months of, or not even eight months, 10 months of the year I'm on and my health is just crap. So two yeah. months, I'm going to go off Try to get my HDL and my LDL like okay and my liver like okay. So that I don't know, I even understand the rationality so that they're okay yeah. that time period and then I fuck them for the rest of the year. Yeah. But I, so instead, like what I was thinking and now you guys think the same way is how about this? How about you do a cycle where you know exactly how your health is on cycle, not off cycles. They never check. Yeah. On cycle. They never check. So not off cycle, on cycle, know your health. So you know exactly what's going on. Try to take protective measures and try yeah. to use the least amount that you need and monitor it as you go. Right. Right. Yeah. So like if ultimately like transiently having an acceptable, but not totally atrocious blood panel one time per year for two weeks is like nothing, nothing dude. No, like nothing. you should, you should be taking approaches to maintain as high of a level of health as you can for the entirety of exposure 
not for two weeks androgen depriving yourself trying to get back to like <laughs> your your shbg skyrockets and you get a better looking you know some transient markers that look a bit better on paper that aren't in the fucking gutter at this point for like one week and then you're like fuck it now we go back on everything well, like, well no. let's, just, let's just i mean let's make it so simple like think about inflammation say your c-reactive protein is you don't know what it is all year when you're cycling so it's like who knows I and do. then you're I, off do. I do i do i do i check every I mean, month yeah. so. Yeah, but I mean, these guys, you know, pro bodybuilders or whatever, it might be really high, right? And then on their off, they might not even know it's high because then they, they only test when they're off it. So they don't even know they have inflammatory condition. Yeah. Or for example, LDL cholesterol. Your LDL cholesterol is 150 all year or 200 all year. And then suddenly it drops down to 100. So you don't even know that you were developing plaque at a rapid right. rate all year. You know what I mean? And so they can't, this fi is and so they can't fit in the MRI, so they can't even check it. This, I'm I, glad could barely, I could barely f f fit in the MRI when I was completely off cycle and tried to do my heart imaging. Now, luckily, I walked away right from the 10 years of taking PEDs without any negative thing besides a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which was completely resolved. But listen, not everybody's like that, right? No. And no. I did all my blood work screening religiously. I still do them. And I still do it way more often than probably anybody else. Plus, I put them out publicly for everybody to see, including all of my organ imaging. It's not perfect, but we're monitoring it, and I'm doing yeah, my best. Yeah, monitoring to, is the key, right? I'm I'm yeah. I'm doing my best with the lowest effective dosages, and and listen, you know, nowadays we have us three and many other educators who actively try to promote this lifestyle from this angle. So there's no excuse anymore. There's no excuse. And, and At it, least I had an excuse that we went to the bodybuilding forums and they say time on is time off. No, we didn't know oh. crap. I mean, Steve, do you remember what we had to deal with compared to what people have access to now? Yeah. I mean, we knew nothing. No. I mean, I was doing all kinds of things because just off like the HC, not using HCG, which, yeah. <laughs> you know, I have to say, I was doing a lot of things because people said it and we, and, and, yeah. Anyway, uh, one thing, uh, Steve, I want to mention, you were talking about sustainable dose for HCG. I do agree that like 250, 500, it mm. seems does maintain some people's testicular function yeah. well. But I think of a sustainable dose as this. If you're totally natural, go get your blood tested mm -hmm. and find out what your test level is right. and your luteinizing hormone level and just get that as a baseline. So say your test level is 500, you can then slowly titrate up HCG every other day, like uh, 250, then 500, and, and slowly check your blood tests until you know what dose of HCG replaced that luteinizing hormone dose for you. Ah, and yeah. right. So then you know that's my replacement. Right. It's not going to probably cause me desensitization or whatever because it's causing the same, uh, you know, natural levels. Mm -hmm. So that that's what you can move up to is yeah. what I imagine. Right. You know, no, you I, can move I, up I, to that I, on I cycle agree. if you want. Yeah, I, I yeah. usually tell my guys to just keep titrating up until you feel good, which means you're a little bit higher, and then at least that will be your effective dose for the day comes when you want to do PCT to get somebody pregnant, not to do PCT because somebody on the message board said, oh, it's a 13 weeks and now your cycle has yeah. to stop, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Steve, what what in the world happened to your body? Because I don't have pictures, but I'd like to see what happened you to you. You want to see the Can pictures? Can you show us? Do you want to see yeah, the pictures? Yeah, show us right. some pictures. Because sure. I've been seeing in the recent videos, you really do look huge. Steve, when you when you go to screen share, it'll it. show you all the tabs and you can go to the picture and, and then you can go right and left that yeah. way. All right, I'll just do the yeah. screen then. Oh, Jesus. Oh, uh, this is the, okay. Wh where do we start? What people have to consider, though, by the way, too, is like Steve takes the most like clean images that are representative of progress in the same like lighting. Like you could easily take shots in the gym and look a yeah. hundred times more impressive. So like people don't understand like how fucking huge you actually are when they see this stuff. Okay. Yeah, so they're like, I just want to point that out from my own personal perspective because like. I hate when people see something like this versus if they saw Steve in the gym, like lifting, they'd be like, what happened, bro? Like, what, like, did you hop on a cycle? It's like, go, go no to my channel and watch some, watch some of my training videos so you can get an yeah. accurate representation right. of what I see. So these are freaking old. These are uh, right before I started this cycle at uh, 92 kilos, right? So this is starting after being wow. off cycle for eight and a half months. So this is what wow. I was able to retain after coming off cycle for eight and a half months. Uh, uh, can I ask you, Steve, how yeah. uh, much did you measure your arms there? No, it's probably like 17, 16, S I don't 17, know. Huh? something like that. Oh. I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, I never measure my arms. I'm sure oh, somebody's going to show up at the gym and start measuring my arms randomly. <laughs> <laughs> We, get, we need proof here are my arms right now so, so <laughs> I would be shocked. I would be well shocked on. if they were if they were only 16 in this even. They look yeah, bigger. they look bigger for sure. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's what she said. Okay, uh, this is the start. Ninety-two kilos, skinny AF with a testosterone level of six hundred nanograms per deciliter. Then I started my cycle, one hundred fifty-six milligrams of test, one hundred twenty-five milligrams of primo. 
um, HGH frag and a couple other stuff. It's all documented on my channel. I won't regurgitate it here. That weird number, was it just like how you broke it down into everyday dosing or like why? No, was it so, such a so I have Bayer testoviron, which is pharmaceutical grade, and those ampules are overfilled. So when uh, I draw out of the ampule, it's supposedly one milliliter, but I get 1.25, 1.3 milliliters even. So I had to... Really? Yeah, I had to re it's from the pharmacy. So don't tell anybody tell me that it's it's fuck I have a script for this stuff also. So well, that's a good I was just No, so it's overfilled. So I can I can like space that out over multiple injections and get like right. I was doing like a quarter ampule twice a week, Monday, Friday, Monday, Friday, for a full ampule over two weeks. And that would calculate down to about 156 milligrams per week. And it's the same with the Bayer Primo. It's one full ampule is overfilled to about 1.25 milliliters at 100 milligrams per one milliliter is 125 milligrams, right? Okay. Now, so Steve, can I ask? Can I ask you? Wait a minute, Steve. Have you been using equal amount in the beginning, uh, primo and test? One, 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 one ratio? Close to. So that's 156 to 125. So a little bit more test. How, yeah. How, how does your? We're using HCG also. No, I added it in a couple okay. weeks later. So my estradiol came up from 30 yeah. to 40. Oh, you get 30 on that? Like equal yeah. amount? Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some people, they, they primo like really kills them. They're you have to keep in mind yeah. though, Steve doesn't have access to liquid chromatography with tandem mass. No, it's all CMA. So like, yeah. Yeah. So like, we don't actually really know. No. Oh, okay. To be honest. Well, it's, well, yeah. How much percent difference is it? 10, 15 Pretty significant, dude. Like when I did my DECA monotherapy experiment, it was showing I had in range estradiol at like the high 30s when mm -hmm. in reality it was, it was like seven. Okay. Holy crap. So, so yeah. to cofactor the estradiol, my HDL is about 50. Oh, and nice. the SHBG came down from a lot to now 19. So that, that's wow. quite a significant drop. Yeah, even though I'm in raloxifene, yeah. we can discuss that later. It yeah, could also be because my thyroid uh, markers are declining due to this uh, caloric restrictive state. And um, sex drive. So the estradiol mm -hmm. must be in range. Okay, this is week five, 98.5 kilograms. So I gained over the course of five weeks, coming back on this pathetic TRT plus protocol, six and a half kilos. Holy, holy crap. Look at that difference. Wow. When I made my studio also when I uh, started. So this is oh, fantastic. Now, so you see this youthful face, right? A little yeah. bit depleted <laughs> to a full face again. And th yeah. this is what I tried to prevent. But unfortunately, I was not able to uh, maintain my boyish good looks. <laughs> All right, this is week six after a week of fasting, right? It was the first fast, so I dropped a decent amount of fat. You guys can, probably can't see the difference, but I lost about 2.3 kilos on scale. Uh, yeah, I can't see the difference of the waist, if you look at the waist. Yeah. Here, here, yeah, this is the difference uh, before and after. So this is 2.3 wow. kilograms down. This is deploying every fat burning eight known to man besides DNP. Wow. By the way, I don't know if you guys would be interested, but cardarine is being tested in humans again. Yeah, I saw that, yeah. Yeah, you showed us. Uh, yeah, yeah. We should talk about the pharmacology. I mean, it's pretty. It's pretty. You know, there are drugs that target that that are available. So you see, like how, you, you see how much my lower back came down over this one mm -hmm. week. Oh, yeah. interesting. All right. So this is still a little bit chunky. Right. It's only week six. So I went from, you know, oh, look at your upper back definition. Really, yeah. that was very fast. No, it's 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 that was a huge progress. Okay, this is week nine, ninety nine point seven kilograms. So that's two hundred something pounds. I don't know, no pounds. Sorry, guys, I didn't mention that here. This was after 5-amino-1-MQ, which is a new compound that is uh, shows a lot of promise to aid in fat loss. So here I looked um, good already within nine weeks of being back on cycle. Then I got a little bit sloppy. I went on holiday. Then I looked like this at 100 kilos. So that was uh, last week. <laughs> right? So I gained a little bit more size. I got a little bit fluffy. So this is 100 kilos. Look okay. Then I fasted again for six and a half days. Looking like this, this was last Sunday. Now we can compare, right? Now we can compare. Why do you keep fasting? I like fasting. Oh, and plus I no, don't I mean, go to the gym to like and I get more shit done, you know? But last week was pretty tough because I didn't use the Leroglutide. But Six and a half days though, with no assistance. No, it's nothing. I, I used calcium deglucurate and the EDTA disodium chelation. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Yeah, I was, I was miserable. So I did add a little bit of vegetables on day five and six because otherwise I couldn't make it. All right. So um, this was the fasting progress, so a little bit better than the previous progress. There's less water retention and, uh, you know, better start, better finish. And then this is the start to finish. So it is for people that said I lost all my gains and don't believe that muscle memory is a real thing and don't think that TRT plus is a significant 
protocol. There's your evidence. Well, I ha with the caveat, I have to mention, I was surprised also, like a low androgen doses with the muscle memory is very effective, yeah. especially if it's a real reason. Right. But hey, Steve, your body, you know, I'm really impressed. And now that I know more about bodybuilding, like uh, your body is so completely developed, you know, your, your hamstrings yeah. very well developed, quads very well developed, uh, the whole back is rhomboids, everything very well developed. Should really be after, like after 23 years, you know, should be. I think I could always improve Usually. a little bit here and there, but... I think I got a pretty well-rounded physique, you know, need a little bit more quad size, but you know, people that just watch the Olympia and they see all these thunder quads, yeah, it's hard to compete with that, you know, plus I like, <laughs> well, quads. you have to be Egyptian for that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think I'm pretty balanced, you know, there's always room for improvement, but fuck it's bodybuilding the most criticized, uh, and, uh, you know, allegedly negative sports that you can do right? because people no, are like, oh, you need more quads. So what about my lats? Dude, just give me a compliment on the lats. It's fine. <laughs> Yeah. No, the reason why I said it is it's just rare to, because you don't, you're a coach for competitors, but you don't mm. compete yourself. So usually yeah. when, when yeah. people don't compete, they don't have that, um, like that, uh, you know, they, mm. they miss something. You'll see a missing body part, but you don't yeah. have one. No, right. no, no. I, I, yeah. Well, I love, I love this shit, you know, at the expense of my own health a little bit. Okay. So this is the, uh, fasting from last week. So here we can see this stuff. Well, I said to start. Wow. No, yeah. So this is my, this is my absolute skinniest. After six weeks of the fasting mimicking diet to resolve the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So the time frame between this is five months. So this is basically the yeah. picture what I looked like at the previous BioBros. So from mm -hmm. BioBros 7 to BioBros 8, these are the gains. Crazy. These are the gains. And I think I preserved my face pretty well over the right, because that was my main issue. Yeah. Um, this is well, this is almost disgusting. How much difference? <laughs> <laughs> and this is the one year progress. So on on the sorry for the horrible face, 115.8 oh, kilograms. This was like notice what, the notice the belly, the difference. Yeah. How much smaller your waist yeah, is. Yeah, this is what I'm very happy wow. about. So wow. a year has passed. Uh everything came down in size, obviously, including my face. I look a little bit younger though. But my stomach is so people always ask, you know, how can I bring my waistline down? So we'll take a year off, do some fasting and, uh, you know, I mean, you look, your, your skin, even on your abdomen is loose now, but it's, yeah, it's a, know, little, a little bit, a little bit yeah. loose, which is a very impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. So uh, all in all, I, I would say that, it's, um, still a year well spent, you yeah. know, even yeah. though I had to go through hell and, and, and spend hundreds of thousands of bot on medical bills. Um, all you missed out on is checking your grim age in the beginning of the year. Yeah, and I should have done that. Yeah, yeah, I should have done that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you do that, by the way? Oh, it's a you can. It's a, there's companies that sell it. There's oh. there's three or four clocks. The grim age is the most accurate epigenetic clock of. Is age. it easy for us to get a hold of that to, yes. for yeah, our, our company? Oh yeah, yeah. Because obviously we want to have like our own saliva kit, obviously. But then above and beyond that, if we had our own. We absolutely okay. can. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Yeah, Actually, that. we were just talking about this today. We have a lot of updates on it for it. Yeah, I okay. have to go listen here. Go check your message, by the way. I'm like a few days behind. Don't so. worry. Well, I'm never in a rush about that stuff. Hey, Steve, tell yeah. us about the raloxifene experiment. But, but before you do, because SHBG is a thing we, I, even I get asked about, and I never talk about it. Mm -hmm. So tell us, like, people want to minimize the SHBG. The people with the lowest SHBG are the people with the most visceral fat. So mm -hmm. it's an odd thing to want to do. So can you explain to us why maybe minimizing it through every route is not necessarily the best way to go? And maybe you need SHBG also? Well, you need it uh, for a multitude of different reasons. So one of them, um, so l let's rewind the clock a little bit and go back to the foreign days where that was the predominant source of information. And then somewhere there, people started saying that sexual binding globulin holds your testosterone hostage. And yeah. so your testosterone <laughs> is... In the sexual binding globulin, estrogen can also go in the sexual binding globulin. That's why it's not called androgen binding pro, uh, uh, protein, which is also produced in the testicles. But I think that only delivers uh, testosterone or DHT to the prostate. Could be linked to prostate cancer. Um, so you have sexual binding globulin in the blood, and people think it holds the testosterone hostage. When in reality, the liver produces sexual binding globulin to transport sexual hormones to tissue similar to albumin but 
the sexual hormones, uh, sexual hormone binding globulin, the androgens and the, the estrogens are bound more tightly. And the albumin binds a lot of different hormones and, uh, and molecules. So, and that's loosely bound. So that's why you have a differentiation between the total testosterone, the free testosterone and the bioavailable testosterone. Total testosterone is just all the testosterone in your bloodstream. I just like the total cholesterol, even though that's a horrible way to calculate it from the HDL and LDL, because those are lipoproteins and cholesterol is a, a cholesterol molecule. So I don't have a reason for that, but it is what it is. Well, wait, just to explain to Lodge what he's saying. So a very good point is that when you're measuring your cholesterol, he's saying the total cholesterol measure is just a measure of the mass that your cholesterol particles carry. Yeah. But you're interested in the particles, the number and the different kinds. Right. So and then but cholesterol is a molecule. The, the lipoproteins are carriers. So, yeah, the lip lipoproteins attached to the, the, exactly, yeah, the protein yeah. attached to the cholesterol, and they're measuring the mass of the cholesterol. Which exactly, is it doesn't make sense. So anyway, um, so look at sexual hormone-binding globulin. It's the same way you have red blood cells or lipoproteins. Right? They all have a unique uh, function to transport molecules through the bloodstream. So you have free testosterone that's not bound to sexual hormone-binding globulin. And then bioavailable testosterone is not bound to sex uh, sexual hormone-binding globulin and albumin. Right? So there's a differentiation between those. Now, somewhere on the forums, people started saying, listen, your testosterone is not active because it can't bind to the androgen receptor if it's in the sexual hormone binding globulin. So you need to crush it to zero. And we can use provirin for that, right? which has the highest affinity for the SHBG. So people started using provirin. And in the first two weeks, they got a beautiful libido. Yeah, it lasts two weeks. That's true. Ravenous <laughs> libido. And, the, and then you go to the message board to start type, dude, this worked. You're the king. My wife is, uh, right, is, uh, well, I'll spare you the details. And then, week, <laughs> and then week four, some people come back, some people are embarrassed, some people come back and say, listen, my libido is not as good as it used to be, so I'm going to increase the dose from 25 milligrams to 50 milligrams per virin. Hmm. And their libido goes to shit. Because now the SHBG is so low that you're missing out of androgen delivery from the liver or right, in other tissues of the body through tissue. Now, does sexual hormone globulin directly bring androgens or uh, testosterone and other androgens to the androgen receptor? Not exactly. Right? It transports it to blood. It gets released at one point, allowing it to bind to the membrane or the nuclear androgen receptor, right? or the membrane uh, translocating to the nucleus. But there's also a sexual hormone globulin receptor complex allowing the sexual hormone to bind to a complex, similar to how growth hormone binds to a receptor or IGF-1 binds to a receptor, which sends signals into the cell, non-genomic signals by increasing cyclic adenosine monophosphate concentrations yeah. within the cell itself, which amplify nuclear androgens receptors gene transcription of the DNA. So mm. now you have two vectors to optimize, mm. anabolism through the sexual hormone binding globulin receptor, and testosterone attaches to the sexual hormone binding globulin, which is attached to a receptor complex, sending signals to the R, uh, DNA, and with mm. the androgen receptor, now we have two. So why not get anabolism from two instead of crushing your SHBG with provirin, which has no anabolic properties or very little, and then all this free testosterone floating around in your bloodstream, similar to high glucose levels, mm. prickling your uh, androgen receptors in the brain, making you um, highly irritable, highly agitated, potentially uh, inducing neurotoxicity, right? Delivering it to the wrong tissue. All right. Yeah. So, so now, now we know the last couple of years, we know that it's better not to crush your SHBG and not look at it as, as a molecule that holds your testosterone hostage. Look at it as a molecule that delivers androgens to tissue. Hmm. So one question that stems from that though, is when you're on a blast, the likelihood that your SHBG is even going to be in double digits when you're on half a gram to a gram of shit. Impossible. is like so w why is it so anabolic then if you could use like anabolics you use in unison with it mm -hmm. have different affinities for it but it seems like it's totally no one really even considers like any delivery of any anabolics other than testosterone via shbg mm -hmm. and then even when we're on blast phases our shbgs it's like impossible to retain it in any kind of level that would otherwise be able to leverage this like delivery system mm -hmm. so like being mindful of that, how does that translate into 
exposure outside of a TRT context. Not because like I understand having disproportionately high free androgen signaling is like mm-hmm. very bad from a cardiac standpoint, neurological standpoint, pretty much everything standpoint, except for maybe like performance acutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But in a must like a like a growth model where we're on super physiological amounts, like very rare you see a guy with like a 20 plus shpg on like a blast so like what do you do or like is it even something to be mindful of a couple things is well just prevent it from declining unnecessarily right by not taking very uh reducing or shpg reducing compounds like proviron another one is to keep your estradiol in a range which regulates shpg Uh, thyroid levels also have an effect on SABG levels, so make sure that those don't decline too much. That was one of the reasons I was on thyroid. Yeah, by the right, way. right. So, yeah. and and of course, caloric uh, deficit raises SHBG right over time. So that's what I noticed. My SHBG was 130 during the fasting mimicking diet. Oh, really? Yeah, it's sky so high. This, so then, there's a, pre- and then, there's well, a you- precursor in the liver. It starts with the H. It's an acronym. It's like, I'm forgetting it right now, but mm-hmm. it's like H4 or something like that. It's an acronym. Mm-hmm. That's the enzyme that gets affected by thyroid, by visceral fat, by a lot of other things that's produced by the liver that's needed to produce SHBG. Yeah, Most, I've been trying to find out H- all the things that manipulate SH- SHBG. Mm-hmm. I keep being drilled down molecularly back to that same mechanism. Yeah. My thought, though, Derek, is this, is that at least like if you have a, if you're taking exogenous steroids with some testosterone, the SHBG, does it crushes your SHBG? When you, when you add way more uh, androgens, it crushes it? Yeah. yeah, it gets lower and lower and lower because there's more delivery required. And the more insulin too, it's kind of like inverse relationship with yeah. the more, like this is why, I don't know, like polycystic ovarian syndrome and any of these things, like you see an inverse relationship with like IGF-1, SHBG, carbohydrate intake. That's why keto diets spike SHBG levels. Mm-hmm. It's all kind of like- However, However, I've drilled down into that, the molecular mechanisms behind that. It seems to be that it's not actually a proxy of insulin resistance. If you control for visceral fat, no longer the insulin resistance or the diabetes predi- predicts the SHBG. It's supposed to be exclusively the visceral fat at the mo- at the mechanism, supposedly. I've I'm- seen before and afters on carnivore and keto diet guys who had female territory yeah. SHBGs just by adding in carbs again, bring them back down to like 40 to 50. And these are natural guys. So I'm on it. I'm a- this- I'm- I'm on a ketogenic diet right, year round and still my SHPG goes down just with a little bit of prima bolin. And I'm sure it get, will, will get worse. But what I expected, like I've recommended 10 milligrams Novidex before bed to some guys to bring their SHPG up. Now that results potentially in a little bit additional anabolism, right? With increased delivery and cyclic adenosine phosphate ge- non-genomic responses. But it also lowers your IGF-1. So you lose out on that pathway. So ideally, instead of just hammering the androgen receptors with testosterone or other androgens, why not we optimize all the vectors for anabolism with a little bit and then right get anabolism that way. So I think that's one of the reasons why people are so surprised from my progress. It's because I don't just take test. I optimize every vector, right? I was doing this 5-amino-1-MQ, which could also potentially have some anabolic benefits by include, right, increasing glucose uptake. So there's, there's so many things that contribute to muscle gain and, and people look at your dosages of test and, and primo and like, oh, that's, that's not going to do anything, but there's way more in place than this, that. So to come back on the raloxifene, um, hmm. selective estrogen receptor modulators are known to raise SHPG levels, right? So at one sense, it might be good to sustain SHPG levels. Um, and in another sense, I did this experiment to see if it could shrink gynecomastia. I lost three millimeters on my uh, age-old gyno on the right side and two millimeters on the left side after eight weeks on 60 milligrams. Relax. Let me give you a spo- let me give you a spoiler alert. I have a. I know it's. I already have my consultation scheduled. <laughs> no, no, no. I have an undue uh, undue amount of experience with gynecomastia. I have yeah. a lot of experience with this personally. So I've tried uh, years on CIRMs. Oh, I've yes. tried AIs. I've tried everything. I just want to let you know this is how it works. I'll just tell you the secret. So the gland grows temporarily mm-hmm. when it's exposed. I mean, this is not from academic evidence. This is from my personal mm-hmm. experience. It grows temporarily when it's in that estrogen or progesterone primed environment. So it'll grow like within like uh, four weeks or five weeks, a temporary growth. That's like a, it feels like it's inflated, just like you said. Right, yeah. right now you feel it's come smaller, right? Mm-hmm. The, the gland seems the tissue seems smaller, but it's still there. When you starve it of estrogen or progesterone, but mainly estrogen for long enough, it gets smaller. 
But if you go off the serum, it comes right back, even if you don't have high estrogen signaling. Yeah, it, it, I, it, it comes back to the it comes back to it feels like it felt like for me comes back to whatever estrogen level you're based at. So if you're on test with no AI, it'll go bigger temporarily but mm. other than growing. Growing is also another issue. But I'm talking about without the itching, without the stinging, it'll be bigger inflated and then maybe your normal estrogen level a bit bit smaller and if you use a serum it can be a bit smaller but the problem is that it doesn't kill it ever no i don't think so Anic either right anecdotally when it comes to pubertal gynecomastia like uh, obviously a lot of guys who get gyno it's gonna be from anabolic exposure and putting their estrogen levels to you know more than it otherwise would be endogenously but some individuals they get the gyno developed from that heightened level of puberty when you have GH and downstream IGF-1 cranked through the fucking roof, estrogen cranked through the roof through downstream aromatization, everything that could be stimulatory is maxed out. And then you get into your 20s and you have like residual massive glandular development, but it's not gone because it's residual from your like cycle you did as a teenager when it was actually just your natural hormone spiking. But in those individuals, I've seen like permanent management by using raloxifene and then coming off. It doesn't go back to baseline for oh, those. Brother, brother, I tell you, Derek, I, I had it pubertal. I got to a point in my early 20s. Nobody could know I had gynecomastia with my shirt off. Nobody could know. You couldn't tell. Hmm. But it was there. The ball was still No, it never it. disappears. Never no, but you can get it to it's so cosmetically insignificant that you yeah. might avert the need to actually get it cut out. And for somebody who's not... A bodybuilder who's exposing themselves to all these androgens yeah. maybe you don't need surgery for guys who are gonna like limit their ability to use like compounds that are substrates for aromatase and have to use like chronically use ais or serms or whatever yes. to maintain like their protocols that's where i would be like you fucking need to have like a gyno fund saved up and like make sure you're <laughs> not using toxic drugs that you wouldn't otherwise use if you had no gyno but for guys who have just pubertal gyno and it's like just it's not so bad that it's unmanageable with serum deployment acutely but it's also something that's like not cosmetically significant enough to like actually justify cutting out like those individuals might benefit from a raloxifene protocol get it to a point where it's cosmetically insignificant and you can barely tell and then maybe you don't need surgery but for guys who actually like blast shit i can almost that it's going to be like a consistent problem like it was for joe Stetics. he used to walk around yeah. with a undetectable estradiol like that's eventually it was going to fuck also, him up in some way also, maybe it already did with also the undetectable gyno <laughs> yeah yeah but like, <laughs> which i told him so what dude what are you doing it's he, nobody can see it you know no no like now he, he can walk around with like a normal estradiol which is like yeah. great and mm. probably going to be like injury protective and like cardio protective neuroprotective all yeah, that kind of stuff sure. so, so i for, just i just have a slight argument to, to, to the contrary just because i've been through this personally during my lifetime so that one thing, and in, in agreement with that, if you guys notice anyone listening to this who knows somebody who had per, minor pubertal gynecomastia, not somebody with tits, but somebody with like a little bit of development, you'll probably notice that by the time they got into their 20s, if they weren't fat, that thing disappeared or seems to have declined quite a bit. It happened to me also. It does go down when you're not, not in that estrogen environment. And I imagine you could get it down way faster if you use raloxifene or an AI for a period of time, try to starve it and get it to that place where it basically adjusts to your natural estrogen level the problem is that while like i don't know if derek if you ever suffered from this personally yourself but wh while you may feel like it's not cosmetically visible people who've actually had it since puberty have a psychological effect with it it's really annoying it's yeah. because you know it's there and if you wear a certain like very soft t-shirt or something it might show a little bit of a bump there and it's feminine by nature they're literally tits. No, it's very so it's very upsetting it's very to, noticeable you know? like I, I took a front double bicep picture a couple days ago and i'm wearing like a light shirt and i'm looking at it and i'm like I can't post this picture so you have to take like five pictures just to make sure that it's very it, it's temperature good. temperature sensitive yes too. temperature yeah. oh i'll teach you another trick book. And, and, anyone and, all, of course. <laughs> and if you like flick your nipple yes like, yes i was gonna say and, yeah. and you can't just get twist it. your nipple twist yeah. your nipple if you go into an important room you want people to think well of you just twist the nipple it'll be tight i used to go in a cold them. room nobody will see it <laughs> i used to tape them you know with like tape because it was so bad when it was running I thought of doing that so many times. Yeah, oh I did that. God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would wear just yeah. a little bit of nipple tape just to uh, remove it, you know. And they just really press the edges so you don't see the edge through your shirt. So, but now it's it's quite manageable. So, my relaxing experiment so far, I've noticed something. And my what was the experiment for? For the SHPG? No, for the for the gyno. But of course, right? Oh. I wanted to see if it could shrink it. But my gyno was freaking old. Like I, I developed it when I was drug free after I broke my leg. 
It's very really weird. Oh, yeah. I broke my leg in a motorcycle accident. And then I had a little bit of nipple sensitivity because I was immobile for three months. And I'll check and I'm like, no. <laughs> I, bro. And then I had to go do an ultrasound <laughs> on it, you know. And then, of course, uh, the doctor accused me of taking steroids. I said, bro, I haven't even yeah. lifted for four months. I'm skinny AF. What the hell are you talking about? So they didn't want to <laughs> they didn't want to pay it from the insurance, right? Because it's cosmetic yeah. surgery. So I, I didn't have the funds for it. And then I should have done it last time I came off cycle, but I don't have so much work going on. So now we'll do it in March. And then I uh, right, schedule that surgery next year, March, when I plan to come off cycle anyway. Um, and then get it removed. Right? Because it's now it's such a great feeling. It's such a great feeling to have it removed. You yeah. feel free. You feel free. So, like wow, so, so for me, it doesn't really it doesn't really bother me because I always had like a little bit of stubborn fat on my lower chest, which is just yeah. as thick as the gyno. So you you barely see it, and my chest mm -hmm. is well developed, so it kind of angles it down. I and can't the, even see yours honestly. No, no nobody 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 can. You know. So, but you know, it's present. And at one point, if I do want to remove that stubborn fat off my lower chest which raloxifene is doing hands down very, very nicely. So that's the main takeaway of this. Tamoxifen takes the fat off your lower body and raloxifene takes it off your chest. No, that could be very, very well true. They, they really do have such disparate effects. Yeah, so, that, so, so, and then both, of course, in a caloric deficit, you need to do the cardio and then maybe have some other fat burning aids in place. But the, ch the fat on my chest is melting off while the fat on my legs is remaining, which is annoying, but... I might have to switch it up from <laughs> raloxifene to tamoxifene. Always on serums. I was going to say something funny. Is, is that, um, you know, when I was a kid, when I first got the gynecomastia, I was probably, you know, I was a little bit chubby huh, when I was 14, 15. I, I think that that's maybe the reason why it had more likely to happen to me. I had higher estrogen level, whatever. But when it happened to me, man, the biggest regret I have, bro, is that I wasn't, when I was 15, if I just freaking knew about AIs or understood, yeah, I knew about them. I knew about them when I was 15. But I didn't really understand. Uh, like, how, like I didn't know the risks or what could happen. Now I'm comfortable enough that if I was back at 15 and I got the, like, the, the flare, I could have stopped it with a serum. Or I could have stopped it with an AI and just saved myself all of that freaking hassle, you know? Yeah, no, I, for sure. I, I, I tried to get the surgery when I was a teenager. Man, I, I didn't have the opportunity. Nobody was willing to pay for me. No, me neither. Me neither. That's why I've been yeah. procrastinating. And now that I've been able to afford it, I don't really want to go because it's like eight weeks downtime. <laughs> it's know? a lot of downtime. That's true. So yeah. the, the last takeaway from that raloxifene experiment is that it raised my liver enzymes quite a bit. And uh, that's why uh, I'm just going to run four more weeks just to get the data and then see how much a difference of 60 milligrams per day to 120 milligrams per day makes. And then I'm going to discontinue it and then uh, right, save the money for uh, the gyno surgery, which I'm already in discussion with. Probably, I might end up with the same doctor as um, as Joe Stetics used because he's a plastic surgeon oh. and it looked very, very nice. Mm. Yeah, just two grown-ups talking about uh, nipple incisions, you know. It's <laughs> about the Bro, liver enzyme. <laughs> About the liver enzymes, though, you have to be a little bit concerned about the fatty liver. I have a feeling that fatty liver is much more common in high estrogen environments for some reason. Yeah. I've seen some, some mm. relationship between estrogen and liver cancers. No, I know. And plus, the, because, like, listen, I don't want that stuff to return. So I'm very, very conservative. So before the fast, my liver enzymes ended up at, let's say, 50 to 70, depending on the markers. And then I took six and a half days off of food training, ancillaries, anything that passes through my mouth, right, besides a little bit of vegetables. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the calcium diglucarate and the EDTA and uh, and then they dropped by half again, so okay. yeah, so they came down to like uh, twenty eight thirty six. Yeah. That's so, that people should understand this. The quickest cure to a higher liver enzyme value just fast. Yeah, the liver takes a break and take yeah. a week off from training because some of the liver enzymes come from skeletal muscle also, right? Are leaking into the bloodstream. How much time should you actually take off from training before blood work? Like, what's the real answer One week. that you guys would give? One week. One week. But ideally you do now, it yeah you ideally you do it just right away because you want to see how bad your blood work is while you're doing everything you need you're doing for whatever aspirations you have so if you're a hardcore mm -hmm. bodybuilder you do it the day before you step on stage no fucking excuses but they don't want to do it i've done it i've done it a day before a photo shoot oh man you want to cry <laughs> you want to cry yeah. Yeah, and then two weeks later everything drops in half so you, if you only do two weeks after the uh, show right you or a photo shoot or whatever you did to manipulate water. If you do it two weeks after, half the markers are already acceptable, right? Or explainable. Mm -hmm. And then you do it a month later, it's better. But for the three months leading into that photo shoot, there were shit. 
They were yeah, absolute yeah. ass, you know, but nobody. But let's make it do the, do caveat the, for people. The, the main liver enzymes people look at are ALT, AST, mm. GGT, and uh, alkaline phosphate. A, a, what phosphate. is it? ALP? ALP. Yeah, yeah alkaline so, phosphate. Just, just so you guys know, the ALP very much affected by muscle damage in the body. You can't rely on that one. Mm. The AST, unlike the ALT, does not get affected by muscle damage acutely. A little bit. And the, the ALT, very little. The ALT and AST ratio is really indicative of interesting things. Like ALT being high usually represents acute toxicity to the liver, like a mm. night of drinking. If your ALT is 70 and your AST is 40 or 30, sounds like you just had a toxic event and generally have like similar good liver liver health. Mm. If your AST and ALT are... are, are um, close to each other, like 70-70, seems like you've had long-term inflammation in your liver and an acute liver injury uh, recently. Yeah. If your AST is above your ALT, you start getting into alcoholic fatty liver disease and some bizarre things. These ratios are very important. For example, GGT elevated by itself without ALP, indicator of acute damage. Yeah. As a yeah. one. So you have to not... Um, yeah. So the weird thing but is he, I've, I've never seen my GGT over 15 units per liter. So that's even the bottom of the reference range. Yeah, really? never. Still got non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but that's just the lifestyle, you know, cycling orals and, and never taking time off and then eating a boatload of food so you don't have to take so much performance enhancing drugs that you get something else. This, yeah. this lifestyle is, is not healthy, bodybuilding lifestyle. No. There's no way around it. I don't care what anybody said. I've lived it for 23 years and there's no way to do bodybuilding healthy. Now, now, Steve, we've been talking about bodybuilding a lot. Do you have that article about the guys using Adderall in uh, college? Uh, no. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it was sure. a it was a screenshot that maybe I can uh, pull up here because I don't know if it was an actual article as much as it was like a survey slash observational thing. Well, let me try and pull it up. But basically, uh. If you guys don't follow Andrew Huberman, he's a well-respected neuroscientist from Stanford, and he actually shared this recently. I will put it in the WhatsApp chat, and then maybe we can edit it onto the screen or something, or we can just read it out because ultimately it is just a tweet anyways. You want me, but to, I, you want me to share? Uh, oh, yeah, I guess you can screen. Uh, I don't know if you want to screen share yeah. your WhatsApp but yeah, just download you... the picture and screen share. Yeah, let me let me download. Okay, and download. You know what's interesting is um, I was looking recently actually for frequencies of Adderall use among college students, but uh, I wasn't finding some uh, very informative papers, and I think that they were not really accurate. Uh, yeah. So this is like I did. You guys get the picture? Yeah, I'm, I'm sharing. Else? Sharing now. There we go. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so I just learned from a colleague and it was confirmed by every student I asked that 25% of students age 16 to 32 take Adderall one to seven times per week, not prescribed. Five to 10% do the same with modafinil or r modafinil. 30 to 35% of students are on amphetamine. This is serious, safer options exist. So this could uh, lead to a lot of different discussions. Okay. This, this, I'm glad we're skipping to this, by the way. Wait, why did he? Why did he say thirty to thirty-five percent? Oh, they, that that use it at all in general? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Now, obviously, this is like not some. He's not action. adding the modafinil percent to the Adderall percent and saying amphetamine, right? I hope not, but I, would, I hope I'm not. A, okay. I'm 100. I would doubt he would do that. So, because yeah. he he talks about the difference mm -hmm. between these drugs, pharmacology, okay. and everything. So, I don't think so. But so this is a very interesting uh, point of discussion. I thought I thought that it could lead us into the idea of, well, first of all, I wanted to mention just for people that don't know, this is not new at all. Uh, I, I, people that don't know much about the history of these drugs tend to get surprised. They're like, oh, the students are on Adderall. Well, in the 1930s in Nazi Germany, all the med students were on methamphetamine. They were doing it back then. The drug was called Pervitin. And I came across it recently, a story about it in a book called um, Blitzed. I forgot the author's name, but it's a great book on drug use in Nazi Germany and in World War II. You'll find that these drugs were abused by students forever since they were ever discovered, actually. Um, first of all, the second thing I wanted to discuss is I thought that it would be cool to discuss what some famous world leaders were taking because... We're talking about Adderall and stimulants. And the interesting thing is, I believe that a lot of the world leader, leaders currently 
leading nations are on stimulants. I also think so about a lot of CEOs, but we don't have much proof of it in contemporary times. But I thought it could be interesting to reflect on what we do know about, even though it is 70 years ago. So, for example, Hitler is a very interesting uh, case. So I took some notes here just so I don't miss miss anything. I'm going to share my screen. All, I got some overlays to entertain. First of all, Hitler uh, and JFK, actually. Oh, this is just a, Hitler and JFK were... <laughs> Just to run, because he looks like he's on meth. That's an interesting thing. Oh, but yeah. you know, a lot of these, a lot of these speeches. See, this is 1935. This is before he met Dr. Morel. Dr. Morel was sort of the Dan Duchesne of World War II Germany. Uh, Morel would give injections that were not completely clear to a variety of. Uh, let's pause this. Uh, to a variety of um, of uh, high high placed individuals in the Third Reich in Germany, and Hitler heard of him eventually and began to take his injections. Now he was famous for giving vitamin and animal extract injections, things like you would imagine cerebrolysin, but they didn't have that then. But it's like those kind of extracts and then vitamins. But interestingly, he took a lot of detailed notes of his injections to Hitler. And he was injecting him by the time the World War started, uh, 1942 or so, at least daily, at least every other day, often daily, many times, multiple times a day. And he was injecting him with pervitin, methamphetamine, injection IV, just to be clear. And we've talked about this on my channel before, but for the audience that doesn't know, a peculiar thing about being injected IV methamphetamine is very different than snorting it or anything else, is that you may spontaneously ejaculate. This happens very frequently. Some people on my video that said that, they commented, they're like, I'm an IV meth user, I don't ejaculate. And then people respond to them, you're like, yes, I do, yes, I do, yes, I do. There's, there's tons of people that do. So it's a very, all, I'm, all I'm, I'm saying this for is, it's a very powerful hedonistic pleasure. To imagine how that influenced the world leader, injecting IV methamphetamine is very interesting, but he was also injecting cocaine IV routinely, to the point where Dr. Morel, he complained to Dr. Morel one day that he said, I'm not becoming addicted to the cocaine, am I? Because they were doing it daily in the morning. And, he, and mm. the Morel said, no, a cocaine addict snorted. We are using a nasal cream. So he was all injecting it and using a nasal cream. And he was using Eucodol, which is actually oxycodone. They were injecting oxycodone when he would feel tired. So this if he would, dick must have been non-functional. I don't know. I, I don't, it, not only that, speaking of which. That's why he took the uh, amphetamines, right? To at least get some of the pleasure out of it. Speaking, yeah. of, speaking of which, Derek, he started to develop par what's called Parkinsonian symptoms later in his, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of this, like the last two years, especially the Western nations were noticing that his movements started to get very jerky. And sometimes when he was holding his hands behind his back, his hand would start to have a tremor in it. So people believe that he may be developing Parkinson's disease. Now, if that is the case, it's potentially the case that the IV methamphetamine injections could have been going on longer than we know and could have caused slow dopaminergic neuron loss in the body, causing Parkinson's disease. Or it could be the case that he was going through withdrawal from the opiates during the daytime yeah. and didn't even realize. And or from the so he was taking a lot of things. So that's the that's the first gentleman. The second one I wanted to talk about was so the, JFK. before we get into the into JFK, which some of these are huge, very, very interesting. Um, the difference in pharmacology between amphetamine and methamphetamine, like obviously. On paper, they sound structurally like you would think as an anabolics guy, like, oh, it's just like a methylated version of amphetamine. Like, what is the difference in pharmacology and like how different really is it? Because like you have a lot of kids being prescribed amphetamines now and like, like what is the difference well, between the two? So, so to tell you the truth, so you would think uh, just for those that don't know, methylating a molecule is a chemical uh, change that's done to a molecule. It doesn't usually predict how the molecule acts exactly. So a methylated version of a molecule doesn't just mean it's a super strong version, but it may have particular effects. So methamphetamine is more dopaminergic, more intensely dopaminergic, and I believe serotonergic, but far more dopaminergic than amphetamine is. And, and can... amphetamine, for example, is far more dopaminergic than Ritalin is. You can, compare, like um, you can compare so, methylated boldenone being the anabol to methylated masterone being superdrol. I mean, it's completely different pharmacodynamics from the parent yeah. hormone. So, oh, but, but so, so uh, if you look at studies on uh, how amphetamines cause brain damage, they usually look at methamphetamine. Methamphetamine is by far the most likely to cause what's called dopamine neurotoxicity. It's so sudden and overwhelming and cause, but uh, let me tell you the truth. If you take a guy who's used amphetamine like two or three times and you give him 10 milligrams of methamphetamine, I've tried this, and 10 milligrams of amphetamine, 
you'd be hard pressed to try the dif- to know the difference. It's not that easy to notice, especially if you sub if you take it sorry orally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The yeah. difference is that a lot of these uh, meth addicts, it's not just the drug that's different; it's that the way they consume it. Mm -hmm. So they smoke it or IV it. And that's why I was mentioning earlier, these weird results that come when you IV or smoke it, you know, these sudden dopaminergic effects. Yeah, I'm a snorting the dosing is even more difficult, right? Because you don't know how much permeates and the the potency of the, there's a... The the, the feeling of the drug is completely different if it's snorted. I've never smoked or injected, but I've tried, I've snorted just to experiment once. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's very different, the feeling, very powerful. Yeah. And even sublingual effects are very different. Mm-hmm. So, just- so moving on to J- JFK, I just wanted to mention, so his history, for a lot of people say like he had Addison's disease, which is a disease of adrenal insufficiency, meaning his adrenal glands didn't produce uh, enough adrenal hormones, like co- co- cortisol and so on. And he was being treated that for that for the, most of his life. In reality, JFK was a very sickly child who had autoimmune conditions from early age. The condition that they believe he had is called uh, Schmidt syndrome, uh, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Schmidt syndrome. But that condition, it seems to be a cause the adrenal insufficiency, the Addison's disease. Interestingly, his sister, Eunice, who's the mother of Maria Shriver, had Addison's. And his son, JFK Jr., had Graves' disease, which is a thyroid autoimmune disease. So he grew up, now he was diagnosed by the Mayo Clinic for having colitis in early age. To treat the colitis, they gave him uh, pellets, pellets they implanted pellets like the finaplex pellets yeah. mm-hmm. of of corticosteroids every three months uh, to inhibit his immune system activity oh jesus so during those now researchers theor or writers theorize that those pellets were giving unequal distributions of of uh, co- uh, these corticosteroids which were causing him to develop osteoporosis at mm. the same time he was also having an inflammatory reaction of his of his joints so this guy started to live with chronic pain mm-hmm. and very bad back problems, like insufferable chronic pain. They called they call it. In fact, there's a term like uh, severe centralized pain. Um, so anyway, he had these issues. So that's where his treatments began. And basically, uh, there was a there was a, two people involved with him. One was Dr. Jeanette Travelli or Travel. Sorry, she seems to be a responsible person who took him to the maximum of performance enhancing drug use, <laughs> like like health wise. But there was yeah. another guy who was not so responsible. His name was Dr. Max ja- Jacobson. Dr. Max ja- Jacobson was conveniently a, he was a German refugee actually who came over another doctor feel good with mystery injections that he used to give to celebrities. And these celebrities used to be dumbfounded by how these vitamin injections were making them feel so good. Little did they know there was a lot of vitamin C in it, but there was also amphetamine, not methamphetamine, but amphetamine this time. Now, for those that don't know, the Germans and the Japanese preferred methamphetamine. The British and the Americans preferred amphetamine in the war. So anyway, he was given, uh, not him, but the clients of Dr. Feelgood, this uh, Dr. Max Jacobson, were given uh, amphetamine injections. The, their reactions were very funny. Sometimes they'd say like, I've never felt so good in my whole life. I feel like I could take over the world. Nobody was suspicious about anything. But uh, later in life, by the way, he got his medical license revoked for the amphetamine injections because he, someone died from acute amphetamine toxicity from the IV injection. But he treated uh, he treated JFK and he treated JFK with amphetamines and steroids. People think that those that his treatment in the early part of the 50s, I think, may have affected or 60s may have affected um, uh, JFK's decision making and um, Dr. Jeanette Travel is the one who did his long-term therapy. So now we're going to get into it. What did he take? First of all, he took oral methylphenidate, Ritalin, named after the guy's wife, Rita, the guy who invented it. So he did take that. To go to sleep, he took barbiturates. What was the reason? Usually people with severe pain need opiates, and then they also need barbiturates to put them to sleep. I don't know why that, that barbiturates to put them to sleep is a random assumption from the 1960s, but Merck's catalog recommends it and so on, so it wasn't off the procedure. So he was taking barbiturates to sleep, Methylphenidate during the daytime. He was taking three kinds of code of uh, painkillers: codeine, Demerol, and methadone. Methadone. Wow. Interestingly, he was taking Cytomel twice a day, twenty-five micrograms for for his whole presidency. He was Jesus. taking ten milligrams of hydrocortisone daily and two point five milligrams of prednisone twice daily. This is later in life when they invented those medications, not the pellets back in the day. So those are his corticosteroids. Then he was taking he used testosterone his entire pre- uh, presidency. So he initially used 10 to 25 milligrams of oral methyl testosterone. But later, they started giving him yeah. 50, 50 to 75 milligrams of testosterone suspension, aqueous suspension. Mm-hmm. And 
he was taking five to ten milligrams a day of fluoxymesterone. That is, that is halo tested. <laughs> he was taking, he was taking ten to twenty five. The whole presidency, like the last three years or whatever of his presidency, he was on halo. <laughs> so where did you where did you pull this from again? This, this is uh... there's a lot of there's a lot of literature uh, uh, tracing his uh, his. Um, actually, I pulled I pulled the it's everywhere really. Uh, uh, there's a lot of literature is, tracing. I wonder what is is there an autopsy of this guy because... specifically. Specifically, uh, sorry, the, the literature the, about the detailed uh, drug use comes from a review that was done in the last 20 or 30 years on uh, his handling. They were trying to check if the care was correct and so on. So uh, they released all these documents. Wow. Gotcha. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah, you can find it easily with <laughs> the Google search. That's crazy. <laughs> oh, wow. So I thought that was really interesting. And then to tie that into modern day, I don't know, Steve, do you have that WikiLeaks page? Yeah, I got it. This one I found very interesting because when WikiLeaks came out, you know, I'm I'm half Emirati, so uh, this is somewhat relevant to me. Uh, Saudi Arabia is a neighboring country, bordering country. And uh, WikiLeaks had this very interesting thing about King Abdullah. King Abdullah was the former king of Saudi Arabia. He was 92 years old at the time, but nobody knew his age. It says later here he's been lying about his age. It says 80, 82 to 80, 87. So, Steve, just go up a little bit. Yeah. The paragraph before this one's really interesting. So he says here, uh, this physician was called in to perform routine medical treatment for one of King Abdullah's wives. He has four. Upon arrival, the royal clinic accidentally provided this physician with the king's medical file instead of that of the wife. So this doctor, spied, took the medical file, gave it, and that's what we're reading here. So if you scroll down, he's a heavy smoker at 92. <laughs> we didn't know that, by the way. He doesn't smoke publicly. Nobody knew this. And he uses Viagra excessively and receives hormone injections. So he's on testosterone replacement therapy, we believe. So this isn't much, but it's interesting to know. At least you can see one world leader who you would have never expected at 92 is on testosterone. There's yeah. nothing else there. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. But it's just the fact that he's on TRT. No, yeah, that's wild. Oh, he's 92. He was 92. He died yeah. a couple of years later, I think. Pretty yeah. respectable lifespan for being a heavy smoker. And I, actually, it's a little funny. You know, his father was also notorious for being obsessed with sex. So in the 60s or 50s, when they first found oil in Saudi Arabia, his father was using a lot of the revenue to bring in as many doctors as he could to figure out how to get himself up hard again so he could continue copulating. <laughs> he had like 150 kids, 120 kids. Wow. wow. Oh, yeah. He had a ton, a ton of unbelievable amount of kids. Amazing. But he took it very seriously. So, so I guess I wonder is... what excessive amount of Viagra is. I wonder. 200 million yeah, I... a day. I don't know. <laughs> you were saying, uh, Derek, you were saying Dan Bilzerian got a heart attack. From yeah. yeah, he only took him. like 150 or something. Yeah. It was not was very substantial. He was on cocaine all day for, yeah, he for was days on also, right? So. Yeah, he was He was on like a binge of like no sleep for like two or three days in a row, coked up, and then he was trying to fuck and he couldn't get his dick hard. So he took like, uh, I forget if he took 50 milligrams or 100 milligrams or something and it wasn't working for him. So he was like, whatever, I'll just take more. And then he ended up giving himself a heart attack. Poor guy. Yeah. yeah, and I tried not to mess with that stuff too much. Uh, so now he just uses Cialis instead of Viagra because he thinks it's like way more benign when I think obviously the context specific yeah. application was what kind of fucked him over. Not yeah, necessarily and the dose, right? The dose is also yeah. quite excessive. But it was like, it wasn't that it was, what was it? It was either 150 or 250. I forget, but it was like, that's, a, I guess, a more intolerable drug, frankly, overall. Like I... Like if you're going to compare like 20 milligrams Cialis to 100 milligrams of Viagra in general, I would see more side effects from the Viagra personally. It's, just, it's funny you mentioned this because uh, a, a co-ruler of the guy we just went over, but I'm not going to say who, who, who died, neighboring country, died uh, in the 2000s. He died from that. He was having sex with a chick. He was on Viagra, but he was drinking and doing a little bit of other drugs. Oh, man. He had a heart attack. Yeah, it's, it's mm. horrible. So the, I've been hearing about that since I was young. So I never wanted to try Viagra. It's like too, <laughs> plus, no. plus, it's like you take Viagra and you got to go. Like, this is the time. It's like yeah. you're on a clock. Oh, the I timing think. is very tight. So that's why I like five milligrams of Cialis in the morning. Yeah. You're basically ready to have go you, every day. You know? Did you guys ever try the underground labs? A lot of the time would have like Iron Man, which was like a combination yeah, of Cialis and those. Viagra. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it put, yeah. the, uh, the other one for Danif no, you have Sildenafil for yeah, Danif to Dalifo. They put like half the dose of all of them in there. Yeah, and then you if don't. They have... were smart. They would put they would put uh, put the uh, doxazosin. Doxazosin works to a different mechanism. Put that with the. Oh, these guys don't. You know what? It annoys me, Derek. Derek, it annoys me sometimes. These research chem companies. It's like, why are you still making DNP? There's like fifty alternatives. 
There's so mm. many DMP pro drugs, a little bit safer. They don't even, exp I mean, I'm not talking about DMP. They shouldn't make DMP, maybe, probably. But I'm just saying, like, they're not at all inquisitive. It like doesn't they, sell. They put the money in, but they don't check, you know? It doesn't sell. I mean, look at my channel. I have all these new novel compounds to, um, right, try over uh, uh, traditional fat burners or whatever, and it doesn't get views because people don't know about it. So it's so new, all these novel compounds, that people don't even take the time to research it and look for better opportunities to save right, their, their health in the process. Well, DMP works. There's literature on it, so might as well go with that. And when you talk about well, something else, that, then they're like, yeah, well. But the fat loss drug that you're experimenting with right mm -hmm. now, like that's pretty unheard of, but I saw it on, uh, on a website today. Yeah. It's available. Oh, it's available. Yeah. It's highly expensive. It's oh. highly expensive. It costs you like two to three dollars per tablet, and you need three tablets per day. So then, of course, the, the, the cost effectiveness is like, okay, might as well use growth hormone then. Because <laughs> if I'm going to spend ten dollars a day on a fat burner, I'd rather get some anabolism for that as well. So, oh, yeah. say, uh, Steve, say we had to create a stack for somebody that we don't know anything about his genetics. All we think of is that he his his career or her career requires her to be, well, it's going to be a him because there's testosterone there, but <laughs> requires him to be high performing high driven so derek suggested sort of we call it like an entrepreneurship uh suggest a generic entrepreneurship now the thing is we should caveat everything in the beginning was saying the majority of the value in designing somebody's a program uh, is in knowing their unique biology yeah. either how they respond to the drug by trying it out or you know something about their genetics or something about their history so we don't know anything about that but steve and i proposed two models steve maybe you could share your screen and show yeah what we uh, wrote out uh, where and this is just a suggestion for people that are not as initiated into these subjects and some ideas, nothing to go by, of course, for yourself. Let's see. By the way, some of these suggestions are things that I would otherwise and have been otherwise open to implementing in like Gorilla Mind, for example, but were otherwise limited by Deshea compliance. So for example, like Nupept, excellent nootropic, I feel like. Mm -hmm. However, I can't, I can't legally put it in a product. So like something like that, decent addition to certain people's you know cognitive stacks for sure all right so yeah I, of course yeah a lot of these are, are drugs or you can't include them do you guys have experience with dihexa uh um i know people who have i haven't really dug into it a lot but i have it at home so i'll, I'll run the experiment soon um i've so. used i've used it uh short term and not noticed very much yet isn't that the shit you like wipe on your neck or at least that's the the pharmacy version i have access to it's I, like a topical I, I think i have tablets I have tablet Nupept yeah. and Dihexa and uh, nasal sprays. And yeah, I found a compounding pharmacy here. So I'm, I'm open to oh, all really? sorts of experiments. Yeah, I got lucky to it. Yeah, there's a ton wow. of different things. So um, let's let's go over my proposal first. Again, I'm, I'm angling this from a bodybuilder perspective. So uh, like the, there's a little bit of a difference between my protocol and Leo's protocol. And it's basically what I'm doing right now. So. An entrepreneur, <laughs> an entrepreneur stack, right? A low dose of testosterone, maybe 40 to 50 milligrams three times per week with Prima Bowling on top. So you don't need an aromatized Wait. inhibitor. Uh, can you explain like to the audience, someone who's never used Primo, why would you want to use Primo other than the AI? Is it like to get less psychi psych psychological effects from the test while, while continuing to get protein synthesis and stuff like that? Yeah, so uh, like testosterone dose of uh, let's say 150 milligrams per week will most bring most people over super physiological levels, assuming it's mm. quality. So you'll get levels of higher than a thousand nanograms per deciliter. I'm at 1100 nanograms per deciliter and 156 milligrams tests per week, right? But that's with ACG and I'm a much larger body size. So right? testosterone levels tend to decline a little bit if you're larger body size compared to somebody. So let's say I do 150 and somebody else does 150 at 80 kilos, their serum testosterone will be higher. And compared mm -hmm. to mine. So mm -hmm. a, a replacement dose of testosterone is more than sufficient for cognition and stable serum concentrations, well-being, sex drive, mm -hmm. etc. And then perhaps the prima bolin is on top to facilitate a little bit more anabolism mm -hmm. and a little bit a slight amount of aggression because prima mm -hmm. bolin is a DHT derivative and you know makes people a little bit more positively aggressive. From my experience. You notice that? You notice like uh, I don't I notice that from, from a low dose like this, yeah. Yeah, I'm really? way more driven on this this low dose. Uh, again, is it like the Anavar sort of psychologically to you? Similar? Yeah, I get the same yeah, thing right? from Anavar. It's just it's just yeah. more androgens in your system, so you get a little bit more like 
driven yeah, attitude. That's mean. what I know. So you have the testosterone or primo is just there to replace your hormones and add a little bit of an edge, I would say, right? Cosmetically and uh, dri- from a driven perspective. And then the Anivar five milligrams pre-workout is more than enough to facilitate a little bit of additional mind muscle connection and connective strength with your right workout. That's, that's sublingual, right? Yeah, the sublingual. That's why yeah. it goes slow. Sublingual. Yeah. And then if, if needed, right, if the testosterone and prima bone dosage um, gives you too high estrogen, you don't need to result to an aromatized inhibitor, 100 to 200 milligrams of methane is more than enough to metabolize the excess estradiol into esterone and estriol. Now, if you're taking ACG, that might have a little bit of a less effect because again, ACG produces a little bit of estrone and estriol as well, but predominantly est- estradiol in the testicles. So you see the ratio is a little bit what different. Is, I actually don't even know what that is. So is, have, is that DIIM something? D, is oh, that the DIM. Uh, yeah, that's DIM. Is Di- that is? Uh, yeah. That's it's, what you use to control your estradiol sometimes. Yeah. So if you're like up until dosages of 250 milligrams of test per week, 200 milligrams of methane for myself and many of the people that I talk to is enough to keep the estradiol at the top of the reference range. So you don't need to result to an aromatized inhibitor. Now, but wh- why are you averse to aromatase inhibitors? Is some, there a value of this di- diendol methane? There's some it, other like, it doesn't inhibit aromatase as much yeah. as it alters. It like enhances estrogen metabolism uh-huh. in a way that it, it almost like partitions the steroidogenesis cascade in a manner that's like less carcinogenic and helps mm-hmm. you like get rid of the oh. hormone more optimally. Kind of like frankly i don't thoroughly understand it off the top of my head but i recall it was like something that women especially would leverage for yeah. getting a less carcinogenic burden of like estrogen from either hrt or like endogenous oh. and in men it's like a very it's very like mild but it could be enough mm-hmm. with a mild like input of burden from right. drug exposure exactly so right. Right. the good thing is about that is that you get a better estrogen balance right we a lot of people they go and test and an aromatized inhibitor and then they have still have a disproportionately high estradiol compared to esterone and estriol, the other two estrogens. And that might affect your libido slightly. So we're trying to optimize everything, not only the business sense and the anabolism, right, recovery from the workout, but also the libido. So from my experience, just a simple combination of these three compounds, excluding the anivar, gives most people good libido also. And then the ACG is just a method in place to sustain testicular function. And uh, you get your gorilla mind to unlock and load, and then you spread yeah. the love, you know? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you got the, you know, all, the, all this money from being an entrepreneur, <laughs> and you take your wife out to dinner, but you still got to spread the love afterwards. <laughs> yeah. So, and the ACG and the lock and load is there for, um, you know, uh, satisfactory on both ends, and both companies yeah. involved. <laughs> Derek, is the is the milligram dosage of Deca there sort of uh, equivalent to that testosterone plus Primo? Yeah, I just put it in there would, for to be hair safe. Yeah, for the hair safe people. Would that I would almost guarantee you end up estrogen deficient on that dose. So I would add in like a exogenous. With the ACG, he added the ACG. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you that would no longer be hair as yeah. hair safe. <laughs> no. yeah, but right. if you no. wanted to add exogenous E two to that, either transdermally if you can absorb it well or injectable ideally then that would be i perfect or you could use oral but you end up with disproportionately high estrone and it's kind of yeah. liver stress as your liver stress and some other shit you don't really want so not as ideal but um some format of estradiol that would be like the most hair safe thing you could possibly do however your strength is going to be fucking terrible on that st- on DECA only with just estradiol. Like you have like no psych- psychoactive like drive whatsoever. So you just get like pure like protein expression and hypertrophy, but like your strength is trash. So you could definitely argue that even on paper, your muscle accrual ability might be like the same as these other drugs, but the ability to actually like progressive overload in the gym is going to be so much worse that maybe downstream you gain less muscle, but you will definitely keep your hair. But then you could also look at the first stack and be like, maybe finasteride, dutasteride plus RU plus minoxidil is like sufficient to offset any hair loss from the first stack. It just depends Uh, on the person and how aggressive it is. But I I don't know, like ultimately when you, when you try and split everything into like, what's a hair safe stack versus non hair safe, like you're adding so much complexity to it. Like, I feel like we should kind of just approach this from like, if we had a guy 
who didn't mind maybe, I don't know, like whatever the optimal thing yeah, would that's, be yeah. for, because the cognitive thing, we're going to fuck up his cognitive ability if we care about hair at all. So yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. Like, also, let's, also, if you really care about hair, you should probably use Mastron as your base. I think that's, yeah. that's something we <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. No, but then you okay. lose out on all the anabolism. You know, yeah, yeah. You might as well no, no, use no, that, it's then. probably no. Actually, uh, apparently, Mastron could be very anabolic. Also, I bet you really? people get huge on asthma. I've never met anybody exactly with a good physique same. running uh, Mastron as their base. All right, so st <laughs> stimulation, stimulation. You, um, yeah, fifty milligrams modafinil is more than enough, in my opinion, or five milligrams uh, Adderall to um, put you in the zone. Have you, Steve, have you ever used modafinil? Because uh, that's what's available in Thailand. Have you ever used that seven days a week? I, I, Do you notice tachy like function and uh... months in duration sometimes, you know? Oh, yeah. And you, do you notice uh, how does it reduce in its potency? It doesn't. Me? It doesn't for me. No. Okay. Yeah. No. For me, I notice way more desensitization to very dopaminergic stimulants like Adderall or like any of the mm. previous stimulants I've used like from as like for example the base in Gorilla Mine Rush was the two amino isoheptane like those I find desensit desensitization to yeah. way faster well I don't even get any from modafinil like I have a prescription for my sleep apnea up to 200 milligrams a day if I wanted and it does the same thing pretty much every time and to be honest I think in some aspects modafinil despite it not being as impressive of a drug as Adderall, yes. when yes. you factor in the dopaminergic component of Adderall and how much it spikes your sex drive, it might be counterproductive for some entrepreneurs when you factor in that modafinil will not make you horny as fuck. No, I didn't notice well, that, no. Uh, really? <laughs> My sex no. drive on Adderall is way worse than modafinil. No, 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 Derek's completely accurate. Like, yeah. not, not only that, Derek, I don't know if you if you ever use it long enough, like when I was in college, they, they stupidly told me, take 15 milligrams every day for the rest of your life. So yeah. I had to take it every day for a while. A year in, bro, you start to get into weird stuff. You start really be dating women, trying to meet chicks. You're like, what is going on here? I've yeah. just gotten very into chicks recently. And it's actually this dopaminergic thing. Ah. Yeah. So like the Adderall thing, even though I think uh, it has like potentials to be better as a entrepreneurial drug than modafinil from a actual like motivation standpoint and like getting you to enjoy what you're doing from like a work standpoint like as opposed to hating what you're doing but <laughs> the sex drive component is definitely problematic for some individuals especially compounding adderall chronically with like androgens too if you're yeah. on like test primo anivar like even though it's not that big of a dose or anything like your sex drive is gonna be fucking high with hcg2 potentially yeah. mm -hmm. adding in adderall on top some people might be better off with the modafinil in my opinion I just started experimenting with modafinil for the first time a uh, little bit just because I had a client who uh, he was having difficulties being awake in the daytime and he had a weird reaction to modafinil. So, you know, obviously I read all the academic paper, not all, but a lot of the academic papers on the mechanisms. And I thought that it was like mildly noradrenergic, uh, was not very dopaminergic. Originally, obviously, the mechanism wasn't understood. I took the drug several times and I have to tell you, I highly doubt that its mechanism is via noradrenaline or dopamine. It has some very weird effect that's unique to it. Mm -hmm. It feels almost circadian. Like it has some circadian effect, not just a stimulant. Anyway, I think it's still mysterious. The mechanism. No, it is. It, like, it is. Yeah, I tried to dive into it because I, I do take modafinil quite frequently. And it, yeah, it's not that well understood. It has some dopaminergic like, effects, serotonogic effects. It, I it don't overlaps. Think those are the ones. But it overlaps it also with other compounds which have similar effects, right? And it lowers prolactin slightly, you know, at these kind of dosages. So the reason I think it's good for some individuals, especially what it's actually prescribed for, is it just like, to me, the effect is, I know some people, they say, oh, I get like crazy, you know, mood elevation from it and this and that. And like, obviously it's going to be different for everyone. But for me, it like literally does what it's supposed to do, which is just like, keep me awake, which mm -hmm. that more heightened awakened level leads to more hours in the day of good focused attention it doesn't necessarily make me more motivated like adderall might or more like euphoric mm -hmm. however having more you know how you probably have like even if you work for 16 hours a day of like those hours maybe like six are just like money locked mm -hmm. in high quality work and then your other one yeah. third of the day is like half of the capacity especially yeah. after you've like worked out or ate a meal or whatever yeah. The, med the modafinil for me gives me more hours of 
that high quality input, yeah. but it doesn't necessarily make me more motivated or euphoric or anything. No, that's yeah. true. I also feel that the routine work that you sometimes have to do is a little bit more productive uh, that you sometimes kind of procrastinate about. Like, ah, I don't want to do the, the tags on YouTube, for example, right? right? And then you five videos down, you don't have any tags. So people can't find it in search engine. And then it um, doesn't happen to Derek. Right? No, no, right, by the way, tags, tags, I don't even think it makes a big difference, dude. Like oh. I, I don't even review my editor's tags at this point. Sometimes they put in stuff that's, you know, a, a lot of it, they'll just put in like, you know, as relevant of stuff they can do. But sometimes if I'm talking about drugs, I can't order like, you know, pharmacology or endocrinology. I don't expect them to know all the relevant tags yeah. to put that I otherwise would. And it doesn't seem to make a difference when I like go out of my way to do it like full blown, the full like 300 things I can yeah. fit in or whatever it is versus them putting in stuff that might be just like generic fitness stuff. Yeah. Or yeah. sometimes we forget to put them in entirely and it doesn't even seem to make a fucking difference. I, I do notice with some of my videos where I forgot to put the tags for a month and then I put them in and then you see the views start to pick up again. But maybe yeah, it's really. because the ever I have a lot of evergreen videos, right? That people don't want to watch today, but maybe a month from now it's uh, yeah. relevant. So, right. So that would be the, the stimulation aspect, then the neuroplasticity to absorb all the new things that we need to learn on a daily basis to keep uh, the audience entertained in our um, mind uh, ever uh, young. expanding. Keep our minds young. Young, young and yeah. expanding, right? So um, perhaps an SSRI like fluvoxamine, um, dosage is ramped up from 25 milligrams to perhaps 100 milligrams even. 1,000 micrograms Smax or Solanc on workout days, either pre-workout or post-workout. Oh, I have a very, yeah. very comprehensive um, Samax versus Solank in both nasal sprays versus injectable administrations comparison on my YouTube channel, already available. Oh, I haven't watched it. I'll go check it out. Go right watch there. it out. It's it's good. It's yeah. good. 2,000 I, I 2, watched, views. Yeah. Ridiculous. That's ridiculous. What a shame. <sighs> Anyway, it's the audience, just for the audience to know, me and Steve and I sometimes do weird videos that we're so so proud of, but like yeah. nobody watches them. And then we message each other about it late at night, like, oh, you know, yeah. nobody watches. And I, I, I do my proof for watching, right? And I watch it back, and I'm like, dude, if I had this at the age of 15 or 20 or 30, even, I know, that's the and I'm like, dude, yeah. this is gold. And then you wake yeah. up the next day, and I get like. 2000 views. You know, I bet it, if you it breaks my fucking heart. And then Steve, you doubt your whole being, right? No, you no, doubt no, like not anymore. <laughs> that's the the Samax and fluvoxamine and all that stuff that's uh, saving my uh, mental state. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> what are I'm going to go look at your title. Hang on. Okay, but, oh, yeah, but yeah. So it's, yeah, and then five you did 5 milliliter cerebral ice once a week. Huh? Yeah, so that would be my speculation because my cerebral ice uh, arrived yesterday. So stay tuned, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to your input, Leo, because you're the cerebral That's gains uh, expert. No, it made sense. I mean, the reason I would do that personally is if I didn't want to upregulate. So just for those that don't know, the fluvoxamine works. It upregulates neuro, neurotrophic factors, fa factors that grow the brain and make it plastic. But it does that through the serotonin system, right. just like LSD does and psilocybin does. So if you don't want to... Uh, mess with this like for example you might want to mess with the serotonin system a little bit because it has neurotrophic effects but it has also other effects like it calms you it does certain mm -hmm. things like that so for me if i was an entrepreneur i might need that energy i don't want to be calmed that much unless i had anxiety of course we're assuming mm -hmm. that this person completely normal so if he's completely normal i might think hey like steve did here i might say hey, i only want 100 milligrams of fluvoxamine max dose is 300. Mm -hmm. i only want 100 uh because i don't want too much serotonergic activity but i'm gonna get more neurogenesis with the cerebral lysin or with the simax or silank we exactly. mis i misspelled exactly. that over there that's my fault sorry oh that's right uh Sol solank no that's a simax Right, so yeah. actually, if you uh, go to Russia, <laughs> then right, it's a Mac. So oh, is that why I wrote it? Okay, yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's not a Mac, right. yeah. plus if you you know you you yeah. you might want to run it right uh, something like yes. this. You know, this is the Russian <laughs> way. I have all, some all the Russians are going to get upset. Naz Nazdrovia, my guys. Uh, so some actors Solank, you just on workout days to uh, mitigate some of the post-exercise brain fog, which after four weeks of use and three weeks of discontinuation gone really excellent gone dude and now i can train so hard and it doesn't affect my productivity at the end of the day wow brilliant. it's amazing amazing i'm gonna watch your video on it tonight yeah, yeah. it's it's both it's, are not banned by water by the way no it's not even on the list so you know, license is not on the list i i don't think pentosin is either by the way uh, no it's not no pentosin yeah, is, is really effective. yeah, yeah.
So a little bit of cerebral lesson. I don't have any experience with it, but uh, uh, Leo has the most comprehensive, the most in-depth cerebral lesson videos on his YouTube channel. So if you're not subscribed there, pause the video and head on over right? and do a little quick Google search for his uh, cerebral lesson analysis. And then regarding lifestyle, uh, again, from my personal experience, being a highly driven businessman, but also a kicking ass in the gym, um, let's... Uh, address it there for years i trained um you know with dorian yates and high intensity and progressive overload in mind and if i would train in the morning i would be messed up for a couple hours post-workout yeah. right? I, would, I would not get anything done so being a bodybuilding coach uh, not getting anything done would just mean talking to clients and, and doing their diet right at least i was able to do that i'm not talking about getting things done of learning new things uh, doing the research right doing highly intellectual stuff like writing ebooks or, or researching papers, that kind of stuff, I would be able to do that from 5 p.m. onwards, right? which is not the best time to research. Mm -hmm. So if you really want to be driven, you just can't go too hard in the gym unless you're using something like Cimax, uh, Cimax or Solanke or Cerebral License to take that post-exercise brain fog away. Um, right? So, and otherwise, you know... But you, not to like belittle your long videos essentially dissecting both of them yeah what is like the overarching conclusion of c max versus Solank for majority of individuals okay so both compounds are known to increase brain derived neurotropic factor expression in the brain so that's mm -hmm. a, a, a natural pulse right like a growth hormone secretagogue right it will secrete growth mm -hmm. hormone to a certain extent depending on which receptor it aggravates i have cerebral lysin, which contains brain derived neurotropic factor extracted from pig brains and then three other growth factors, right? Uh, uh, what was it? The neurotropic? Uh, GDNF, NGF, nerve growth factor, glial right. cell derived neurotrophic factor, and there's one more growth factor. Right. Brain derived neurotrophic factor, which is the one Steve just mentioned, is the most important one. Right. That's the one that's tied with SSRIs. Like SSRIs relieve depression via upregulating BDNF. Exactly. Not exactly. via serotonin. Yeah. So, so it's the most important. One. So cerebral lysin is super physiological. Exogenous brain derived neurotropic factor and the Cimax and Solank is um, endogenous secretion of expression, well, secretion of brain derived neurotropic factor directly in the brain. So you take these in a nasal spray and it permeates some of that, permeates into the, the, the skull, starts um, right, releasing this brain derived neurotropic factor. So you notice an immediate calming effect. Now, I found that Cimax is more calming and focusing than Solank. But Solank um, gives a little bit more energy. Right? And it might even raise white blood cell count on your blood work because it has some immunomodulatory effects similar to Tuftsin because it's basically synthetic Tuftsin. So long story short, if you're trading cryptocurrency, if you have a little <laughs> bit of social anxiety, if you have post-exercise brain fog, four weeks of that and you level up. I would also like to mention when I had COVID, that's the time I actually trialed it. I've had yeah. this stuff in my fridge for a long time, but when I had COVID because of the nasal issues mm -hmm. and the toxicity directly in the nasal canal, I was doing that three times a day. This yeah. is a max. Right. I was so, taking it. So did you have Solank at home at the time or you didn't try it? I had both. Yeah, I yeah. had both. So Cimax so uh, is also prescribed in Russia for immunomodulation, right? To boost the immune system. But Solank is actually bioidentical to Tuftsin with a little bit of a proline glycine, uh, proline attachment to extend its half, half life and active life. But IV administrations of Tuftsin, the bioidentical hormone itself, raise white blood cell count tremendously. So oh, I did my blood work after trialing Solank, uh, Cimax and Solank, and my white blood cell count came up with 10%. But I'm also on Prima Bolin, which is also linked to bringing white blood cell count up when it's deficient. So I had a little bit of a... Very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. I so it, I, I found these compounds, like perhaps a combination of fluvoxamine, Cimax, and cerebral lysin, you know, dosed as needed, or either one or the other, highly beneficial for people who want a lot out of their brain and go to the gym, right? Because mm -hmm. going to the gym is strenuous. Even when you don't go to muscular failure, or, uh, and, 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 you know, hammer in the progressive overload, like, ah, shit, I need to beat the logbook, I need to get one rep more, um, which is very rewarding in itself, but it does take some productivity away for the rest of the day, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, and then the rest would be a time-restricted eating, you know, a typical in, uh, intermittent fasting approach, um, 
fat adapted diets like uh, like a ketogenic diet, for example, or carnivore, if you can deal with uh, the tremendous changes in your lipid levels, and um, and then maybe some berries and probiotic yogurt post workout to get a little bit of carbs in and not uh, get into the state where uh, you need to start hammering the honey <laughs> to prevent yeah. glucose intolerance, you know. Yeah. Um, and do some freaking fast cardio, you know, to get the day started. Mm. Actually, that's a good point. When I thought about that later, I thought that's a very good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Because because after the cardio, you get your you get those endorphins. Endorphins are, by the way, the natural opioids that bind to your and endorphin receptors, the opioid mm. receptors. That's what they are. And then you get the GABA synthesis. You get adrenaline. You want all that in the morning. You don't want really that at night. No. So you want that besides the fat loss and the cardiovascular health. You start your day, yeah. but it allows you to kind of take. 30 minutes for yourself and just watch some YouTube. Meditation, exactly. Right. You would just watch, you know, you watch some Derek videos or Leo's videos or my videos or trading videos or whatever else you're interested in. But you take 30 minutes for yourself to get the day started without going to social media and then being bombarded with quick questions or emails from work. Right? Because sometimes you wake up to like hundreds of messages. And if you start your day like that, you're just, you, you come from this elevated cortisol, uh, cortisol state where you wake up, your, your cortisol is a little bit elevated. You have a coffee, it gets even higher. And then you start going into your emails. You're like, oh, new stress already starts. So you just, you calm down, you take your 30 minutes of fasted cardio, you watch a YouTube video, take a shower, you have your breakfast, and then you get to work. You know, that would be my that's recommendation. A good point also, that's a good point to talk about also, like the the value of rituals mm -hmm. and the value of habits. And uh, when you have a structured day that's scheduled and you follow habits as if they're rituals, mm -hmm. uh, it just creates some kind of like uh, you flourish when you do that. You know, yeah. human beings don't function well without a schedule and without habits. No, so, if I don't, if I have, if I don't have a structured day or I fall out of my structured day because I like took too long to do something or something popped up that was like an emergency I had to tend to, like my whole day gets fucked up. Yeah. All right. So I'll take you guys briefly through mine. So uh, first I, I broke them down by topic. So acetylcholine is eh, the main neurotransmitter that's manipulated by nootropics. It's very involved in memory consolidation, but also uh, choline, ac acetylcholine in general in the body directs our nervous system. It's also useful for athletics. So first of all, we get a 1000 milligram CDP orally. So CDP choline is one of the most absorbable forms of choline. Why would you use phosphatidylcholine instead of CDP choline? Phosphatidylcholine is the kind of choline available in meats that's a lipophilic kind of choline it's distributed differently in the body than if you take cdp choline however cdp choline is the most absorbable form i switched over to cdp choline eventually uh, just for that reason because i take a lot of it now the um, uh, requirement the government uh, advises you in the us to if you're a man consume 550 milligrams of choline a day uh, there's no upper limit I've seen people improve past a, a gram a day. So I think generally two grams with food, CDP choline, and you can replace this with an intramuscular injection. Why do I say that? Because if you guys watch the Joe Rogan show where he had that vegan on arguing with the, uh, um, what's his name? Um, the functional medicine guy. The main, one of the vegans main complaints about meat is that meat creates TMEO. And one of the reasons it does that is via ingested choline, phosphatidylcholine. So if you inject this, you can sort of avoid that. TMEO is produced by your gut in response to ingesting this. Derek, this Derek, where, where can people test for their TMAO? Oh, America Health. There you go. Yeah. Oh, really? Oh, that's yeah. brilliant. That's brilliant. Oh, you guys yeah. should test so, so that you can answer the vegans. Are you really somebody at risk? Yeah. You could figure it out. And then if you are, you know, you can make I would fly, I would fly to the States for the test alone because I called every clinic in Thailand and it's unavailable here. I would love uh, that. Yeah. yeah. I'm, uh, by the way, I don't know. I'm trying to figure out like a ratio allotment that'll make sense. But for like adding an Allison as a concurrent staple alongside carnitine or maybe alpha GPC even for attenuating TMAO mm -hmm. might be something that like, I don't know if you've ever heard of the garlic constituent Allison yeah. being like TMAO protective. I, I ran that experiment. It, it did not make any change on my blood work, but again, I couldn't check for my TMAO. I did feel that the carnitine was slightly more potent, but that's splitting hairs. But did you just use like broad spectrum, just like straight up garlic supplementation? No, Allison, I would be Allison like uh, extract. Oh. Yeah, at 180 anyway. milligrams per thousand milligrams of carnitine. So I, I take about 3,000 hmm. milligrams of oral carnitine. So I took about, what was it, 480? Okay, would sublingual carnitine even absorb is one thing I've been trying to think about because I can't do a troch or a trochi, however you want to say it, with a supplement company because 
it's like the format is considered a drug. So hypothetically, I could get, you know, or compounding pharmacy to make it, but then it would be like something you need to get prescribed and it's going to be way more expensive and just like harder to access. I, 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 so, yeah, go ahead. So I'm like carnitine molecular mass is, I forget off the top of my head. But, but, but Derek, what if it's in an aqueous solution? Won't it get absorbed very easily into the hair? Or maybe it's a grape, maybe a grapeseed extract could get it. Absorb. Okay, so we're, no, I'm I'm talking about something. Sublim- no, right? No, I guess. I'm following. Yeah, if, <laughs> if only, yeah, if, if only it was as effective as GHK and fucking C60, then we might be onto something well, it's here. Not yeah. just, it's not that. It's like you skip the molecular weight thing and then talk about the solution. Yeah. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like, it doesn't matter that it's more than yeah, five hundred. It's in water, bro. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's in water. It'll get through. Don't yeah, worry yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> So, so, like, so, I'm not really sh- sure how if a sublingual carnitine, like, because you would want to administer to replicate a injection, even an injection, you want like 400, 500 milligrams potentially. So, if you want to absorb that, like, under your tongue or something, like, is that far too high of a drug burden to like assume will assimilate correctly, yes. like, with a sublingual solution? I think I it will know. absorb, but I ran this experiment on your request maybe a year ago. Uh, with injectable, weren't you using like straight powder or something? Yeah, straight shit? powder, and yeah. my my saliva just kept coming and coming and coming to the point I uh, I had to abort because that <laughs> no no no, no, no. It's that's too much. Those it's are too that's much. Too it's too much. So I tried yeah. that later on with injectable carnitine, acetyl <laughs> okay. L carnitine, and uh, straight up L carnitine without the tartrate. Same thing. Your saliva formation is just man. You start foaming at the mouth, literally. Because it's, I don't know, it just irritates the, 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 the I don't know, it just keeps, saliva was crazy. So I don't think it's just a valid just, approach. Just for the audience to know what we're talking about, we were talking about choline here, but mm-hmm. right now Derek and Steve are talking about L-carnitine. And right. The reason why is L-carnitine and choline are the two products in meat that get turned into TMAO by gut bacteria, which mm-hmm. was the main arguments of the vegans against eating meat. There are other re- uh, arguments, but that's the main one they were using in that uh, discussion. All right. Yeah, which hypothetically might have translation to if you're worried about the same kind of thing from alpha GPC, then maybe you do an alpha GPC solution that's sublingual instead, yeah. perhaps. So you don't have yeah. to inject it like every or injecting choline like every day or something. Yeah. Yeah. So so just to take you guys quickly through this, the reason why I have uh, in point one A, there's a hundred milligram CDP choline is to give your body the nutritional requirement to produce the a neurotransmitter acetylcholine. So for example, you want to p- produce dopamine, you need L tyrosine. You may be getting enough in your diet, but you are not getting enough of choline. That's almost certain. Yeah. So I would, and there's no toxicity issues with it. So you would raise the dose. And then if you look at C, here on C, we use alpha GPC. The reason why is alpha GPC, there's some academic evidence that the way it works is by causing released reserves of choline, sorry, releasing reserves of choline in the body that quickly pass the blood brain barrier, get into the brain, join with the acetyl group, and become that neurotransmitter acetyl choline that's so useful. Now, B, I have a 5 to 20 milligram of donapazil upon rising daily. Some people are very sensitive to donapazil. Generally, you have to start titrating up whatever dose you begin with, like 5 five milligrams or so. But I, for example, can't tolerate 20 milligrams. Donapazil is the pharmaceutical acetylcholesterase inhibitor. That means it's the pharmaceutical version of a drug that stops the breakdown of acetylcholine once it's created. Once it's created, so we've all been trying to create it, get in the brain. Now, once it's created, donapazil stops it from being broken down. So it's sort of like an MEO B inhibitor for dopamine. It causes a like an extracellular amount of acetylcholine to build up in the brain. Mm-hmm. Now, what's the? You could do this without a drug, and that's by using gorilla mines nootropics. A lot of the acetylcholesterase inhibitors there, like ginkgo biloba, and so on, they work through this mechanism. Now. But, but I was just thinking about, you know, this is maxing out, right? You can't yeah. get a prescription for donapazil, by the way, in the U.S. It's only given for people in, with Alzheimer's disease. So it's, it's almost impossible unless you have a really good f- friend doctor who wants to risk his uh, legal notepad or medical notepad for yeah. you. So next 500 milligrams uridine monophosphate upon commencing cognitively taxing tasks. That's sort of when you take the first alpha GPC dose. I, I would limit this if I could to the days in which you use alpha GPC. And I would limit that, try to take one day off a week because I've noticed sometimes the sensitivity declines. The reason I have piracetam there is because there are many other racetams. Piracetam is the best studied one. We know it works through the cholinergic system a little bit. And also there are pharmaceutical versions of it. Uh, I have a pharmaceutical version. 
Uh, that's what I use personally. I wouldn't go use the ones from Nootropics Depot or whatever the hell they are, because there's Russian pharmaceutical ones you can you can use. Now, Nupept is another version of it. I find them quite similar. It's a peptide version of the same drug. I, sometimes I switch between them, honestly. Now, Steve, if you can go down to dopamine, yep. see that 1,000 milligrams of L-tyrosine, that's, again, for the nutritional sufficiency of producing dopamine. The funny thing is, I, now, the L-tyrosine doesn't pass the rate-limiting step in the synthesis of dopamine. But honestly, it's weird, and Derek's noticed this himself before and told me this, and I didn't really notice it, but later I noticed, if you take a higher amount of L-tyrosine, it seems to upregulate the tyrosine hydroxylase enzyme, making you create more, even though it's not the rate-limiting step. So you'll notice, I bet you, if you take Adderall and then one, and then suddenly try taking one gram of L-tyrosine before you take your Adderall on an empty stomach, you will have a different experience. It's very interesting. If you try it a few days in a row, you'll notice if you keep comparing. So it, it is quite significant. And I didn't want to get in too much into dopamine because dopamine is a very tricky uh, hormone to play around with. It can cause mm -hmm. disease in people, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, all kinds of things like that. But it's also the hormone that drives ambition and everything else. So I just mentioned there, there's methylphenidate, which is Ritalin. Modafinil there is something that may be less stimulatory for you. Cefinamide there is a MAOB inhibitor. That's sort of like donapazil, but for dopamine. So there's other ways you can play around with. There's many other things you could do, but I didn't want to go into too much detail. About the hormone replacement, I said if sex drive is tolerable, because HCG is too, HCG drives sex drive really heavily. So yeah, if you, okay. I was saying, if you could use HCG, try to use HCG and a little bit of FSH to bring your testosterone level to the level that you want it at. But I didn't mention this there, but if it's intolerable, I would do something like what Steve's doing, the 250 to 500 units of HCG mm -hmm. every other day. And then I would use the testosterone to get it to the level where I psycho psychologically feel good. Still, so still intolerable, was, to be honest. And the C-Max also increased my libido, which I can't find any anecdotal evidence, but maybe it's because the brain-derived neurotropic factor is forming all those connections, you know? Um, yeah. Well, I have here intranasal testosterone, Natesto, which is also available at Merrick Health, right? Is it, Derek? Yep. Yeah, By the way, I, you should clarify your Adderall dose is based on in, instant release, right? I don't know. Yeah, so I, sorry, I didn't I didn't mention that was an instant release Adderall five milligrams, and that's that's a dose to start with. Now, some people are fast metabolizers; they may need seven point five or ten milligrams, but I always you should always start with the lowest amount and always try it more than one day in a row before you decide to increase the dose, because you can't go back down very easily. And so anyway, back to the these things. So uh, hormone replacement, the 11 milligrams intranasal testosterone is a one third of a daily dose of the Natesto, according to their studies. I've never used it myself, but I've read a lot about intranasal testosterone and its biology. It seems to be, to me, the best way to imitate a circadian rhythm. You know, when we take external testosterone, even with this HCG, it's every other day, you're getting this weird, you're not getting a circadian, you're screwing up your circadian rhythms. Yeah. But the testosterone, this intranasal testosterone has a great half-life and it's so well absorbed into the brain, way better than any other kind of testosterone. So it's perfect for the morning type of uh, activities, I think. And then the reason why I have T4 dose to keep TSH at 1 to 1 1.5 is because I know the HCG there and later on there's a growth hormone. And I'm concerned about their effects on thyroid. So if we move down a little bit, um, uh, Steve, just for the adrenaline, I mentioned here briefly propranolol. There's a lot of other adrenaline receptor uh, antagonists. Propranolol is sort of a pan receptor antagonist. It's not specific. Um, what it is is great for is like highly stressful situations. Like if you're talking to uh, 5,000 people and you're mildly stressed by it naturally, mildly. So you, you try it first in front of a smaller crowd, test it out and so on, figure out what dose you want. It, this is a drug given to snipers, to public speakers and so on to help them with that. Next, we have GABA. So wow. this is can a... I, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, would Nubivalol do something similar to lower the adrenaline and just keep the heart rate down because it's a selective beta blocker that I personally use, five milligrams per day? Well, interestingly, I've been on Nubivalol myself for the last two weeks because mm -hmm. of the the uh, alteration in my heart rhythm because of COVID. Mm. And um, Nibivalol has way less of an effect on stress mentally. Yeah. So Nibivalol is, is lipophilic. It goes into the brain, but it's I think it's too selective between the receptors. But I feel less like, for example, um, I felt there, were, there was a time in the last two weeks where I felt a bit stressed. I took a propranolol in addition to my Nibivalol. Ooh. But I would never take two propranolols. Yeah. Double dipping. So no, no, no. It's not, it's not that powerful. Like 10 milligrams of nebivalol is not comparable to 40 milligrams of propranolol psychologically. And, and not at all. last question, how do you compare Samax and Selang versus propranolol regarding stress reduction 
And I didn't uh, notice. Okay. I didn't notice anything from using them. So I used them during the COVID time, both of them, because they were intranasal, mm -hmm. and that's the only time I I tried them. I didn't notice anything from them. Okay. At all. Okay. So so I but I'll I'll trial them properly and report back to you later. Yeah. But so. Okay. So moving on to GABA, so the, the the adrenaline thing is really a minor one. This one is a little bit of a secret. This is really useful, okay? But you got to be careful. So if you know anything about my channel, you know I warn everyone away from benzos. Benzos are a, a horrible thing. If you mess around with benzos, if you abuse them, you will ruin your life. I'm not joking. No other drug can ruin your life quicker than that. Uh, anabolics can't. I mean, only DNP can't because it'll kill you. You know, this is really bad. Benzo withdrawal could be worse than... Then honestly than dying it can be really crippling so keep that in mind but with that said diazepam is my favorite benzo those that 2.5 to 5 milligrams of only for important social events never more than once a week i don't i don't use it by the way once a week i never have but i'm saying maximum once a week like in reality i use it maybe once every two months and the reason i use it it'll be in combination with an amphetamine low dose amphetamine low dose diazepam that combination produces chemical chemistry and it really works very well sorry chemical charisma it works very well if you're in an interview if you have to pitch something you're pitching businesses stuff like that use it on try it first obviously not in a high stress situation but i bet you'll find that it is probably the best way to create confidence and charisma in, com in combination with stimulants i, I, totally I like the end about for that personally yeah then about it's too long too long ass lack yeah. long lasting i think unless you're going on like a vacation with somebody hmm. uh, but I, uh, this but one, like how often do you have important social events where it's like that no way? i mean i mean so long like i mean what i mean to what i meant to say was uh it's too long it's unnecessarily long acting so mm -hmm. like this one is eight hours pro it's long it still has a long half-life but it works really well for eight hours or so and I, I feel like it peaks around three hours or so in, into it. Whereas the yeah. Fenabot, sometimes I feel like it peaks at night from here, so like later in the day. And yeah. and the Fenabot is a GABA A, a GABA B agonist. And honestly, Derek, the GABA B receptors are way less capable at creating the charisma than the GABA A receptors. Way less. Mm -hmm. Way I'm sure I'm I think on most people. I doubt I doubt if you trial the two together. I, but the thing is the benzo is way more dangerous because the GABA B receptors are extracellular. So mm -hmm. they, they cause way less tremors and stuff if you go through withdrawal. Hey, think, moving on real quick. Okay. No, sorry, sorry, Steve. I don't know. No, I thought for me the diazepam, the only time I take that is when I fly international to different time zones. And then th that's why I like the, the SR9009 injection because like let's say you fly like to a different time zone and it's almost the opposite. The diazepam will help you sleep if you're right in the airplane and then the SR9009 will kickstart your circadian rhythm right back on the proper time uh, when you arrive in the country of designation and destination so if if you were going to do this mm. you wouldn't use diazepam because there are a whole class of benzos created just for this purpose their oh, really? name are the z, the z drugs yeah oh, like zolpidem those are actually short acting benzos turns out they're just like and i've done some uh, profiling of them the shortest acting one is like a half-life is an hour and a half Mm -hmm. The longest acting one, the half-life is like uh, three and a half hours. So the goal is to, but I don't like to modulate GABA receptors to sleep. I, I mean, if I was on an airplane, to be honest, I would take an antipsychotic. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't risk it. I would never take a GABA. I would never do this unless like it, unless my life, like this was a very important meeting. Yeah. Like, I would never do this for a flight or to sleep. No, never, never. Yeah. But anyway, so, because I wouldn't want to downregulate my receptors just to sleep, you know, I, that's not worth it. But so the neuroplasticity, I mentioned see a lower dose than you, titrate up to 50 milligrams of fluvoxamine before bed, if genetics allow for it. What do I mean? Genetics allow for it. Check your BDNF. And Derek and I will have products coming out to do. You could check this yourself, but check your BDNF polymorphism in your genetics and check your serotonin transporter, whether it's a short or long transporter. And whether you have a val the val met polymorphism on BDNF. If you have the right polymorphisms, fluvoxamine and other SSRIs will work for you. If you don't, they won't. And amitriptyline here, which binds directly, that's the next point, uh, 6B, binds directly to the receptors for brain-derived neurotrophic factor and nerve growth factor. So that's, that's going to work no matter what for you. So I mentioned those. Now, why didn't I go further with the neuroplasticity? Steve's idea was smart. If, he, if the person required more, I would I would rather not raise the doses of the SSRIs there and add cerebral in. I would rather do that person. I agree with him. Then moving on to neuroinflammation, I mentioned I, I think naltrexone is it's becoming a drug that almost like a lot of people need to take. It particularly reduces inflammation in the brain, 
And that's why I'm interested in it for this person. Inflammation in the brain causes brain fog. Like Steve was mentioning earlier, when you go work out and you have the, and, and growth factors in the brain sometimes can re reduce inflammation. So mm. he, this is the stack that I personally use. So I, I fast for most of the day. I still do. And three times a day in the daytime, I take a bunch of vitamins or, or supplements that are not, that I don't need to eat to take. So I take, uh, about a gram and a half of butyric acid. Uh, that is an HDAC inhibitor. It's a short chain fatty acid that can change your genetics as well as potently reduces inflammation in the brain and the liver. Um, then I take uh, three grams of EPA or so, two to three, and then I take a gram of NAC. And by the way, the doses here are important. These are the right doses, not the wrong ones. And then 500 milligrams of Tatka. I take these three times a day. I actually take a couple more things, but I boil this down to what I think are the most useful parts for the brain. And I bet this will have a significant effect on the person's um, uh, ability to think from the top down, conceptualize, and have uh, clarity of thinking. So circadian rhythms, I mentioned two to three units of growth hormone before bed. If the person doesn't care about their longevity, I believe that this is performance enhancing. <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 I tell you, Steve, this, I was doing it from my finger, but it's great. It's, it's awesome. You sleep nice. You have less anxiety. It's, it's very beautiful. I like, I like, you know, if you're, if you're not trying to live forever, that would be performance enhancing. I mentioned the short release melatonin. You know, you guys know I take 40 milligrams myself. That's not a good idea for you if you want to have a very wakeful life in the daytime because melatonin is really made in such small amounts in your body and you're going to have a tiny amount of it left over in the morning despite the half-life and that's going to be enough to turn your thyroid and your steroidogenesis off. So you probably don't want that. So, um, the I want to, want to interject uh, comparing the growth hormone to the mel uh, melatonin. So... I was building my way up to the melatonin and now I'm at 21 milligrams before bed, right? So to, to experiment with that. And I discontinued the growth hormone a long time ago. I felt more sleepy and less productive on two units of growth hormone compared to 21 milligrams of melatonin. And I started yeah. the melatonin at this dose before I introduced the C-Max and all that stuff. So we can discount uh, those effects. So that's just something of yeah, note. So what I personally experienced, even though that my melatonin dose is obscene, right? 21 milligrams before bed every day. Wait, I've, if anyone's wondering why we're doing that, check out my melatonin video. Yeah, right. It's a very good video. That's inspired me a while. No, it's just because yeah, explain, right, that's yeah. the reason why I started bumping up the dose with three milligrams every week. Right? No, because uh, someone's going to tell us we're idiots. Yeah, yeah, of course. Know yeah, we're but we're all idiots for experimenting <laughs> yeah. this much at sake. You know? But um, that's interesting. Too. I mean, that points to the fact that the growth hormone really has a serious effect on the nervous system. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, a, it's a, almost a depressant, I would say. Yeah. And you just sit there, like sometimes just part of the. Like, oh. And I met a couple pros, and they're on, you know, 12 units or something. They're just narcoleptic, you know? Yeah, some people with like, for example, when we talk about like ghrelin receptor agonism with MK or using this or that to like, you know, optimize certain muscle building properties, like you have to factor in too, if you're too tired to like even work out or like eat your meals, like you're better off without a drug potentially in some yeah. scenarios. Like I remember I was a lazy motherfucker on MK. So like, even if it's making me more, you know, optimized from a growth factor production standpoint in a more like harmoniously endogenously like balanced aspect if i'm like lethargic as fuck you know yeah probably not ideal so, for so some of this stuff is a like, context dependent obviously yeah so for my my personal experience uh after 10 years of uh, growth hormone use predominantly pharmaceutical grade um I'm, I'm way more productive without the gh just less full wow. and i sleep less deep but i sleep deeper on the melatonin by the way, for the audience listening, this is like stuff we never knew. When Steve and I were in our 20s, we didn't know growth hormone had any psych psychological effects. As, as much as you can afford, right, Leo? Yeah, yeah. But also, <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't think it had any effect, bro. We just thought our fingers got thick. But it turns out, because I was looking at these bodybuilders, and I'm like, man, it seems like the bigger they are, the more they have this kind of relaxed vibe. And then I started taking growth hormone for my finger, and now I'm like very aware of how I, you know, my mind's working. It's like, wait a minute, I feel more relaxed. So I started Googling. I look into Google Scholar for a little while, and what do I find? Growth hormone reduces sympathetic innervation. Yeah. So anyway, that was pretty cool. But it's not good so, for productivity, um, you know. So if you want to feel relaxed, there's plenty on this list that will uh, get the job done. But for for cosmetic longevity purposes, right? Better skin, a little bit better hair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Then yeah, growth hormone highly beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the short term, especially, it just it creates a look in the body that nothing can replace. You no, know, right. It, it looks. Awesome. 
Yeah. Right. So I mentioned SR9009 injections upon rising when traveling because genuinely this is one of the, uh, I think one of the harms. Uh, if this guy is an entrepreneur traveling around the world, one of the worst parts of his job is the fact that he has horrible circadian rhythms because he travels a lot. So the one thing shown about the SR9009 studies is that they really do fix the damage that um, messed up circadian rhythms can have on you. And then um, I mentioned Speaking here, of which, SR is not a fat burner. Which oh, I, thank God you mentioned. I that. don't know why people always they think because SARMs companies sell it. They're like, oh, this is like a great drug to be using for like fat loss. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? I'll are tell you why. Bro. The, the, SARM, the SARM companies came across like I think there was one or two studies that showed that if you're sleep deprived, yeah, and you take SR9009, your metabolism is better. So these yeah. guys didn't read the whole thing, and they're like, "Hey, fat loss drug." And now I get consultations all the time from people like, "Hey, I'm I'm, I'm gonna tr try to lose some fat. Got some SR9009 on hand. Gonna use this. See how much I lose." I'm like, "What are you doing? They're just waking <laughs> yourself up." No, well, who it, told you this? <laughs> but it does help with the RIF ERB uh, expression and, and metabolism of protein, carbs, and fats. So if you combine yeah, it but with, I mean, with you're not calorie lose deficit. Them. No, of course not. But it's just it's not, a, it's not T3 or some no, like no, 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 Absolutely not. But it's just a method to optimize your fat loss. So yeah. like you can take Optim a No, but only if your circadian rhythm is wrong. If your circadian rhythm is, is right, because uh, Steve, yeah. what they don't mention in the studies, the SR9009 was injected in the middle of the rat's sleeping period. Oh, really? Okay. And they, yeah, the, yeah, all of the studies, the rats were woken up in the middle of the night, uh -huh. given a surgery, and if they, and or whatever, given whatever intervention, and it was in the middle of their night. Mm -hmm. So they compared in the middle of the night, you're sleepy, versus the middle of the night, you took SR9009. Mm -hmm. How did it impact? Oh, now I feel so stupid that's for, what they for were taking doing. it. <laughs> Yeah, sneaky. So I, I looked through the studies. I was like, wait a minute. They're all in the middle of the right the rat sleep. Okay, so real quick, just finishing off. I mentioned 30 minutes of aerobic exercise uh, of um, uh, average heart rate followed by 20 minutes of a uh, finished sauna. For me, that was the most efficient way to get that GABA, that endorphins, neurogenesis, all that stuff, as well as be healthy. I think this is very valuable. If I could change anything here, I would make it in the morning. I thought, you know, finish the sauna at night helps you sleep, but honestly, that would be better in the morning. I think Steve did great there. The diet, I said, uh, uh, re time restricted eating again. Reason for that because if you try a keto so the, your brain is going to function best if you're on a ketogenic diet but ketogenic diets are slightly unhealthy because there's valuable foods that you can't eat when you're on a completely ketogenic diet personally i've noticed that fat adaptation is seems to be a spectrum if you can control in my experience your your eating to a number of hours a day and then you have a lot of hours of fasting after before the next day you'll often feel the kind of clarity of thinking that you get on a ketogenic diet by the next day, as long as you don't eat enough carbs. Like sometimes if I go really crazy with the chickpeas and lentils or whatever and berries, the next day I have a little bit of brain fog. But if I'm careful and I just, like here I said, vegetables, cruciferous and allium, the limited fruits, lemons, walnuts, pecans, if you limit it a bit and be uh, careful, you can still get that kind of clarity of thinking. I mentioned high protein there, um, mainly because of its effects on growth factors in the body and energy and so on. I wouldn't do that for longevity. And then I mentioned spirituality. Basically, I believe that most people can be far more productive if they have a regular uh, spiritual intervention during the day. Like e either they're meditating or praying daily. So I think that's a good review. Yeah, and obviously people are going to be like, Derek, where's your protocol? But I've had a busy fucking few days and <laughs> I didn't end up being able to break one. I, th I was hoping I could just give my insight as you guys went through yours because I didn't actually have time to prepare one, unfortunately, with some of the stuff going on in the past few days. But like I'm pretty you know, aligned with your guys' views on things. Like there's not much I would change other than, you know, for for me from like a cholinergic standpoint, like CDP choline, for example, I think is only like 18% choline by weight. So I might prioritize alpha GPC a bit more than you would like to i imagine would be one thing um it's not it's it, 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 that sounds uh odd cdp uh, choline is 18 percent choline by weight and alpha gpc is 50. so you're getting more absorbable choline through the blood brain barrier with alpha gpc no of course that's for sure with alpha gpc but the problem is you have an acute effect so so if you're i guess if you don't want choline in your I guess you're going to store, 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 like you're going to store the alpha GPC choline eventually in your choline reserves. Cause for the audience that doesn't realize choline is a vitamin. If you don't have choline, you get fatty liver disease. Yeah. So you need choline anyway. But the, I guess like you're getting it in your brain and then whatever remains is just being stored. Like so all the study, way. all the literature I've seen supports alpha GPC as a better alternative, not only from a force production aspect, but from a cognitive outcome aspect. And it seems like 
even individuals like Rhonda Patrick seem to reinforce this, however credible you want to say she is. Wait, 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 let's not go too far there. So, so <laughs> city choline, which is CDP choline, is the yeah. most used choline in the medical community. Most of the studies on choline, injectable choline, use city choline, CDP choline, the same one I'm using. It is the second most absorbable form of choline or the third. I don't, know I don't know the amount of choline in the molecule, but its absorbability is the, the second highest. Second, uh, or uh, that's why I switched from phos phosphatidylcholine. Now, I don't know what Rhonda Patrick knows about choline or alpha GPC, but that's a side, side note. She's not that into the, the, the brain stuff, maybe. But anyway, the point is... Um, Maybe, maybe it's molecular weight choline. I don't, I don't know because I don't know much about chemistry, but its absorbability is among the top three of, of all forms of choline. But the reason why, I, but the reason why I don't use alpha GPC is that idea. I just want like, I could, you could use phosphatidylcholine, but the idea is like, oh, I have enough choline in my diet and then I release it. You know, that does my thought process. So I have it like stored, but I guess if you use alpha GPC, you also store whatever you don't use, right? So it's mm -hmm. the same. It's, I guess both both are true. But for me, if I use a lot of alpha GPC, I get like a sudden amount. Like if I use three hundred to four hundred milligrams, I get acute anxiety. I can't mm -hmm. use that much that quickly. Okay, I'd space so, yeah, out I my uh, Gorilla Mind Rush. You know, multiple servings per day when ne as needed, or I'm um, um, smooth, and then yeah. it gets the job done. Also, right? well, one tablet here, one tablet there, kind of keep serum serum concentrations. Should have put that in mm -hmm. there. But that's what I do. You know, you get a bottle over there and just once in a while you dose one tablet yeah, instead of three at a time. I dose one. Yeah. As far as the literature on choline requirements, like you mentioned how 550 is like standard recommended intake. The studies seem to imply that like there is some comparison showing like high dose versus the, you know, RDA. And they found that 2200 per day protected against the DNA damage that otherwise occurred in people consuming only 550. So like for wow. it, for me, that was enough to be like, especially with my MTHFR polymorphism, I'm like, okay, this is more than enough literature to support me supplementing with, you know, betaine on a daily basis, creatine, um, alpha GPC, as well as having a diet that has at least an ounce of beef liver per day. I would love to have raw eggs or not raw eggs. Like I would love to have eggs on a daily basis. I'm just looking at like a chart I created oh, as like a graphical just... representation of choline by breakdown. Yeah, you get a decent amount of calling from the diet that way. Yeah. Yeah. So I try to get the majority from my diet for the most part, but then I supplement with alpha GPC on a pretty much daily basis. And then I have betaine as well as creatine pretty regularly. Um, but other than that, dude, like, oh, I think there's some, uh, by the way, I don't know if you guys have seen this. This is kind of an interesting graph I created a while ago. It might be, a, it's like milligram of choline density per 100 grams of food. And you can see like oh, the yeah. best food sources yeah yeah so like well, is, I, is an ounce 30 grams so it is right yeah an ounce is around 30 i think it's like 28 yeah, or yeah something. it's about three grams per uh, three ounces well, i per take an ounce of, of uh, liver a day also yeah. yeah yeah so so for me i don't know like pretty much everything that you guys broke down seems like on point for me like the only thing i might think about adding to is appetite management like for some people there it's hard for them to focus when they're fasting for that long maybe that won't be the case if they're like more fat mm -hmm. adapted mm -hmm. from like actually having a high quality like exercise regimen as well as diet as well as everything in place perfectly then maybe they won't need it but i would think something like like obviously you can't use amphetamine or anything like that on a daily basis anyway so i was thinking like an intermittent like cycling of one day like a glutide, then the next day like the stimulant that you rely on not yeah. only for <laughs> For motivation, focus, skill acquisition, potentially, et cetera, but also appetite suppression indirectly that helps you adhere to that like time restricted eating window. And then on the opposite day where you're off the stimulants, you lose like an acute GLP one that's in and out of your system like fast. Right. Um, and then I don't know, like the sex drive thing, obviously it's going to be context dependent on what you use for like SSRI potentially, or, you know, the dosage of the androgen use or the choice of androgen use. Like I know some people use DECA, not even for hair loss, but for like keeping their sex drive, like in the gutter. Yeah. So I don't know, obviously it's all context dependent, but pretty much all this stuff is pretty, uh, pretty in line yeah. with, yeah, you move you know, to Thailand, you get a secretary, um, deal with it that way. Yeah. yeah. Derek, how, there's, how there's do you, uh, oh, it's Speaking of seconds, that's funny. <laughs> I was just, uh, you know, I had, uh, maybe I'll tell you guys this story offline. It's too, it's, it's funny about second days. But anyway, <laughs> I wanted to ask you something, Derek. Um, why do you think donapazil is an underused PED for athletes? 
Um, that you, is the the pharma. Uh, yeah, yeah, like acetylcholesterol inhibitors. inhibitors in general. Yeah, potentially. Because I know you're you're into choline for for muscular contraction and stuff. Like yeah, that. so like the alpha GPC force production studies are obviously like very promising, and I do see people like it could be the difference between them hitting a PR versus not from like the ability to recruit motor units. Yeah. So mm -hmm. for me, I would imagine acetylcholinesterase inhibition with something like as potent as possible, especially for like a strength athlete, could be pretty like important for sure. So I imagine it could be worth exploring. Absolutely. I don't know how much more potent denapazil is than, you know, high dose ginkgo plus who pairs in, but let me describe it to you. Uh, well, okay. you, you don't use like, you don't use, you've never used a nicotine pouch or anything, right? I've used nicotine like here and there, but nothing. So like, like, I haven't, go ahead. If you can imagine it. Like if you ever used nicotine before in some kind of way, the same dose of what you used before, like if you were, had a nicotine pouch in, like I use snooze, so I put snooze in my mouth. So if I use five milligrams of donapazil, uh, you know, you shouldn't notice the tobacco being affected, but like I'll notice my brain's a bit more clear and stuff. But I, by the time I get to 10 milligrams of donapazil, I can't keep the snooze in my mouth for as long. Like I put it in my mouth, it starts being overwhelming. I start to feel like psych psychiatric yeah. effects from the nicotine and wow. I have to throw it out. And if I get to 20, bro, I can no longer use snooze. I just can't use it. I have to skip for a few days. By the way, There's nicotine, power. something that was off your guys' list, but I imagine you guys would probably both be, you know, yeah. not opposed to exploring that for mm -hmm. its, it has like brain, it has like cognitive protectant effects in some capacities, but it's also like not, it doesn't seem to be as stimulatory. Like it seems to be one of the only things you could use closer to your sleeping window that doesn't like fuck with your sleep as much. Is like an actual stimulant. It's a problem. It's the addictive uh, issues. Yeah, but you know. some people who aren't prone to addiction from it might be able to leverage like a one to two milligram like gum or something, maybe once in a while. Mm -hmm. Well, well speaking from experience, I used to be a smoker for years. I use the the snooze now. I could take yeah. it or leave it, Steve. Like okay. I just said, if I take the donapazil too high, I forget about it for a couple of days. I don't okay. use it. Okay. But it's when it's the smoking is a lot of addiction. People who smoke that go blind, they quit. They don't mm. keep smoking. It's a lot of it is that action and the visuality. But about the the nicotine, you know what's most interesting about it? The uh, the re receptors for nicotine upregulate uh, in response to agonism. Uh, mm. So yeah. it's not a yeah. So it's it's an interesting process. It's a good so, appetite suppressant, also. Yeah, that too, which also it adheres you to your fasting window, which ultimately keeps your brain sharper for longer, which ultimately is downstream yeah. leads to better quality work and reduces like, for me, the most powerful. Power. The most powerful thing I think on the whole, th the whole explanation is um, making sure your hormones are where they should be at least at like a baseline level and then staving off hunger and like staying in that like fasted window where you're mentally sharp as hell like that to me trumps like even if I if I ate like a really shitty meal, it's full of carbs and like bad, just bad food, even if I took like a fuck ton of Adderall after my cognitive state for work would be far worse than if I was just fasted on nothing. Yeah, so, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you guys understand those people that like sometimes I have a consultation and the person will say, uh, I, I like to eat a meal before I start working. I'm like, what? No. Like if work? they have like blood sugar regulation issues, maybe I might understand. I'm always like, are you completely sure? Have you really paid yeah. attention? Maybe you like the meal, but there's no way getting that blood. I know through. some people. I know some people who like they can't function without like a good breakfast. Like my yeah. girlfriend, for example, she needs like a good breakfast. And to me, like she's she's metabolically healthy and everything. And she's lean. And I'm like, really? Like I would <laughs> not eat for as physically long as possible. And once I eat, my cognitive state is like at best, like 70 percent of what it was prior. Like if Ooh. I'm lucky. It's it's uh, it's Monday over there, right? It's Tuesday for me. So who ate so far? It's three o'clock it in the afternoon fun. here. It I ate because it's like twelve forty-five. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So I'm yeah. still fast. I haven't eaten. No, you I haven't eaten. Right? I know you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, I like. I can't eat before I work. I, yeah. I usually like if I work out in the morning. Okay, I have a post-workout meal. But if I work out in the evening, I usually eat after recording videos. That's my most productive period of the day. It's highly counterproductive for anabolism, but. Luckily, I have muscle memory to rely on, and I've built all the size yeah. that I need, so I, I can you know, circumvent that whole uh, issue that way. But yeah, and no, it, that's an entrepreneurial trade-off for sure, though, because some people are gonna try; they're gonna definitely take the ROI of like eating for yeah. the anabolism component, even if they become 
even if you're slightly smaller, you're getting like a different quality level and sustainability and duration of work done potentially yeah. than the guy who smashes himself with a hundred grams of carbs that are like fast digesting plus this, plus that, you know, and then tries to go sit on a computer after, after going to failure, like on however many top sets, yeah. smashing a giant post-workout meal, and then trying to sit down and like handle clients or like film videos, like good. To me, I'd be fucked trying to do that. No, for sure. And I think that eating is also a stress uh, coping mechanism for a lot of people. Right? I mean, business is stressful, uh, especially when you're self-employed and you don't have, or so, I don't have so much staff to deal with everything. A lot of people just tend to eat as a, as a method to deal with all the stress, like, oh, and some people like to smoke to deal with it and some people like to eat and, and that lowers your productivity so i think some of the things that we discussed like ssris and, and samax and cerebral lysine and all that stuff and, and a ketogenic diet i think if you persist through that for a month yeah. you will be able to resolve so much of the stress like i i'm basically stress-free and i'm surprised you know yeah when once you integrate them then you start to notice why oh, i had all these uh emotions affecting my daily yeah. life that i wasn't aware of right, right. Yeah, the, yeah. You, you base, that's why I mentioned in those videos that it feels like I've been healing my brain with these kinds of practices because it's such a profound difference that now I'm like, yeah, I can deal with anything. Exactly, uh, yeah, yeah and it, it takes a while before you get to that point. But of course, not everybody's going to experience that because not everybody's self-employed. Right? And yeah, even, the, even the entrepreneurs, if you have 400 staff and uh, you know uh, legislation and all this, this shit going on in the background, how much stress can you really uh, reduce? You know, it depends on which m market you're in. Now, now, Steve, let's. Uh, I think we we've already done four hours. We didn't really go through many of the. Uh, oh no, yeah, I can't believe how quick time flies when we talk. <laughs> it's like it feels like you're talking about like four topics or something. Yeah, yeah we did. We talked like five topics. So your, your editors I, are geniuses. So they'll they'll be able to clip this. I uh, thought this. maybe we could just end real quick. Maybe we could just talk about the oxytocin nasal. Uh, no, that's that's not interesting. I think we should talk about relationships. That that should be the last topic. Relationship. Oxytocin nasal spray, I can, even though it's interesting to us, it guarantees going to get. Like, yeah, it's going to, it's going to take. Oh, really? So let, let yeah. me go to the bathroom real quick and then we should finish up on uh, relationships and supportive partners. Ah, I think the Empagliflozin, Empagliflozin is getting to you, huh? <laughs> yeah, I've been experimenting. No, I've experimented with here and there, but I, uh, I'm not, oh, okay. I just like, I, I had a refeed this weekend. So I'm a water buffalo and then Tuesday it goes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll be right back. Hmm. <laughs> On that topic, Derek, yeah, I've come to the the, the realization that um, you know, canagliflozin has far better health profiles than empagliflozin. Oh, really? Yeah. For those that that are uh, just listening, uh, there are these drugs called GL uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, and they they inhibit with different prefer um, selectivity SGLT2 over SGLT1. The empagliflozin, the drug I've been using for a long time, uh, is particularly uh, selective of SGLT2. Um, it was thought originally when they designed these, they really wanted them to be selective. But it mm. turns out a lot of these very interesting studies now show that cardiovascular protective effects from SGLT1 inhibition. So, for example, SGLT1 appears to be upregulated in the left ventricle of people with heart failure. And blocking it directly seems very valuable. So there's a lot of studies now showing cardiovascular protective effects from specifically canagliflozin or depagliflozin, but not empagliflozin. Mm -hmm. Or uh, more, in more interestingly, there are new papers from the last two years um, proposing that SGLT2 inhibitors be considered and be repurposed as anti-cancer drugs. Because so if you were to, if you were to pro anti cancer effects. If you were to propose like the most heavy hitting and like when we last time we did a bodybuilder ancillaries video, it was like an hour. If yeah, I wanted to, to add the, if that you list, were to yeah. summer, if you were to summarize like that hour long video into like just the compounds themselves, the SL SGLT two inhibitor that you just mentioned, what what was it called again? Anagliflozin. Now, yeah. would you put that in your top five for like? ancillaries like presumably you'd have something like for a bodybuilder you'd have an arb i would think you would have something to manage lipids like azetamide presumably um above and beyond that i don't know if you put a beta blocker in the top five potentially yeah, for you know high level androgenic signaling psychoactive effects stress etc then you'd put sglt2 or what would be like the next so, couple like things so 
the way I think of it is first we look at cardiovascular effects. Mm -hmm. The left ventricle is enlarged because of heart rate. So there's a beta blocker. Probably, honestly, it would be nabivolol. Nabivolol, I found the most substantially important. And it's long acting and it's reliable. And I, I, because even if you inhibit the heart rate after the workout with a short acting drug, like I was thinking, I don't think it's enough for bodybuilders. They need the long. And then plus, so plus it's thing. so selective that it doesn't lower exercise performance. And most people notice that exercise performance actually goes up. Because it, it I know. Yeah. It improves. So the, yeah. And, the, and the pumps, the pumps are yeah. crazy. Okay. Oh, yeah. But anyway, so, so, so beta blocker. And then uh, what uh, other thing enlarges the heart? It's pressure. So blood pressure medication, either ACE inhibitor or ARB. I would pre prefer an ARB. And then one of the other effects is your LDL cholesterol rises by about 50%. HDL lowers by about 30%. So first thing is 10 milligrams of zetamide. See if your LDL goes to 80. If it doesn't, consider 5 milligrams of suvastatin, a kind of statin, once or twice a week. Wait to see if your LDL goes to 80. It might. If it doesn't, then maybe use a higher dose. Or, by the way, instead of resuvastatin, the other great statin is called pitavastatin. Two milligrams is a starting dose. Two, uh, pitavastatin not associated with insulin resistance. Resuvastatin is, but resuvastatin doesn't pass the blood-brain barrier. So it leaves your brain more intact. So those are the, the cardiovascular effects. And then in terms of uh, diabetic medications, the reason why we're talking about SGLT2 inhibitors, they're particularly kidney protective. They're the only kidney protective medication known to man other than blood pressure medications. So, and they're potently kidney protective. And so out of those, canagliflozin is the most powerful. Uh, I would potentially start with empagliflozin until someone gets used to it because you'll pee like a racehorse for the first couple of weeks. It's really <laughs> weird. You pee like with a heavy pee. It's a weird kind of pee. And it, you know, but anyway, it's then like fasting. You, move, like, you keep pooping, but it's uh, you didn't even eat. But it's it's your detoxing, yeah, yeah. detoxing. All no, but that, where's this coming but that's from? An, <laughs> another valuable part, though, Steve, if you think about it, because that diuretic effect is going to be very useful for a bodybuilder. Yeah. So anyway, so canagliflozin or empagliflozin. That's canagliflozin, three hundred milligrams. Uh, empagliflozin, twenty-five milligrams. I just switched over to canag. But then there, you know, the, there's the GLP one agonist I mentioned earlier. Uh, the thyroid medication we mentioned earlier, those things may be protective as well in, in, in some way. Yeah. But those the basic list is ARB, uh, beta blocker, so for blood pressure, ARB, beta blocker for heart rate, uh, maybe an SSRI for your brain because you're going to work specifically yeah. against serotonin mm -hmm. with androgens. And then, um, and then uh, for sure, empagliflozin or canagliflozin. Yeah, and that's just the, the SSRI is just not to turn into a dickhead because many, many guys in high dosages of androgens, they kind of go off the deep end, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to think. Is there something else I take? I take a lot of things, though. I take, I take, yeah. uh, I take a, a Zetamib. Well, I know that's most of the the list. Yeah, yeah, a Zetamib and the and the statin also. Yeah, and maybe statin. maybe 100 micrograms T4. You know, just uh, as yeah, a first step. Yeah, as a first step. So I'm on Nabivolol, Ezetimib, uh, Ezetimib, Telmasarta, and, and the T4. Right? You guys are both on metformin now too. Yeah, once, yeah. A, one, once in a while, yeah. Yeah, he's so you're taking metformin once a week, then, Steve? Yeah, so 500 to 1000 uh, milligrams uh, metformin XR extended release yeah. before bed after a cheat meal just to get some insulin sensitivity, uh, dispose some of the glucose uh, because I always eat too much on Sunday. I'll be honest. Yeah, just for anyone who's listening to this, <laughs> and who's, some people may be listening, they say, Hey, it's not a glucose disposal agent. Metformin acutely improves liver function. Acutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're having a high stress event on your liver, like a cheat meal, mm -hmm. it, I really think it would be beneficial. No, I, no. When I started going back to the gym, I thought, hey, this lactic acid buildup is going to prevent me from being able to gain my strength back. Um, I thought so. I gained a lot, of, not all my strength. I gained a little bit of my strength back. I feel okay now. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll start using it again. No change in performance. In fact, I... Uh, yeah, no zero change. In fact, I didn't go to the gym for a week in between these two weeks. So like it's been really three weeks. I started taking metformin, went to the gym a week later, having not trained for a while, hit the same exact reps and sets on everything. Okay. And I was on two grams of metformin and it was oh. a week later. I should have been weaker, to be honest. I noticed it when I was like at peak performance on the, on the, a year ago, right? And running a, a cycle and high calories. And if I were to take 500 milligrams of metformin, either uh, sustained release or, or immediate release, the next day my workout would be um impaired but now yeah. i don't notice it anymore but maybe it's because i'm not at peak strength so i that's think that's what i'm thinking about myself yeah. too i'm not as yeah exactly i'm just Who not knows? as anyway. like I'm, I'm i'm 80 percent now at peak strength or 85 depending on the exercise so now i don't notice it but back then i was like man the next day i'm like why is this last rep not going you know yeah, but now, but people may say, like, for example, oh, there's no point taking metformin because you're taking growth and whatever. Again, the liver, 
Metformin's main effects are on the liver. And recently I've been obsessing about liver cancer. God damn, metformin sensitizes your liver to anything that harms liver cancers. Mm -hmm. Anything. It's so prolific. It's so good for the health of the liver. It's really better for your liver than anything else. It's just nobody's focused on the liver. I'm, I'm two years. A liver yeah, I'm two years away from adding it in daily. Yeah. Doesn't it, it raise SHBG too? Or am I wrong? I forgot. Or is that, that is that indirect from lowering IGF one? Or improving the health of the liver? Well, yeah, indirect yeah. from that, I guess. Maybe. Yeah. Anyway, but I use it by the way every day. So. Okay. Oh, do you really? How much do you take? Yeah. Uh, one thousand milligrams of XR. Okay. You're not. Uh, you. I'm not sure that two is better, but I think one point five is better on most people. Okay. I'm not sure that two. I think is. some of the study shows like one point five XR. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so anyway, brothers, it was so good to talk to you guys. We always chat no, on no, text. No, and no, no relationship talk? Der Derek sends me nine-minute voice note. I don't see his picture, though, so it's it's very different when we talk here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but good if you guys want to do that other subsection that was left. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I got time, dude, so might as well. But by the way, guys, how has it changed my life learning that WhatsApp, you can play the voice notes at two times as Oh, time? my God. Dude, <laughs> what a change, huh? Yeah. I, don't, I don't feel as bad sending voice notes to you guys now. I'm like, oh, they can. No, they can no just... way better. Yeah, it helps a lot. I feel yeah. bad if I see somebody write an essay. I'm like, wow, that was like a 20-minute like time he definitely took to write that at least versus a voice note you can do. You can do like an hour of writing, like five minutes with a voice note. No, it goes way faster. Yeah, yeah. it's just so annoying when you're in public and then I don't bring this uh, thing, you know? And I'm like, oh, shit, yeah. I got to save this. I know I need to reply to this now, but I can't in public, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. But it's yeah. nice also because you get the tone of voice of the person and so on. But anyway, it's good oh, yeah. to see you guys in person. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Now, Steve, that's a, that thing behind you. We'll talk about the next section. But what is that thing? Behind? Is it attached to the wall or is it this? like a stand up? Yeah, yeah. This is not, so this, uh, I made the studio in the third room and then I had some of yeah. these panels left. So I have like literally within frame is uh, the leftover panels. So it looks consistent. Nice. Yeah, thank you. It's, uh, it looks consistent with the studio, but that is a little bit more cumbersome. But I'm probably going to have to soundproof it um, because the construction around my house is uh, uh, annoying as fuck. I forgot to ask you. You guys so don't hear anything there. right now, right? Because no. I'm paying these oh. guys $30 per hour not to work. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm serious. I'm serious. So wow. this day is going to cost me like $300. <laughs> so they don't. Yeah, I have to do it because otherwise it will be like this the whole so day. For the for the audience, uh, Steve has construction by his house and a very interesting event. The construction workers brought dogs with them and chickens. Dogs, chickens, and <laughs> which kids. So I've never first heard. I moved in, I'm like, what the hell is this? It's like a farm, you know? Like, <laughs> like, like, like And these, these Thai chickens, they're like a meter high. They're, 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 they're tall as, f and they, they, you know, I, I don't even know that they, they make noise. I don't know what the English word is. Um, <laughs> Kuku So, but yeah. multiple times per day and loud as fuck. Wow. So They're I get, roosters. yeah, roosters, right? And then a couple uh, females. So I already told them, said, listen, I, I record YouTube from home. You guys are familiar with YouTube. I record from that room. I'm going to soundproof it. Right? I understand you have construction going on for a year, but those chickens got to go. So they, they, <laughs> they, they built a little enclosure. Right? So there's a little enclosure there where they keep the chickens uh, most of the time and negotiated that I need two hours per day quiet. Uh, and then the rest of the time they're roaming free, but sometimes the dogs fight with dogs like at the other side of the street. And then that would definitely make you not procrastinate videos, knowing you have like a two hour block or else chickens are going to come out. No, but it also, be yeah, so my shit. at 12 o'clock on the, on the hour, I'm, I'm ready to record. And then sometimes you go over time for 30 minutes, right? Because I have a complicated subject or I can't pronounce words properly or a pee yeah. break or whatever. And then I, then you're on the clock and you get very nervous and start talking very, very fast. And then sort of, mm -hmm. you get this in, into the, this scenario. And then a couple of times I almost wanted to throw the camera out of my studio because, you know, to but the imagine, point. imagine the lifestyle to, that you lead where you take your chickens with you to work. Yeah. yeah. So, but so they're migrant <laughs> workers, right? So they live somewhere in the countryside and then they got a project in Bangkok and the whole family comes, they got a car, they made like a little enclosure, they got tents. Uh, oh, it, yeah, no, no, but it, like this is a third, sounds like LA almost, yeah, right. So it's like Skid Row, <laughs> we have right? that Skid Row. Um, yeah, no, not that, even Skid Row, that's, the main that's what it looks yeah. like, you know. But it, yeah, they're migrant workers and they just bring the you know, they bring the house and the farm, and and you know, that's their life. So they, they go from project to project, 
And I understand I have to make money also, but right today they're making way more money than they make over the course of a normal day because I told them that I, I got a I got a podcast that is important to myself and my uh, right co-host. So uh, you guys are not going to work today. Here's some money. So right. they're on the hour, yeah, a thousand baht an hour. So uh, yeah, I hope this gets me some subscribers. <laughs> yeah, everyone go subscribe to Steve and Leo right Thank now. Thank you, yeah. yeah. Steve especially for the yeah. chicken. But Link guys, in the description below, whichever clip. I, I is. forgot to mention one thing here, which I think, Derek, you were interested in. You, We've been talking about this idea why male bodybuilders tend to get uh, female children when they're... Oh, oh yeah. yeah, yeah, this is very important. <laughs> So I've been, I've been, but no, I brought it up because of the relationship things. So before we get into that, yeah. just so I, I did, I've been doing research on this for a long time, and there is a lot of conflicting evidence. So basically, a lot of empirical data examining the what they call the sex ratio. By the way, if you want to Google this, it's called the sex ratio. For God's sake, it's so hard to find when you don't know what it's called. Like if you search gender disparity, whatever, it's really hard. It's the sex ratio. But anyway, so this the sex ratio is when you look at them empirically. Some studies will find that they're that basically people who have brothers are more likely to have sons and people who have sisters are more likely to have daughters there is a recent 2018 very detailed quantitative meta-analysis that concludes otherwise so it's a little bit up in the air uh with that said historically because of this observation which has been found by the way generations ago probably because of this observation pe uh, scientists thought that there was likely a genetic polymorphism that determined so some gene they didn't know what gene it was and until recently in the 2000s they've been calling it the gene some gene that they don't know what it was but it has a disparity that produces the gender uh more, more likely to have females or males and in fact like they've done quantitative analyses where they can show there's some things switching on on and off but they can't find it in the genome well recently they did in 2016 i'm just going to list the numbers rs1819043 and rs1025513 those are for the nerds that are interested in uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms and genetics but those two snps were found significantly associated with the gender of the of the offspring that's one thing the second thing is why females and not males well there's a lot of interesting info about this but i recently discovered i didn't know this before that the y uh what are they called the y spermatozoa i don't know how they say the word spermatozoa but the y spermatozoa is far more fragile and susceptible to stress induced damage than the x spermatozoa across the board and interestingly now some people actually have more of one or the other and there's debates about even in our sperm, do we have equal amounts? We don't, but the Y are by far more vulnerable. So if you were in like um, environmental stress, oxidative stress, so on, you would likely lose the Y first. And I have research evidence of this. I'll make a video of it eventually when you guys, if, if anyone listening wants evidence of it. But I, I found this in various papers. There's a lot of evidence of that the Y spermatozoa are more fragile. Groundbreaking. So, so is this <laughs> No, no, no really? Say, when you say it's more fragile, does that so that means anabolics are like directly toxic to the fragility, or like what are we? Well, no, no. I'm uh, anabolic. We know that those guys are in highly inflammatory environments. So, like, they're if yeah. their liver values are over twenty, then they are inflamed. So, so, so that would be that's what I mean. Yeah. Speculated reason as to why a guy who is in a, a chronically inflamed state might end up with females more than males. Specifically, that the Y spermatozoa express yeah. co apoptotic uh genes uh pro apoptotic proteins that yeah. are more susceptible to be expressed than the y ones and the idea being like you have an antioxidant status of your of your actual semen and both in the semen and the seminal fluid before and also where the sperm is created there's antioxidants there uh if the oxidative stress is higher and damages the sperm the likelihood to have apoptosis is higher among the y than the x hmm. so it has nothing to do with the actual hormonal exposure now, itself no, no, it's more the that's oh, interesting too, though, right? Because there's a lot of, in, historically, there was a lot of predictions. So they used to notice that, that there was a prediction that larger men have more boys. Yeah. There, there was a lot of those things. There's, in war, men tend to have, for example, in a short war, uh, the population rate of births of males increases uh, or actually decreases in a short war. And in a long war, it increases. So there's a lot of weird things going on and people for a long time thought maybe like masculinity, masculine men would have more daughters and so on. But this by itself could explain the whole thing. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. So what can we do it, to I mean, protect? It's a full explanation. What can we do Please to protect crank the antioxidants and right. get off gear? 
I think the antioxidant status of your semen, which can be tested by the way at a urologist, would be a very good indicator of the health of them and also the DNA fragmentation among the sperm. But by the way, I should mention men who are older, and this is a good topic for us to discuss because you guys don't have children. I have children, you need to catch up. Men who are older, <laughs> men who are older, soon, soon. Have children with longer telomeres. Oh, okay. Surprisingly. And the reason it appears is because of telomerase's activity around their like sperm machinery it somehow leaves lasting effects on them um but otherwise older men have more dna fragmentation in their sperm yeah. and their sperm are more likely to have a multitude of diseases so if you have a guy who's on gear and he wants to have a kid what are you telling him to do are you telling him to get on hcg monotherapy and stay on that and get off all the exogenous androgens and then crank antioxidants or what are you telling him no, I actually just had a conversation with someone about this today. I don't think that you can reverse. Like, I think what I did was, so if you're on androgens, then you went totally off or you went on HCG, your total androgen load would be lower than you're used to. I yeah. think your epigenetic expression would then reflect a paucity of androgenic signaling. I don't want to transfer that epigenetic code to my son. I don't want him to be hypo androgenic, right? Mm -hmm. So my thought process would be rather, I would want to, keep some level of the same things going on, become extremely healthy and use the HCG and FSH and be healthy with that higher, relatively higher androgen load. I'm so not you'd stay on your blast. You no, no, I, I'd, I'd basically not go. I went off yeah. and then I used HCG. I'd basically never go off. I would use oh, like, so you just you'd go down to HCG plus FSH, but never come off is what you're saying. HCG plus FSH plus probably if I was blasting for years and I was a bodybuilder, I would probably try to stay a little bit higher. Like 400, 500 milligrams of oh, testosterone. Wow. I don't, I don't know, but like a 3,000 nanogram per deciliter or something. If he was at five, something mm -hmm. like that, because I don't mm -hmm. want his. My feeling is I may be uh, signaling to myself the opposite. Like you're a low androgen person because you just had a major change and you suddenly have a paucity of androgenic signal. Ah, right. That's going to have an effect on your epigenetics for sure. So okay. you can just go down to HCG, FSH, and just hold that for a while, and then like push the HCG and FSH higher, and then try. I think I think you I mean, that's basically what I did, right? I, I went uh, off and then I went on HCG and FSH and so on for for a period of time. Actually, then I went off that totally also. But my thought process is this. When you go off, you're going to have a signal to your body. I have very little androgens. All the androgen yeah. receptors down regularly and so on. Mm -hmm. Maybe you adapt to that level in a while. Yeah. I don't know how much you adapt. No, I was thinking, know, hypothetically, you go down to like baseline replacement of HCG plus FSH and then maybe you engage in all kinds of things that have to do with low androgen signaling. Like, I don't know, you go on a keto diet, you do fasting, you do this, you do that. And you become as like, I don't know, primed to then re be resensitized to like blow up. And then you go to a higher dose of HCG and FSH plus high food plus high, I don't know, whatever else could be anabolic and, you know, proliferative or whatever. And then you try for a kid. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's the advice I gave the person who asked me on it. It was a recent consultation a couple of days ago. He asked me the same thing. I told him to go off and then use the HCG and FSH and ramp back up. But I was like, to be honest, I don't really know. Yeah. Like, I, he wanted to stay on. He was in a rush. I was like, I don't really know if it will it takes, work. It takes and I time. Yeah. It takes I don't think time. you're really damaging yourself that much. I don't think you're getting DNA fragmentation from the steroids. And if you are, I doubt those DNA fragmented sperm are actually um whatever that's called fertilizing the egg like they're usually yeah. weird. It took yeah weird. i would i would think more bodybuilders would have like very very i don't know how to like i don't know disabled children would yes, be more yes, exactly. prevalent never had stuff. one not yeah. one ever exactly that was my that's what i said to me we have no evidence of this ever happening no. i mean obviously dna fragmentation could do small things like metabolic conditions and stuff but if it was something significant we would see it I think it would result in miscarriages more than than actually children born with right uh, medical issues. So it, so we can take myself as an example. It took me about eight well eight months to restore my fertility to like very good parameters, right? With, where the semen count is very high and the morphology is reasonably normal. And in the beginning, I had like weird uh, shapes of the semen, and it took a couple of months to resolve. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, same, by the way. Yeah. six to eight months was my yeah portion. so so i think the next time i come off i'll just forego the pct completely and just stay on acg and fsh for a couple yeah. months and then uh and then we'll see how fast my fertility comes back with all the antioxidants and the isognet testicles and all that silly uh right um uh, old housewives uh, protocols to uh 
I had marginally improved fertility, but it did work. I had 180 million per milliliter, baby. At the end. No, but keep in, mind, <laughs> keep in mind for the audience, if you guys are interested in using what these are called assisted reproductive technologies mm -hmm. like Clomid and these things, keep in mind that the ones used for the women in particular are associated with worse health in mm -hmm. the babies eventually, and that the health of the babies um, associates with the level of assisted reproductive technology. So IVF is yeah. very bad. Mm -hmm. uh, the level above IBF, which is uh, there's a there's some other level or below it, there's some other similar thing similar to that. If you're just using Clomid or luteinizing hormone for the woman on four or five days of the year of the month, mm -hmm. it's much less associated with it. So it's the level of intervention. Yeah. The more you intervene, the, basically, if you want to go and put the, the embryo in the egg and put it in her, that is the least healthy way to have a baby possible. And I, I think Are it's you... also like health, health at the start of uh, of, the, of the parents because like health. That's the confusing a, thing. Being being in a good state of health usually represent is represented in fertility, right? When you're perfectly healthy, okay. fertility is usually good. But if you're not healthy, your fertility is impaired, and you start using fertility drugs, then you're probably not healthy during the pregnancy either, which is going to affect the health of the baby. Now, this, this is the most interesting aspect. So, uh, by the way, this touches on to why people say, like, having higher testosterone levels is more healthy. No, it's an indicator of a guy that is healthy. He mm. has high test levels because his balls aren't yeah, destroyed. Right. But, <laughs> but, in the, but in the same case here, uh, that's very much true. So they try to weed, uh, boil it down in the papers. This is a very big question. Is it that parents can't have children because they're unhealthy and therefore their children are unhealthy? Or is it the assisted reproductive technology? And yeah. it seems very certain it's the assisted reproductive oh, technology really? partially. Partially. Yeah, okay. They're both contributing, but there's something there. They can't put their finger on it, but it has to do with the technology. So are you going to be trying for a boy with assisted technologies regardless? Exactly. exactly. Are, you, are you going to though? Yes, exactly. Which is why I'm studying it so much, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. trying to understand like to how is it going to influence? And just for the audience to understand, the reason why I wanted to do that is because I had a girl first and I'm concerned that if this, I usually say this in a funny way, but yeah, I think if you have too many, it's one guy in the house, I might become a day. I don't know. It happens in certain <laughs> families. If there's, if there's five women in the house, some guy turns it. A, no, I don't no, wanna, no, no. The key here is not to give them the opportunity for plastic surgery. Yeah, that's the no, key. but, but so anyway. don't, uh, right. Well, that's what happened with the Jenners, right? So all the daughters do plastic surgery and then the dad wants some surgery. And then the dad joins <laughs> And he then takes it way to the next level. Like he wants to do the surgery for all the girls. No, but I, all just aside, I, I love women, of course, and I, I really love my daughter and my wife. But what I wanted was just to have some mixture of gender in the house. And I was thinking, if I have another child, it's another girl. Like, I want a, a son to be able to, like, look out for my elder daughter and stuff like that. So we're going to try for it. And also efficiency. You have twins instead of one child. It's, it's a lot less saving, a lot of time. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's my point. Yeah, that, that's I'm, I'm scared. I'm a, we're we're, pri we're planning for about two years from now. So I got about one good year left in myself, and then one year of uh, like getting super healthy, both of us, and then Perfect. start trying. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. That's wonderful. Yeah. So what? What did? What did? Uh, oh, when? What, what about Derek? When is Derek having children? <laughs> Not either. I don't know. Derek is just getting started, dude. Yeah, Derek's like, <laughs> Derek's like I'm working. I'm not having. Give me children. like. Give me like. People are know. not focused. Yeah. <laughs> so the weird thing oh, is like for, for us, it was in the beginning like a financial thing, right? Like I want to be financially secure, and you got like I want to have all the finances available so I can finally reduce the work. And then you, mm -hmm. you yeah. reach that point, and then you blow away past it, and then you're still not. Right? You find another excuse. So, but I'm I'm over that excuse. Yeah. My wife is getting close to it. Um, but yeah, we're I think at the age of forty. Like we we both did extensive fertility tests over the last couple of months, and uh, we're basically good to go. And then I decided to uh, squeeze out one more cycle. Um, yeah. Before we get our oh. busy. Speaking of which, by the way, I never told you guys why I mentioned all that growth hormone stuff about my daughter. My daughter is huge. My daughter yeah. is yeah. massive. Yeah, but you have an Amazonian woman. Yeah, I do. That's true. <laughs> but I, I also think it's partially the diet I had my wife on. My wife was drinking protein shakes like four times a day during the pregnancy. Uh -huh. She never oh, done wow. that before. We don't drink protein shakes. The whole pregnancy she did, I had an interesting diet. But my daughter is in the 99th percentile of height mm -hmm. wow. for males also. 99th percentile for uh, head circumference, brain, mm -hmm. but 95% for weight. Mm -hmm. And she is in the 50 percentile for someone double her age. That's a boy. Okay. Damn. But this is all here. There's, like, there's like that first like decade or decade plus where girls are like all way more developed than boys and they can like fuck them up. 
<laughs> yeah, 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 school, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It was like up until like grade like six or seven, girls were just like always bigger than the guys yeah. just because they develop so much faster. And more emotionally yeah. mature and then and, and, right, better at learning. And then the, the guys kind of, you know, slowly, not all of them, but some of them. <laughs> so we like it. Right, brother. Are you guys, uh, I'll let you guys be because it's uh, it's one year okay. I haven't eaten. This stuff. But uh, okay. next, which, well, maybe if we don't do this every five months, we could just, we could go. No, I'll be quicker. <laughs> I'll be quicker on the next one. <laughs> promise. Uh, anyway, it, was it was awesome. Very nice to talk to you for guys. sure. It was awesome. Good night, I really guys. missed you guys, actually. It was nice to talk yeah, to you. For sure. For sure. Right. We'll talk to you guys soon. Yeah. Sounds right. good. Hey, wait, we should put something. Wait, we should put something. So if somebody watched to the end, they can. Oh, see. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good call. So yeah. what, what's like a good uh, word that you need to comment to show that you actually watched it? Bio lady. <sighs> Welcome to the fifth, bio lady, the, fifth, bio lady. The, the fourth bio lady. Yeah. Yeah, the bio lady. Okay. Okay. Bio sure. sister, bio sister, bio lady. I don't know. Bio niece. She's your bio niece. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And anything with the uh, bio, bio female. Yeah. All good. All right, guys.